Hello friends. This is Fanfic Adventure. How are you all? So in this video, we will see. What if Naruto reincarnated as Son of Chaos and become the hero of Olympians, Naruto x Percy Jackson? But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time, let's begin the story. The sunlight peeped through the window of a rundown apartment in Konohagakir no Sato, where a sole teenage boy lay in bed. Well, in, is being a bit generous. The teen was sprawled across the bed while lying on his stomach, sheets falling partially on the floor along with a leg while a bit of drool came out of the corner of his mouth. His head was covered by short messy blonde hair, spiking uncontrollably in several places, and on both of his cheeks were three thin marks, looking akin to whiskers. The teen's arms suddenly wrapped around the pillow his head rested on and he smiled in his dreaming state. He giggled sleepily and addressed his dream in mumbles, speaking to the pillow softly. Whatever he was dreaming of was interrupted by the loud buzzing of his alarm clock, startling the blonde from his sleep with jolt. Blearily, he looked around for the source of his current state of consciousness and found it. Raising a clenched fist, the sleeping teen then dropped it on the device, shattering it with ease. Who keeps buying those stupid things, and setting them for so early?" asked the blonde with a growl. He closed his eyes in an effort to return to the realm of dreams. He deserved to sleep, damn it. Wasn't saving the world from a madman trying to become a god enough for that at least? It had only been three months since the end of the Fourth Shinobi World War, the Cold War between the five great shinobi nations now over. The nations were separate but allied and peace was reigning supreme over the small continent known as the Elemental Nations. The chakra entities known as the Biju were mostly gone, hiding away from humanity to protect the world from another would be revival of their original form. The Shinju, a primordial entity that was partially responsible for the emergence of the shinobi that dominated the continent. Its defeat would go down in history as one of the hardest battles known to shinobi. And Naruto was right there on the front lines. He still had the occasional nightmare about it coming back, about this piece just being a dream. With another groan at being unable to go back to sleep, the blonde pushed himself up and got off of the bed. Groggily, the blonde stumbled from his bedroom to the small kitchen in only his boxers. He walked past an amused looking redheaded woman, her violet eyes twinkling as she watched him wave at her tiredly, exposing a small circle in the palm of his right hand. Morning, mom, said the blonde. Good morning, Naruto. The woman said with a small giggle. The blonde, Naruto, nodded tiredly in acceptance of her and continued his trek to the kitchen. He opened his fridge when it hit him. His mother, Kashina Uzumaki, had been dead since he was a baby. So that meant one of two things. Either he just said hello to the worst assassin on this side of the planet, or he was still dreaming. Finding the first option to be ludicrous, hell it was downright laughable. Naruto just decided to go with the dream and continued to pull out his morning serving of milk for his cereal. So which dream is this? You guys are alive again? Naruto asked as he grabbed a bowl for his morning breakfast. Your father is still very much dead, said Kashina informatively. She had a small smile on her face as she watched her son prepare his breakfast nonchalantly. Never had a dream with just you alive, said Naruto, with a thoughtful hum. He poured his milk into the dry cereal waiting in the bowl and then put the milk back into the fridge. He walked out of the kitchen to look at his mother still sitting on the couch patiently with a small smile on her face. Never had a dream with just dad alive either for that matter. Am I Hokage yet? No, said Kashina, another giggle escaping her lips as her son pouted with a spoon in his mouth. Damn, seriously? Naruto asked. He dropped his spoon back into his cereal into his bowl. Lamest dream ever it would be if this was a dream naruto said kashina with a small titter of laughter at his confused face but it has to be said naruto with a frown he pointed at her with his spoon in hand i mean you're supposed to be you know kashina's smile dimmed a little at the reminder of that night 16 years ago curse the frailty of mortal bodies making her leave such a brilliant baby alone as her then husband died alongside her Splitting a small portion of herself off into a mortal shell was no problem, considering her flexible and constantly growing domain, she was rather powerful and often overlooked. Yes, well, I may have died in that body, but I live on in my main form, said Kashina. 
Naruto arched a brow and set his bowl of cereal down. Main. Form. Are you a chakra entity? Naruto asked. But you feel, like a civilian? Finally became a bit more observant, haven't you? Kashina said. A smile tugged at her lips. In a way, I am a projection, a clone of sorts. I need you, your family needs you. I would have come sooner, but you were needed here. Why yeah, whatever you want, mom, said Naruto, a bit taken aback. Where do I need to go? I will take you as far as I can, said Kashina, standing with a smile on her face at his acceptance. Then you must find Camp Half-Blood. H Half-Blood. It will become clear to you when you arrive, sweetheart, said Kashina taking a step towards him. He took a step back. All right, but can I? Doc can I say goodbye? He asked. Kashina bit her lip. She didn't have a lot of time here before they noticed her absence from North America. An idea hit her. The clone technique. Use your clones to say goodbye. You know the secret about them, don't you? Yeah, I retain your a genius mom, said Naruto, making his mother smile back at him. I try, she said. Hurry, we haven't much time. Naruto nodded and stood straight up, holding his hands out in front of him. His index and middle fingers formed a cross in front of him. There was a flux of energy before the room became filled with duplicates as Naruto named his signature technique. Taju Cage Bunshin no Jutsu, Multi Shadow Clone Technique. All right, guys, you know what to do, said Naruto to his clones, making each of them nod before they vanished in small explosions of chakra infused smoke, similar to their dismissals. The blonde smiled proudly back at his mother, ready to go. Good, said Kashina. She walked over to her son and put her hand on his shoulder. This could get a bit bumpy. Why? I'm not exactly supposed to be doing this, but it's necessary for what's to come, she said. He tried to ask her more about it, but before he could the air folded around them and the smell of lavender filled his nose. Their bodies became translucent and slowly faded away. He didn't feel anything for a second, and then they re-emerged, and he felt it. The burning, the pain in all of his body. Saying it hurt a lot was an understatement. It felt like he was regrowing skin that had been torn off one bit at a time. He heard himself cry out, felt his legs give and could feel gravity taking its hold on him. Naruto hit the ground unconscious, his body perfectly fine and intact, though his clothes had been changed to more appropriate jeans and a solid white t-shirt. Kashina knelt down next to him, her form flickering lightly, she cupped Naruto's face with both of her hands, kissing him softly on the forehead to give him a bit of a helping hand in this new world, before pulling back. Her time was up. She succeeded in her goal and was being called back to be questioned by Zeus. She smiled sadly, rubbing her thumb along Naruto's cheek one last time before returning to Olympus to explain herself. Be strong, my little maelstrom, said Kashina before she disappeared once again, leaving Naruto unconscious on the cold dirt as a cool springtime breeze washed over him. Underscore, waking up with a groan, Naruto blearily examined his surroundings before holding his head. His clones sure had to deal with a lot of different reactions, it was a good thing he sent three to Tsunade and Sakura, how the third clones managed to get through the rest of their chiding of him, just accepting someone pretending to be your mom, and leaving to who knows where on a whim being irresponsible, he hadn't a clue. At least Kakashi and Uruka were more supportive, though they had their own suspicions. Hell, the person he was really worried about was his brother-in-arms, rival Sasuke. All that bastard did upon hearing Naruto's apologetic farewell was slam the door on his face. The douche. Man, why is everything always so complicated with him? Naruto asked with a whine. His best friend was a pain in the ass to understand. It was like dealing with a girl sometimes. With a grunt, Naruto rolled to his upper back and kipped onto his feet like he hadn't just landed with what felt like the force of a freight train. The blonde twisted his body to loosen his core muscles and then stretched out his arms above his head. That was one hell of a shunshin no jutsu. Wonder if I can get mom to teach me that? Hey buddy. A voice called out to him, making Naruto turn and look at the speaker. He was a decently short guy, around Naruto's height, wearing a strange hat that looked like a duck's bill attached to a bowl of some sort. His curly hair sticking out this way and that from underneath it. He had a small beard on his chin an awesome orange shirt and had long pants, similar to the ones Naruto woke up in, as well as some covered sandals on his feet. Hi, Naruto said, 
greeting the newcomer as he always does when not annoyed, energetically. You do know that you're not supposed to venture this far into Central Park without a weapon, right? asked the bearded guy. Central Park? Naruto asked. Where's that? The bearded guy looked at Naruto like he was an alien. Why you do know what Central Park is, right? I'm guessing a park of some kind, said Naruto, a blonde eyebrow arching in confusion and amusement. How old are you? The guy asked. Uh, seventeen, said Naruto, as though it were obvious. S17. The guy looked horrified, which honestly looked hilarious on his face. You do know why you shouldn't be out here alone, right? Should I? D Immortales. Said the bearded guy. What are you, new to this? How can you have never been attacked? I've been attacked tons of times, said Naruto with a frown. WH what? Really? So you know about the camp, then? Camp? Why does this always happen to me? The bearded guy said, moaning as he rubbed his face with both hands. Dropping his hands to the side, he sighed and then looked at Naruto with what could be called a serious glare. All right look, we don't normally get greens your age, but there's a camp for kids like you. I highly doubt that, said Naruto as he tensed a bit and got ready for a fight. This guy's anxiety was going off the charts. And then there was the feeling in the air. Like that the natural chakra here was poisoned. Or like something very important was missing. Haven't you ever wondered who your parent was? asked the bearded guy. I know who my parents are, Naruto said hotly, his eyes narrowing and his pupils became small slits. You think you do, said the guy. So who raised you, mom or dad? For your information, neither of them did. Oh, oh, oh man, buddy, look I. Save it, said Naruto brushing past the guy with a frown on his face. I don't want to talk to you anymore. Wait, I. I said leave me alone, said Naruto as he walked away, he may have accepted that he had awesome parents, but that didn't mean he wanted to remember them not being there. Especially after how his father's reanimated corpse sacrificed himself to save the blonde. It was like losing the third all over again. The guy with the beard and the strange hat followed him as he wandered through the woods. Wait. Stop following me. I will if you just stop and wait, let me finish what I was saying. Reminding me of what I didn't have? Okay, usually with kids like you. We're the same age, if you would just listen, pass. This is important, don't care. I got something more important to do. But, look, unless you can tell me where my mom is. Yes. Naruto stopped to look at the guy. Well, maybe, you need to find your mom? She brought me here to help the rest of my family, said Naruto with a firm nod. He promised to help his mom and Naruto Uzumaki never went back on his word. Okay. Well as I was saying earlier wait, no this is related to your mom, I promise. Naruto rolled his eyes and stopped walking, turning to face the bearded guy, well? Look, there's a camp for kids like you, who need to find their parents, so to speak. Just come with me and we can sort this all out with the head counselor's help. Naruto looked at the guy, his blue eyes searching the guy's brown. Empathetically, he knew that the guy wasn't lying. Logically, he's given no reason to be lying. Still, he had to be careful. Naruto didn't know where he was and what the reason behind his, mother's, sudden arrival was, so he had to play it carefully. The war had made him realize that sometimes not all was what it seemed. All right, you've got my attention, said Naruto. Awesome, I wonder if this is how Underwood felt when he met Percy Jackson, said the bearded guy with a smile on his face. He held his hand out. Name's Billy. Billy G. Overtree. Weird name, said Naruto as he took the hand and shook it. Naruto Uzumaki. And you say my name is weird? Billy asked, taking his hand back. So, you ready to do some hardcore walking? Walking? Naruto asked, smiling in amusement. Yeah, unless you know how to drive? Billy asked. He was a bit hopeful in that aspect. Uh, what like a cart? Billy's hopeful expression turned into one of horror once again. Please tell me you're joking. Are you talking about one of those train things? You have those here? D Immortales, you're not joking. Billy dragged a hand down his face. Okay, Naruto. I guess it's a good thing you and me are going to have a long walk. Billy led Naruto out of Central Park, explaining the advancement of technology and summarizing the history of the United States as best he could. Naruto. As soon as he made it to West 59th Street, 
gaped at the lights and sounds of the cars. Billy smirked at it. If the blonde thought that was impressive, wait until he got to Times Square. They had to hurry, though. Billy could smell the monsters gathering. Whoever this kid's parent was, they were strong. I just really hope it's not one of those three and that it is his mother, Billy thought. He watched as Naruto looked around, swiveling his head this way and that in childlike wonder. It was interesting to see how this guy acted. One moment he was reminded of Cabin 6. The glare that was set on him was that damned Athena glare, he was sure of it, but something told him that wasn't the case. There was something about this guy that reminded him of Grover, too. Wow, this is amazing. Naruto said as he and Billy walked down 7th Street. He was in awe at how large this city was. Konoha had nothing on it. And you're saying that this is one city of many states? Yep. Wow. Naruto whistled as he turned around while walking, his eyes on the towers that just continued to rise. He nearly walked right into the street, again, only to be saved by Billy, who pulled him back from the road just as a car raced by. Thanks. No problem, said Billy, shaking his head in disbelief. This kid is too much. At one moment he looks like he's going to kill me, but at another he's carefree as can be. There's only one Olympian I know that matches that description, but he doesn't give off the dreamy vibe and I haven't felt compelled to do anything he says yet. What's all that light up ahead? Naruto asked, curious of the blinding light that stood out even among the bright headlights of the cars that drove past. Billy smirked, knowing what would come soon. His smirk fell as the horrid smell of underground hit his nose. His eyes were wide, his breathing sped up, and the young satyr kicked his shoes off so he could run better, revealing his hooves. We need to move, now, Billy said, shoving the blonde forward into traffic. Don't get hit by a car and keep running. Why? Naruto asked as he easily kept pace with the satyr. A horn blared, making Naruto look to the left and see a car coming at him and Billy. The driver looked irate that someone dared to run across the street when he had an obvious red light. His irate look turned to shock when the crazy blonde that chose to run across the street grabbed the other teen and cleared the rest of the 55 feet in one jump. Th thanks, said Billy, a bit shocked from the sudden jump. Naruto grabbed him by the back of his shirt and helped him back to his feet as they continued to run towards the brightly lit portion of the city. Naruto spared a glance behind him and saw a large cloud of shadow several red lights coming from it. His eyebrows narrowed in thought before returning his attention ahead of him. So, we running from the giant black cloud? He asked his new friend. It's a cloud. It's never a cloud. Diamortales, why is it a cloud? I take it that's not normal, then? Naruto asked as they ran. All he got were more concerned whimpers from the satyr. They broke into the small square of blindingly bright lights, which made Naruto pause from culture shock and awe. Noise was all he heard and the lights were so distracting, he barely heard Billy telling him to hurry up. He did hear Billy cry out his name in warning as the cloud engulfed the blonde foreigner. Billy fell to his knees as he heard the snarls and the tearing. The kid didn't even make it to camp, poor guy. And this was his first one too. Hopefully it got easier like Grover said it would. Guess not everyone can be like Grover Underwood, getting the son of Poseidon to camp alive with ease. Still. There was a small part of Billy G. Overtree that hoped the new guy would make it. There was sudden yelping and Billy had to drop to the ground to avoid being hit by a flying giant black mastiff, a hellhound. Billy looked back at the cloud with wide eyes, seeing it grow up and the yelps increasing. I said. Get off, Naruto said, standing abruptly with one of the hellhounds held above his head. The other hellhounds were forced to tumble back as he stood, quickly recovering and snarling at the blonde. Naruto glared back at the few in front of him. Don't forget your friend. The hellhound in his hands learned to fly before being reunited with two members of its pack, and taking out a streetlight with the distance they got. A hellhound tried to take Naruto by surprise, leaping at him from behind. Naruto turned and punched it square in the nose, stopping it midair and making it fly back. When another tried the same tactic, he spun on the ball of his foot and brought his heel across the side of the monster dog's face, sending it flying. Seeing that these simple attacks were doing nothing, the hellhounds rushed him once again. Billy watched as the blonde punched, kicked, and in one instance bit, the hellhounds like they were as light as a feather and their teeth were made of clouds. This was insane, what he was seeing. What he heard next kicked his adrenaline into overdrive. Sirens, 
Mortals had invented them to alert, and alert they did. The Hellhounds' assault continued as the white and blue vehicles of the New York Police Department swarmed Times Square. The sounds of a helicopter were heard and a light was shined down on the fight between what Billy knew were Hellhounds and Naruto Uzumaki. A few more helicopters joined the scene and a couple of the mega screens in Times Square changed to the news, showing the fight as it happened. There was another yelp that got Billy's attention and he dove to the side to avoid being flattened by the flying hellhound. The hellhound in question dissolved as soon as its back hit the ground, revealing that Naruto had given enough internal damage, possibly a collapsed lung or something of the sort, to kill it. The news cameras zoomed in when a blue light appeared in the center of the mound of lions that the cameras saw. Rasenrengan. Naruto's voice cried out as the hellhounds were sent flying from the pile they were in dissolving into gold dust that scattered in the wind. Naruto drove what appeared to be a blue ball right into the face of the last hellhound, grinding it into golden dust and leaving him alone with two blue spheres glowing in his hands. Underscore, high above the Empire State Building, the Olympians watched through Hephaestus' massive televised screen, a holographic image that duplicated the effects of a television, acting like a sort of one-way iris messaging. One Olympian in particular smiled proudly at the image of the blonde with a glowing ball of energy eviscerating the hellhounds sent after him. Damn, said a man with light blonde hair, dressed like a work-first businessman with the Bluetooth device in his ear. He lowered the stylish, yet professional sunglasses down his nose as he watched the fight before him. Hermes was impressed with what he saw, and said what many were thinking. Whose child is this? asked the Queen of Olympus. She was intrigued. But the boy was strong like another certain oaf and he only became that way after ingesting something that was not rightfully his. Yes, whose is it? The green-eyed man wearing the Tony Bahama shirt and sandals asked, smirking at the well-dressed blue-eyed man that sat next to the queen. Not mine, said Zeus with a frown. He was certain that he'd only had interactions with Ms. Grace. A giggle came from the beautiful woman seated next to the creator of their screen. Her eyes flickered to purple and her hair to red for a brief moment that had a woman with raven-colored hair narrowing her gaze. The raven-haired woman looked from the smiling Aphrodite to the screen and back several times before her gray eyes widened in realization. You. I don't know how. But you were the loud-mouthed tomato, Athena said, glaring at the smirking goddess of love. Guilty, said Aphrodite, practically singing the word. She leaned back on her throne with a smile as the other Olympians looked at her. What can I say, love works in mysterious ways. I will find out what you did, Aphrodite, said Athena, scowling. She returned her gaze to the blonde on the screen. And I will make sure you do not corrupt another. You can try, Hooty, said Aphrodite, smirking as Athena's scowl deepened. He's already been in contact with his mother. Aphrodite, said Zeus in displeasure at the openly disobedient comment, you know the law. I never raised him, said Aphrodite with a pretty frown. I merely brought him from his father's home. Where he should have remained to follow in his father's footsteps, Athena said with a scowl. Like those old crones would have let him try, said Aphrodite with a scowl. They're more biased than Romans. A lot more volatile, too. Sounds like my kind of people, said Ares with a grin. He withered under the glare his girlfriend sent his way. After all the hell Naruto went through to unite the countries, I would never let you uproot it, Ares, said Aphrodite, scowling at the god of war. It's partially your fault that he had to bother with it to begin with. Oh you're talking about mom's island, Apollo said, snapping his fingers when he caught on. He looked at the image that was pause. I never would have guessed. Looks like an east coast kid. He got all those handsome qualities from his father, said Aphrodite sighing in bliss at the memory that made Ares scowl. Surprisingly, Athena joined her blooding brother in scowling at the goddess of love's words. We were told not to intervene with the lands of the moving continent, Aphrodite, said Athena. Zeus nodded as he recalled making that decree. Yet you till had Minato anyway, said Aphrodite with a smirk, and I didn't intervene. I simply spread the love with absent-minded control, much like Apollo does with the sun or Artemis the moon. The twins nodded in agreement with that, using their godly energy to keep track of the island they were originally born on. It was probably why that land was so potent with strange energy that mimicked their own coursing through their veins. Of course, the titan that enlarged it to the size of a small continent was sleeping and wouldn't reveal the reasons behind why she had. 
Still, you disobeyed that decree when you brought the boy here, said Zeus, looking at the blonde as he looked around at the mortal authorities. While I'm sure the mortals could handle him, I believe a final test is in order. Is that really necessary? Poseidon asked his brother. Uncle P, you can't play favorites because he's named after stuff that happens in your domain, said Apollo, getting strange looks. What? Naruto Uzumaki. It's Japanese, I know this stuff. While Poseidon brooded at being called out on why he was so intrigued in the boy, Zeus looked back at the blonde. Naruto was looking around with wide eyes at the flashing lights and the screens with his face on it from different angles. Underneath him was the headline, Superheroes Exist, Team Destroys Lions in Times Square. Zeus scratched his beard in thought before nodding. The boy will be tested, Zeus said, confirming his decision while Aphrodite scowled and Athena frowned. Send in a hydra. Message sent, said Hermes, finishing the request to Hades for a monster. He looked at his father. You sure he should be doing this in Times Square? The mortals will forget by tomorrow, said Zeus. Hecate and Hypnos will ensure that. Underscore. Hey Billy? Naruto asked his friend as the NYPD trained weapons on him. Why yeah? said the stunned satyr. He'd never seen anything like that, even during the war. No demigod had survived a swarm. What are they doing? Naruto asked, gesturing to the cops setting up a perimeter. Uh, well, kids like you aren't, uh, aren't exactly normal, said Billy, who was rapidly trying to think of reasons why this was happening. Man if it was his fault the mortals rediscovered the Olympians, he was so going to get it. But what are they doing? With their hands? Naruto asked, seeing all the small objects in the uniformed men's hands. He guessed this was the city's military considering all of the similar uniforms. The blue clothes didn't look very protective though, and those hats were ridiculous. He bet his whole supply of kanai could finish these guys off. Put your hands above your head or we will shoot, said one of the policemen. Uh, like this? Naruto asked, raising his hands up. He wasn't really in the mood to deal with the city's military, but he wasn't exactly eager to fight them either. Get on your knees and put your hands behind your head said the policeman. Well, now he was just being silly. Naruto had already surrendered, hadn't he? Naruto, just do what he says, said Billy, doing exactly as the policeman ordered. Naruto gave his new friend a confused look before complying, getting down on his knees and interlacing his hands behind his head. Police started to move forward, their weapons still trained on the blonde kneeing in front of them, but then the ground suddenly moved between them and the blonde. Don't move. An officer ordered, keeping his gun trained on Naruto. It's not me, Naruto said back, watching as the ground cracked and shifted. An unfortunate officer standing too close to the cracking was sent flying as the concrete covered ground shattered and a large scaled head shot up from under the ground. It looked like a diamond, and shortly afterward, four more heads that looked exactly the same sprouted close beside it. Fall back. Get the people out of the way. Run were the cries of the policemen as whatever they saw scared them enough to retreat. B but it was dead, Billy said, falling to his butt and scooting back in fear of what stood before him. Settling on a massive lizard-like body was the Hydra, five heads focused on the unclaimed demigod that knelt before it. Billy's eyes widened when he recognized the target. Naruto, run. Naruto didn't need to be told to move, because he rolled out of the way as soon as one head dove at him with its mouth open wide. Avoiding being bitten by razor-sharp teeth was at the top of Naruto's to-do list at the moment. He dodged again, this time avoiding another head, before deciding to make some distractions. He crossed his fingers in front of him and focused the chakra. Cage Bunshin no Jutsu, Naruto said, making eight clones appear next to him. They rushed at the monster while Naruto went to help the now bulging-eyed Billy up from his seat. What how but you I? Billy failed to find words stumbling over himself as Naruto got him to his fey hooves. Explain later. What is it and how do I kill it? Naruto asked, pulling Billy with him when a clone was dispelled due to a ball of acid sent from one of the Hydra's mouths. Well, that just replaced the razor-like teeth at the top of Naruto's to-do list. H Hydra, said Billy, pulling himself together. Every head you cut off, two replace it. Sharp claws and teeth, acid spit and reported to have fire breath. Good, thanks. So how do I kill it if I can't cut the heads off? Naruto asked. Uh, well, I'm working on it, alright, I'm working on it, 
Billy said. Geez, I'm not a member of Cabin 6, cut me some slack. What am I supposed to do until then? Naruto asked. Billy shrugged haplessly before pulling the blonde with him out of the way of another shot of acid. Avoid dying? Billy said as they both got up from the ground. So improvising, said Naruto. He nodded with a grin. I'm good at that. Boss. A clone shouted, making Naruto turn to look at it. Making eye contact with the clone that signaled him, it dispelled and Naruto got its idea, now technically his idea, and he beamed. You said don't cut off the head, right? Naruto asked. Unless you can cauterize the neck before it regrows two more heads, said Billy, remembering that tidbit from the legends. That's how Heracles killed it. Who a please? Explain later, duck. The two dropped as a stream of fire was shot from one of the now six heads. Apparently, the clone that had dispelled used a Rasengan on one head, and Naruto winced as another clone was forcibly dispelled. Those tails were something to watch for, too. So close range is no go for me, said Naruto. He put two fingers in his mouth and whistled, signaling two of his clones, before waving them over. When they managed to break away and join him he pointed at the Coca-Cola sign not too far away. Go gather natural chakra, we're going to shuriken that thing. All right. You're the boss, boss. The clones leapt over the police barricade, running for the building they were told to go to at top speed and then, much to the onlooker's surprise, up the side of said building. Naruto watched them go, creating more clones to buy him some time. Now with the knowledge of his plan, the clones knew just to keep the Hydra's attention instead of trying to kill it. He waited and stalled for a good 15 minutes, before sending another clone up to the two meditating ones. When both were dispelled, Naruto's eyes dilated, becoming toad-like and golden as he felt the area's nature chakra fill him, an orange pigment appearing over his eyelids. It wasn't a lot, but it was enough. With his permanent chakra battery sleeping off the after-effects of the war, Naruto would have to make do with his minor sage mode. Glaring at the hydra with his fist clenched, the blonde was sure it would be. His hand was lifted above him and another Rasengan started to form, but a clone was created beside him, holding both hands up at the small blue ball of energy. The Rasengan changed, becoming larger and more like a throwing star, a shuriken. Naruto's clones dispelled at once, confirming his thoughts on the civilians moved far enough back to not be kyled by the coming attack. The clones gone had the Hydra shifting all six heads on him, making Naruto grin at it. All six of the Hydra's heads roared at him challengingly, and he felt its anger. Not at him specifically, but what he was. A word floated between Naruto's empathic link with the Hydra. Godling. Hmm, well that was something to ask Billy about. For now, Naruto reared his hand back and then launched the attack forward. Fuuden. Rosen Shuriken, Naruto said as he threw the ball of energy at the Hydra. Underscore. Olympus watched the attack connect and their eyes widened as the intensity of it eradicated the Hydra's body. Not even golden dust remained, or the trophy fang that was expected of it. Zeus in particular was in awe, having felt all the thousands upon thousands of winds descending on the monster, and felt them shift just appropriately to stay within the dome it created. Dibs on fighting him first, Ares said, his fiery eyes burning with blood. Hermes and Apollo burst into laughter at his exclamation, making him scowl. What? You you did see what he did to the Hydra, right? Apollo asked with a smirk as his laughter died down. Apollo raised his hand palm up and made an explosion gesture. Boom, gone. You want to fight a kid that can do that? Ha. Huh? He finished it. This was all Athena could manage to say, her eyes narrowed as she watched Hephaestus replay the attack. She smirked at her scowling brother. Considering you lost to Percy Jackson when he was 12 and untrained, I believe you wouldn't last a second against Naruto Uzumaki. Screw you, owl pellets, said Ares with a scowl. Aphrodite just smirked quietly, watching as the god and goddess of war bickered over who would win. Naruto would beat Ares hands down, according to Olympian law Ares would have to fight, fair. Had Ares been allowed to use all of his god powers, then perhaps he'd win, but against a hero, he was limited. Ares' arrogance would be his downfall. Aphrodite. Zeus' voice made all of the gods stop talking and look at their king as he addressed the demigod's mother. Your son used my domain. My son created those winds, said Aphrodite, smirking at Zeus' scowl. He didn't manipulate your domain, he made his own. That is impossible, 
Demeter said, frowning. Not so, said Athena. The people from the moving continent have done similar for centuries, it is expected of a child born there to be able to create their own element from their life force. They create the element within and expel it outwards with their techniques. The fact remains that he used my domain outside of the moving continent, said Zeus, giving Aphrodite a pointed glare. He is the grandson of Oranos, said Aphrodite with a pretty smile, making Zeus' scowl deepen. I will let this altercation slide, said Zeus. He held a finger up, but know this, if he so much as tries to manipulate the sky, I will end him. Now, Zeus, said Poseidon, gaining his brother's attention, considering the latest developments, I think it would be in your best interest to let the boy be. After all, the people from the drifting continent live on my domain as much as under yours. You've known they can do this, you're just jealous the boy did it in a way you can't comprehend. I am no, and, said Poseidon, cutting his brother off, that he isn't your offspring. Had this been Talia Grace, for example, you would have shrugged it off. Zeus scowled at Poseidon for bringing that up. Great, now he looked biased. And as the god of justice, he wasn't allowed to be biased. Well, damn it, that's just not fair. Fine. I won't kill him, said Zeus with a scowl, happy? It's improvement, said Poseidon with a chuckle. Can I kill him? Ares asked hopefully. Absolutely not, Aphrodite said before the king could retort. She glared at her boyfriend with heat in her now oddly purple eyes. Touch my son Ares and there will be hell to pay. Well, that's no fun, said Ares with a scowl. His scowl fell at Athena's added glare. His sister then shifted her gaze to the demigod's mother. You should have left him on the continent, said Athena with a frown. Aphrodite returned it with her own frown. Considering that the camp has only fought against monsters and rogue campers, I figured it would be best if we had someone who could help them deal with what was coming, said Aphrodite. Apollo blinked, recognizing what she meant by that. Of course, his twin beat him to the punch. Why would one of your children know how to deal with that? Artemis asked with a frown. Well, he has a monster inside of him, said Aphrodite, glancing at the king. A beast he can control and use to his advantage. She glared at Athena. One that I had under control, except your son decided in all of his brilliance to deal with in his own way. Minato was doing what he felt was right, said Athena with a scowl. Um, Minato? Who's Minato? Hermes asked. Minato was a child of mine, who lost his father shortly after his birth, said Athena with a frown. He was raised on the drifting continent and eventually became the leader of one of the small military villages. Really? Boring job that had to have been, said Ares with a snort. You say that, but you don't know Minato like I did, said Aphrodite, interjecting and making Athena scowl once more. She looked at the screen and waved her hand, making two images pull up a picture of Naruto as he was today and a similar looking blonde with a narrower face and piercing blue analytical eyes. Minato Namikaze, the fourth fire shadow, a title used for the village hidden in the leaves for their dictator, was the kindest smartest and strongest for ten years after his promotion to Jonin, or expert shinobi. You're saying that Pansy was a ninja? Ares asked, once more getting a glare from Athena for the comment. Minato wasn't a Pansy, said Athena, having taken notes of her son's life and given it to her daughter after the second Titanomachy to keep them in the loop and to reward her cabin for such great performances and loyalty during it. Minato, during the continent's third war, had eviscerated a squad of over 100 enemies in less than five seconds. Beat my record by one second, said a pouting Aphrodite and getting odd looks from her, she blinked and her eyes shifted back from purple. Sorry, still assimilating Kashina Uzumaki back in. Assimilating. You split yourself to walk amongst mortals. Athena said with a look of rage. That was forbidden even before the Silver Age began. It was forbidden for minor gods and other deities, said Aphrodite with a scowl. Not for Olympians. I'm surprised none of you have ever tried it. It's quite refreshing. Aside from that new idea, said Hermes, snapping the Olympians from the thought of walking amongst mortals. How did Minato move so fast? He was inspired by a legacy of Zeus, said Athena, waving her hand and bringing up the image of the legacy. A white haired man with red markings and a serious look on his face. Toborama Senju. A master of what they call Fuenjutsu, he developed a space time technique that allowed him to teleport. Minato made a jutsu based off of that, 
the Hiraishin no Jutsu. Named it after Grandpa, did he? Apollo asked in amusement, he looked at Zeus, flying thunder god. Smart boy, said Zeus with a small smirk. It allowed him to teleport, said Athena, glaring at the archery god for interrupting her. Granted, he needed to use a special kanai to do so, unlike his predecessor. Ha, huh, so your brat wasn't as good as you say, said Ares. Better than you at times, said Aphrodite, making the god gape while the room laughed at him. The purple color in her eyes faded and Aphrodite flushed. I, um, wow, Apollo said, laughing at the look on his brother's face. Well now that we know about Minato, tell us about the kid. And so Aphrodite did, ecstatic to get onto a different subject. She told them of his growth from a troublemaking youth. He was so cute growing up, wearing his bright orange jumpsuit. To a hero of the people. At age 13 he had liberated several villages and countries from tyrants alongside his team. At 14, he lost his virginity and was a little shy about doing so. Athena scolded Aphrodite for watching that but she claimed she couldn't help it, Kashina's attached soul got a look at all of Naruto's dirty little secrets. Aphrodite then continued, after scaring Ares into silence while threatening his jewels if he kept laughing about Naruto's loss of virginity, telling them that at 15 he was learning to manipulate nature to become stronger, mastering his summons after his and Minato's sensei died. Athena gave a frown at this, conflicted over the death of the man that helped train her star child of the previous generation. Hermes however. Wait, 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 back up, said Hermes, holding his hand up with eyes narrowed. He, he took in nature. Became part of it, said Aphrodite. She looked to her husband and gestured to the television. Can you move it back to the fight with the Hydra? Hephaestus rolled his eyes and rewound the images until it came to the fight in question. At the end, just before the Rosenshuriken. There, she pointed at the screen. Can you zoom in on his face? Child's play, said Hephaestus. He waved his hand and blinked at what he saw. A glitch. Sage mode, said Aphrodite. Her eyes were purple as she looked at her husband. Thank you, Hephaestus. The gods looked at her oddly and Hephaestus was stuck in a state of shock. Aphrodite didn't notice, pointing at her son's eyes. His eyes become like a toad's, a side effect of learning through them how to manipulate nature. It enhances his strength and speed, making him as strong as Heracles. Hopefully not as pig-headed, said Hera with a huff. Not even, said Aphrodite with a titter, it also makes him extremely empathic. Really, Artemis asked, intrigued. Empathy was a rare trait, even among Aphrodite's children. He's particularly connected to negative emotions, said Aphrodite with a sigh. My poor baby. Such a happy boy shouldn't have to worry about these things. Aphrodite. Focus, please, asked Demeter. Well aside from the mastery of sage mode and the war he was the primary reason the fourth war in the moving continent was won, said Aphrodite. Athena smirked when Aphrodite looked at her. He seems to take after his father in that aspect. War heroes runs in the family, said Apollo, stroking his chin. Great story. Anything else? The beast, for instance, said Zeus, insistently. Aphrodite sighed as all eyes went to her. This could take a while. Underscore. While the Lady of Doves divulged her son's darkest secrets and Naruto recuperated with Billy, a strong entity stirred within the crusts of the planet. A small tremor went through Times Square. It was as though something was searching for the source of power that was recently shown. Partially out of concern and partially out of curiosity. Gaia was interested in whatever happened in Times Square, very interested. As the sun rose on the two new friends, they came through a small forest near where Billy said the camp was. Billy also explained why he looked so different, what with the goat legs and all, that he was a nature spirit called a satyr and aged twice as slowly earning Naruto's sympathy that the poor guy had to redo most of his educational career. Naruto was relieved to hear they were so close, because he wanted to ask more questions about the state of the world outside of his own. Primarily about the lack of nature chakra. Naruto had nearly collapsed after he released Sage Mode, stumbling more than once into Billy as they ran away from the mass confusion he caused in Times Square. The nature here was weak, something big was missing from it and as a sage, Naruto was not happy with it. While the growth of humanity away from his home was amazing, it had killed a lot of nature. When he brought this up with his friend, he was surprised by the look of surprise that came across Billy's face. H how could you tell? Billy asked. 
was he a son of Demeter? That could explain the feeling of nature that surrounded the blonde. When I sent those two clones to gather nature chakra, I felt as though something was missing, said Naruto. After seeing all those impressive buildings, it's kind of obvious what had to go to make all this work. I mean, the last trees I saw that were thriving were in Central Park. Central Park, said Billy, a bit wide-eyed. You you really care about this, don't you? Yes, Naruto said, a bit confused at Billy's response. I'm a sage, why wouldn't I? A, a sage? Billy's heart nearly stopped. Sure, he's met demigods that were vegetarian, but they usually turned out to be not all that interested in environmentalism or were far too interested in the case of an extremist that came from Demeter's cabin. But a sage? Billy heard stories about sages, the career, dying out long ago as Apollo's domain became more science oriented. Hardly any of Hermes' kids nowadays picked herbs anymore, and most of Apollo's kids preferred focusing on their archery, well, except for the cabin counselor whose mother was a doctor. Heck, the only modern sages today were the hunters of Artemis, and even that was stretching it. Billy wanted to believe Naruto at face value, but he had to be sure, so. Prove it. What? Naruto said, looking at Billy as the satyr stopped cold. Prove that you're a sage, said Billy, crossing his arms. Okay, said Naruto with a shrug. He promptly sat down, crossing his legs and interlacing his hands together. He took a deep breath and cleared his mind his eyes closing as he did. His breathing slowed and became deathly quiet, making Billy worry for a moment that he had put himself in a death-like trance. Persephone was another possible mother, rare though her demi-children were, so this would be a very upsetting situation. Then, Billy felt it. Nature was being drawn to the blonde, even Billy wanted to take a step closer, to lend him a hand when he needed to. Morning jays fluttered around him and birds settled on his shoulders, chirping and nesting around him in harmony. A small orange fox and several rabbits came out from their burrows, approaching the human curiously. There was a shriek and an eagle swooped in, flapping its wings as it came to roost where the startled morning jays fled on Naruto's shoulder. Physically, nothing about the blonde changed except for his eyelids, now orange with red mixed in above them. Naruto took another breath and slowly opened his eyes, looking at Billy with the eyes of a sage trained by the toads of Mayuboku. Golden in color with toad-like pupils. Naruto's eyes were entrancing to the satyr. So what do you think? Naruto asked in amusement as the animals of the forest gathered around him and settled next to or on him peacefully. Billy shook his head, the trance he was in now broken after Naruto spoke. Wow. You really are a sage. I thought you had to be an old man to be one. Nah, just have to learn how to take the nature chakra in and give it back at the same time, said Naruto shrugging nonchalantly while not disturbing the creatures settled around him. He stroked the head of the fox laying on his lap and reached up to lightly brush the eagle under the beak. Friendly, aren't they? The eagle gave a small cry at the touch and nipped his finger, making Naruto chuckle. Okay, no touching, I get it. He let his connection with nature fade away and the animals slowly scattered, save for one. The eagle which cried so proudly on its arrival stayed put where it was on Naruto's shoulder making Naruto and Billy blink in surprise at the sight of it. Naruto stood, the eagle staying put stubbornly. Well this is interesting, said Naruto in amusement, trying to jostle the eagle by adjusting his shoulders, only making it dig its talons into him. Ow! Billy, help me get it off. Easy, Naruto, this is a sacred animal to one of the gods, I can't just manhandle it, said Billy, getting a squawk from the bird of prey. Okay, my bad. I didn't know you were a girl. She's stubborn, said Naruto with a grunt, reaching for her talons and getting his fingers pecked at. Okay, okay, geez, testy, aren't you? She doesn't want to leave, said Billy, looking at the eagle and bawing at it. He got a shriek in return and looked at Naruto in amusement. She likes you. What? She likes you. She can't explain it, and quite frankly once an eagle has their mind set on something. Let me guess, they stick to it? Pretty much. Think you can have her relax, then? I won't shake her off as long as she doesn't sever my shoulder. Billy translated the request and the eagle complied, her talons sliding out of their grip on Naruto's shoulder, making the shinobi sigh in relief. He hesitantly reached up, holding his hand out to the eagle. A wide smile spread across his face as the eagle nuzzled itself into his hand. There, that's not so bad ow, 
Naruto pulled his hand back as the eagle nipped his finger again. I'm not food. He glared at Billy who was snickering while the eagle released another loud cry. And just what is so funny? She's insulted that you haven't given her a name yet and try to touch her, said the amused satyr. Eagles are a proud bird, Naruto. She doesn't have a name, Naruto asked, arching a brow. She does, it's just not translatable to human tongue, said Billy with a shrug. The eagle shrieked loudly, her wings spreading in pride as she did, making Billy roll his eyes. Okay, well according to her, the closest translation would be, the chick born in harmony of the nest made with the king's feather. Yeesh, and I thought your name was weird, said Naruto, looking at the eagle and ignoring the deadpan stare he got from the satyr. All right, your name is Mew, Mei Yu, which stands for beautiful feather, how does that sound? After Billy translated for him, the newly named Mew cried out, taking to the sky and looping before coming back to the demigod's shoulder. She nuzzled her head against the blondes and allowed him to pet her, much to his and Billy's amusement. I'll take that as a yes, said a snickering Naruto. He dropped his hand and looked back at the satyr. So, Billy, now what? We could go over the Olympians I suppose, said Billy, scratching his fuzzy chin while Naruto and Mew looked at him curiously. There's the big three. Zeus, Poseidon and Hades. Zeus is the king of Olympus and the god of the sky and all in its domain. Which could be why Mew is so attached to you, he could be your father. It would be possible with the oath revoked. My father is not a god, said Naruto with a frown, my mom said he was still dead. Okay, so that rules out a good portion of Olympians, said Billy, frowning in confusion at that. Was it just Naruto's connection with nature that brought Mew to him or was it something else? The two continued to discuss the Olympians as they made their way to Camp Half-Blood, a name that slightly put Naruto off. Billy started out by naming the primary twelve and their domains. Naruto felt that Hestia got gipped when it came to Dionysus' seat being offered, but he admired her for the sacrifice she made. He was a bit conflicted on hearing that the new twelfth Olympian was his new camp counselor, but shrugged it off as he continued to listen to Billy. To Naruto, the gods weren't as interesting as the goddesses, since there were not as many stories about them unless it concerned punishment that Naruto felt was a bit much. I.e. Artemis and the idiot that peeped on her. He'd have to write home about that one to Tsunade, she would probably claim Artemis as her new patron or matron or whatever it was, then drink to Eros Senon's memory, and Athena and the spider thing. Come to think of it, didn't his resurrected dad kind of hesitate against the Jubi in its incomplete form, which kind of looked like a spider on steroids? Naruto shook those thoughts off as Billy started to talk about Hera, Zeus' wife and sister, something that hardly made Naruto blink considering his homeland was full of incest and he was sure that there was an Uzumaki who shacked up with his sister, but more importantly, also the queen of Olympus. They finished with Hera and Amphitrite, the wife of Poseidon, coming to a close on Hades' wife, niece Persephone as they came across a sign that said, Delphi Strawberry Fields, no trespassing. She could totally be your mother, said Billy. He pointed up at Mew, who was flying high above them to stretch her wings. It could explain why Mew likes you. You said Persephone took mostly from her mother in abilities and is the wife of Hades. I'd say after she ate one of those fruits she probably lost a lot of contact with the sky, said Naruto. He looked behind him in amusement. And I don't see any black flowers popping up behind me while I walk. I told you that was one case. Billy said with a frown. He sighed. Well, that leaves Aphrodite, goddess of love, beauty and pleasure. Her kids know how to speak French like we, which means yes or their favorite pas très impressionnant, not very impressive. Really? Naruto blinked in confusion. Why do they like to say that? Aphrodite's daughters are expected to break boys' hearts to win her favor, said Billy, shaking his head. A lot of guys at camp try to get their attention. I pity the bastard that actually falls in love with one. All previous attempts have been disastrous well. Except for one guy. He got lucky, though. And her sons? Naruto asked, intrigued, who knows, maybe she doesn't favor them because she compares them all to the Trojan Aeneas. If they have some special right, the camp doesn't know about it, said Billy with a shrug. Oh, what does she usually look like? Naruto asked, knowing that while the goddesses could change their appearance, they had certain forms they liked to take. She appears as the one you love the most times ten, said Billy. He shuddered and rubbed his arms. If I ever met her, 
I feel so bad for doing that to Bibi. Bibi? Naruto asked in amusement. My girlfriend, she's a dryad, a land nymph, she lives inside a willow. So you're dating a tree? No, the spirit in the tree. I'm not judging you, but it's not like that, hey you don't have to lie to me, Billy. You suck, Naruto. I've been told that a lot, said the snickering blonde while his satyr friend glowered at him. He looked up at his happily soaring eagle and called to her. Mew, come down, I think we're almost there. What makes you oh? Billy's words died on his lips as Naruto pointed at the tree at the top of the hill. You, uh, you remembered that, did you? I'm not an idiot. I'm just a slow learner, said Naruto, pouting at the unintentional insult. I never, but, you, I. Billy groaned when he saw Naruto crack a smile as Mew landed on Naruto's shoulder. I hate you, Naruto. Oh don't say that, otherwise I'll have to try to get on your good side, said Naruto with a chuckle while he gave Mew's beak a small gentle stroke with the side of his finger. She crooned at the attention he gave her while they walked up the hill. Naruto grinned at his new friend. Say, didn't you say something about me being the first demigod you retrieved? Yeah. Hey, yeah. Billy perked up. Holy crap, you're the first demigod I've ever brought back to camp. I live to serve, said Naruto with a smile, thanks, Billy. Anytime, Naruto, said Billy, grinning back at his new friend. They continued their slow peaceful march up what was called Half-Blood Hill. Once again, Naruto frowned slightly at the name, and near the pine tree, Naruto saw a dragon, something he thought was only in legends. After Naruto pointed it out, Billy waved him off and they kept walking. Don't mind him. That's Peleus, the guardian of the Golden Fleece. As long as you don't try to touch it, he won't. Bother, you. Billy had stopped, staring at Naruto as soon as he stepped past the invisible boundary, making the blonde arch his brow. Then his vision was engulfed in a red haze, making Naruto go wide-eyed. Hey Kurama, is that you? He thought just a bit hopefully. There was no response, making Naruto's hope sink until he felt something change. He looked at his arms, which looked a bit larger than before. He also noticed that his bare arms were now covered and he was dressed for a different weather. Looking down past his now sleeved arms, he saw that his sandals were still in place, and his strange pants had become darker in color. Weird. Lifting eyes back to his arms, Naruto was happy to find orange on his arm, an orange jacket. He quickly slid the garment off and grinned at what he found. Back in black and orange, kicking ass and taking names was a jacket that was similar to the upper part of his jumpsuit when he was a kid. Well, aside from the collar being furred instead of just white. Heck there was the same Uzumaki carving on the left shoulder. Turning it around, Naruto was ecstatic to find his clan seal smack dab in the middle of his back. He looked at his arms, surprised to find his white t-shirt replaced with a blue long-sleeved shirt. Mew chirped to him and flew from his shoulder, her talon catching something and nearly choking Naruto as she did. Quickly freeing the eagle's talon from the cord that was attached to it, Naruto followed the cord that was around his neck to a small green gem that made Naruto's eyes widen in shock. He thought the first's necklace was lost when he flipped out on Nagato. Naruto. Your face. Billy said in alarm not realizing that Mew's cries or the light Naruto gave off when he was claimed had attracted the attentions of others. What, what happened to my face? Naruto asked, dropping his necklace to put his hands on his face. Feeling nothing wrong, Naruto looked at his hands for any signs of dirt, blinking in confusion when his skin felt smoother than ever before. His eyes widened in horror. What happened to the calluses on my hands? That was a sign of his hard work paying off, damn it. Mr. Overtree, what are you? Oh my, said a man attached to the body of a horse. Naruto could care less about the horseman, his calluses were gone. The shit was that? Naruto, could you obsess less about your calluses and come say hello to your new activities director? Billy asked, worried this would look bad if Grover nope, too late, he's here, too. Well there's something you don't see every day, said the amused head goat. Grover Underwood was chuckling in amusement while the new son of Aphrodite stared in horror at his hands. Grover, I can explain everything. He's not always like this I swear, Naruto, damn it, you're making me look bad. You look bad? I'll be a laughingstock of Konoha if I go back like this, smooth hands. Civilians have smooth hands, 
Shinobi have hands caked in sweat and grime. Naruto seemed to finally notice he was no longer alone. He raised one hand awkwardly to the group of demigods, satyrs and the one horseman. Uh, hi. Two bright lights appeared above him and Naruto turned his head in an effort to see them. Oi! What's the big idea, shining lights on me? Billy, what's going on? Why your mother? Mothers? Uh, you've been claimed, said Billy, confused by the two lights above his head. One was large and pink, shaped like a dove, which explains the, uh, makeover. The other, however, was gray like an owl and much smaller next to the dove. Been a while since this has happened, said the horseman softly before turning to the campers. Camp, we have a new hero, all hail. Dot erm. Naruto Uzumaki. Billy supplied dutifully, he caught Grover nodding at him, making him stand a bit straighter at the praise. Ah, yes, thank you, Billy. All hail Naruto Uzumaki, son of Aphrodite and legacy of Athena. While the campers got to their knees in front of him and Mew banked around a hedge before settling on his shoulder, Naruto reacted as his friends back home would expect him to. What? The horseman told the confused blonde to follow him after the campers rose to their feet. A couple of pretty girls that were younger than him whispered together in a small group and he could feel something akin to hope come from them as they looked at him. Weird, but when was the first time anything a girl did make sense? like Hinata's decision to confess her feelings to him in the fight against Nagato. Touching, yeah, but really an inopportune moment to pick and it didn't lead to anything, not that he hadn't tried. He just didn't like Hinata like that. At least she was still willing to be his friend. Oi, horse guy, how is it I have two moms? Naruto asked, waving at another girl that walked by as she waved at him. Man these campers were friendly. I mean, Billy said the Olympians did some, weird, stuff but um my name is kyron not horse guy mr uzumaki said kyron with a frown as he looked at the boy and you don't have two mothers you're a legacy which is not unheard of but very rare okay yeah but why did i get two lights your ancestor athena deemed you worthy off the bat to be claimed alongside aphrodite's claim said kyron he looked at the farmhouse which he told naruto was called the big house stupid and obvious how could anyone forget that name? Nervously. Things have been tense since the second Titanomachy. The war against the Titans, said Naruto recalling Billy telling him about it. That reminded Naruto, he wanted to meet this Percy kid. He seemed like an okay guy. Quite. Now, I've been informed you would arrive shortly, the head counselor told me to keep an eye out for you. I don't think he knew that you'd be so easy to spot, said Chiron amused while Naruto flushed slightly at being put under two spotlights earlier. I didn't ask for that. Or for these clothes. By the way, where did these come from, anyway? Naruto asked, a brow arched. Aphrodite deems it fit to show off her children during a claiming, said Chiron in amusement. She, perfects, you. I'm surprised she didn't get rid of the marks on your cheeks. They can't be removed, Naruto said with finality. He wouldn't want them to be removed anyway. He was at peace with them and what they meant. Besides, they were there since day one. Er, yes. Well, your cabin is cabin 10, and. Dot how old are you, Mr. Uzumaki? 16. 17 last month, said Naruto with a grin. Boy, was that a party. After he helped rebuild the Ichiraku stand, he was treated to a night out by the village funds, many higher ups in the Shinobi Alliance thanking him for his help got even wilder after Lee had some of the sake he wasn't supposed to have. Really, oh dear, said Chiron, cupping his chin in thought, Drew won't like hearing that. Who? Naruto asked, tilting his head up and looking at Mew as she came in from her survey of the camp. Hey Mew, is it big enough for you? He got a small croon while he stroked her beak, making Chiron look at him. Interesting. That eagle, Mew was her name, yes? Beautiful feather said Naruto smirking as he caught the irony of the name now while Mew gave a small cry at her name's meaning. Very interesting, Chiron said, sounding like he was thinking about something. The centaur looked forward as they approached a pink cabin. He raised a hand and lightly knocked, the door opening to reveal a pretty girl of Asian descent, dressed like she just woke up for the day. Chiron sighed and rubbed his eyes. Miss Tanaka, the morning horn was blown forty minutes ago. Ah, sorry Chiron, 
I must have slept through it, the girl said sweetly. She noticed Naruto and smiled at him before frowning as she realized what his presence meant. Another one? Your new older brother, said Kyron, making the girl's eyes widen. Kyron turned to Naruto, who had his brows furrowed in confusion. Naruto, as the eldest of your cabin, you are now the cabin counselor. It's different for each cabin, but for Aphrodite, who has so many children like Apollo, she has the oldest take charge. Why? Naruto asked, simply out of curiosity, because that's just how mom does it, said the girl with a frown as she looked at her brother, I'm Drew Tanaka. And you are. Naruto Uzumaki, said Naruto with a grin. Mew squawked and he chuckled before looking at her. And this is Mew. Comes with a pet, that's a new accessory, said Drew flatly. She obviously didn't sound pleased at th Naruto's arrival, but was tolerating it because of something. Probably Shiron's presence, Naruto thought. He shrugged it off though, she'd warm up to him eventually. Indeed, said Chiron, once more sounding like he was thinking about something while he looked at Mew. He turned and looked back at Naruto. I leave the cabin to you, Naruto. Drew should be able to help you get used to being counselor. Unless he doesn't want to be counselor, Drew said suggestively, looking at Naruto intently, almost glaring at him without actually glaring at him. Ms. Tanaka, please don't abuse your gifts, said Chiron with a sigh. The poor lad just got here. Yes, yes, said Drew, waving him off. She opened the door further, allowing Naruto to catch a glimpse of the very pink interior of the cabin. Come on then, Naruto. Let me introduce you to the others. Sweet, I've always wanted siblings, said Naruto with a smile. Please be ready by lunch at the latest, said Chiron, frowning at the girl. I'll do what I can to help my new brother get the rest of these lazy bums up, said Drew with a smile. Chiron nodded and trotted off, leaving Naruto alone with his sister. Well, at least he had Mew. Ah! No birds allowed except for, the sky rumbled and Drew frowned. Well if he's going to be like that. Fine, the bird can come. Eagle, said Naruto shaking his head as he stepped in. He cringed at the blinding pink, it was way more than Sakura had on her head. Once the door was shut, the girls who were holding various trash bags or bins of clothes dropped them with a cheer, their hands raising above their head while Drew scowled at them. All of you need to shut up, she said, her command making them begrudgingly do so. She turned to her new brother with arms crossed over her chest. Welcome to cabin 10, Naruto. Now be a dear and relinquish your status back to me. It is after all too much for someone as new as you. Why would I do that? Naruto asked. The smirk that was spreading across Drew's face suddenly turned into a shocked gape while the other girls in the cabin gasped and the guys started to whisper. Naruto, you will make me cabin counselor again, said Drew, glaring daggers at her older brother despite the kind tone in her voice. Mew shrieked at the underlining hostility she had spoken with and Naruto crossed his arms over his chest. With that kind of attitude, I can be sure I won't, said Naruto with a frown. Drew's face turned red with rage while their brothers and sisters smiled at the claim. Naruto, I am cabin counselor, said Drew sweetly, dropping her dagger like glare. Mew shrieked again and Naruto smirked at his sister, flicking her in the forehead hard enough to make her stumble back onto a bed. No, now you stay there until you decide to stop being a brat, said Naruto with a smirk while Drew's livid face glared at him. She started to rise and Naruto frowned. I said sit, Drew. Drew visibly struggled with herself before slowly sitting down. Naruto smiled again and nodded. Good. Now when you decide to stop being a brat, you can help me get the hang of this counselor street. I'll help you. No I will. The cabin members quickly started to volunteer. Anything to keep Drew away from power over them again. Naruto blinked in surprise and smiled at his other siblings. Awesome. I could use the help. Thanks girls. Dot and guys. He said with a pure smile. The cabin cheered again, and many would wonder why Cabin 10 was so happy as they walked by for an activity. Naruto was swarmed by his new cabin members, all of them asking questions like how old he was and where he was from. He told them he was from far away and would give them more after he got settled in. They asked if he had any other supplies and he shook his head, making them nod in understanding. A younger girl, Lacey, who had blonde hair similar to his own, pulled into pigtails and some strange metal on her teeth, walked him around the cabin while the rest finished getting dressed. 
she explained that he was in charge of curfew, chores and a whole lot of other stuff that Naruto was sure he could do by himself with his clones. He wouldn't though, considering his sisters looked like twigs compared to his friends back home and his brothers looked a bit too fragile for his liking. Before heading out to lunch, Naruto told Drew to get in the shower and get ready for the day, making her scowl but oblige, lest she be embarrassed like she was in front of her cabin members a moment before. Naruto shook his head at her attitude and became determined to clean her from it. Shunting that concern aside for now, he continued to listen to Lacey as she rambled on and on about what Drew used to do when she was cabin dictator. Dot and just before Chiron knocked on the door she was having me pull out clothes for her to choose from and then put in a pile just so I'd have to wash them and put them away, said Lacey with a frown, looking far too cute for a 14 year old. Naruto chuckled at her face before looking at his chattering siblings and then at the window where Mew was perched. Well, you won't have to worry about that from me, said Naruto, pulling Lacey into a small hug that she returned gratefully. He let her go with a smile on his face and he grabbed his jacket. As long as I've got this and this, he then pulled at his necklace, I'll be good with whatever I wear. Like your sandals? Lacey asked in bemusement. Not many guys could pull them off after all, but Naruto did. Yep. Naruto said with a smile. He got up from the too soft for its own good bed and stretched. There was a soft rumble that made Lacey look at him with a look of amusement on her face. The older blonde could only laugh. Guess it's that time. He went to the shower and knocked on the door. Drew, lunchtime. Let's go, you heard the horse guy. Chiron, said Lacey with a giggle while Drew groaned. What he doesn't know won't hurt him, said Naruto with a chuckle. He opened the door and his siblings filed out in twos, Lacey waiting for him and scooting behind him as Drew huffed and went to get dressed quickly before rushing out the door after the group that left before her. Naruto looked down at Lacey and smiled at her, boosting her confidence a bit more and letting her run out after the former dictator while Naruto chuckled. As he left his cabin and shut the door, Mew took to the air from the windowsill, flying in the sky with a shriek. Lunch was an interesting affair demigods giving some of their food to the hearth in tribute to the gods. Naruto bowed his head and gave it to his mother and ancestor, dropping a bit for Hades to ask that he go easy on his dad for any sins and then asking for Hestia to help him make good decisions to help his family like she did. The hearth seemed to get a bit warmer after his prayers. Naruto took a seat at the head of the table, Lacey on his left and his brother Mitchell on the right. Drew was at the far end of the left, a bit of space between her and their brother Eric. There were whispers from the other tables, but the first, second, third, eighth and thirteenth tables were empty for no reason in particular, well the second because as Billy said, Hera doesn't have affairs, that's her husband's job. And then Artemis hunters were probably out hunting, the former member of Cabin 1 leading them. But it was strange, wasn't that Percy kid the son of Poseidon? Cabin 3? Before Naruto could wonder more on this, Lacey asked him a question that he missed. Blinking. Naruto looked at his sister, what? I said? How did you beat Drew's charm speak? Lacey asked him again, making the table hush while Drew scowled at Lacey. The look was broken as Mew flew in, shrieking before landing with a few flaps of her wings on Naruto's shoulder. Naruto lifted a small piece of meat, pig he thinks, for her to nibble on. While Mew gobbled it down, Mitchell found his voice. He probably has his own charm speak, Lacey, said Mitchell. The boy got a few curious looks and he said. What? We all know it takes one charm speaker to be immune to another, and Naruto's a guy, so that makes it stronger. My what speak? Naruo asked, both he and Mew giving Mitchell looks like he had grown a second head. Charms peak, said Lacey, it's something Aphrodite. Mom, said Naruto pointedly, he thought it was stupid that demigods would have to call their, godly parents, anything other than what they were. Mom or dad. Mom, said Lacey with a small smile. Can do. It lets the user manipulate whoever they're speaking to, and usually doesn't work on other charm speakers or members of the same, but you must have a lot of practice with yours on girls. Okay well, I don't charm talk or whatever, said Naruto with a shake of his head. I mean, if I did, I did it against Nagato to make him stop his rampage for revenge, but you just said it doesn't work on members of the same, so I couldn't have done it on him. Charms peak, said Drew with a scowl, as a rare gift mom gives to her children. Sure, maybe there's some genjutsu you can use just by talking, and I have the Sharingan buried deep in my DNA, said Naruto with a snort while he took another piece of meat and ate it. 
Naruto, you can charm speak, said Mitchell. You just heard Lacey say that it doesn't work on other charm speakers, and earlier Drew was using charm speak to get you to step down. Listen Mitchell, I don't have charm speak. I just say what I feel is right, Naruto said with a shrug, making Mew squawk at the jostle she got. He apologized by feeding the brown feathered eagle another piece of meat. No charm to it. The members of Cabin 10 just stared at him in disbelief. He had to have charm speak, there was no other explanation to Naruto being able to just shake off Drew's orders. Before any of them could continue Naruto looked up at the sound of footsteps approaching. A girl with blonde hair like honey and gray eyes that had a bit of red around them nervously approached them, looking up at the sky as she got closer. Naruto saw the girl mouth the word, please, making him furrow his brow in confusion. When she stood right next to him, the girl swallowed before she spoke. Your name is Naruto right? She asked, looking as professional as she could. Naruto nodded, but she pressed on. Naruto Uzumaki? Yeah, that's me said Naruto with a grin. He scratched the underside of Mew's beak. This is Mew, and I'm sure you know my cabin by now. Hi Annabeth, said most of the members of Cabin 10. Annabeth waved at them with a small smile before looking back at him. Naruto. See can you tell me if you've met a boy named Percy Jackson? Annabeth asked, her breath hitching at saying his name. I've heard of him, but I haven't seen him yet, said Naruto a bit miffed at not meeting the hero of Olympus yet. Seriously, the guy sounded really cool, but now Naruto was starting to think he was one of those guys that thought they were too cool, like Sasuke. He could accept Sasuke's like attitude, having grown up with it, but he really didn't like other guys who acted like him. Oh, Annabeth said, her head falling and her feelings of depression washing over Naruto like a bucket of cold water. Naruto shuddered minutely from the feeling and looked at his sad siblings while Annabeth walked away. Poor thing, said his sister Alexandra, since Percy went missing from his home, she's be barely able to keep it together. Percy is missing? Naruto asked, going over the conversation he and Billy had about the boy in his head. Naruto's eyes widened as he recalled the present tense Billy used. Goat boy didn't tell him Percy was missing. He looked back at Annabeth and saw her sit down at cabin six a table, she was a daughter of his ancestor. Been missing for a few days, said Mitchell with a shake of his head. Just up and vanished one day after going to bed the day before. We searched the whole city, but no such luck. Here one day, went to school and then gone the next. It's been driving poor Annabeth up the walls. Mew crooned and Naruto consoled her by stroking the underside of her beak knowing that she as an animal was affected by the dark emotions filling his table. He looked at his meal, feeling bad for comparing Percy to Sasuke when he was actually missing. Naruto excused himself and dumped the rest of his meal in the hearth, apologizing for ending the meal so rudely and thanking them for hosting him. Those ninja classes on manners were useful after all, before he went over to cabin six a table. The children of Athena looked up at his arrival, his claiming appearing over his head again making Naruto wave at it in annoyance, he was claimed already, wasn't he? You want to sit down? Offered one of the boys, he had the same blonde hair as Annabeth, who had disappeared from the pavilion, and the same eyes. No thanks, said Naruto with a shrug. Can you tell me where Annabeth went? I want to ask her something. She probably went back to the cabin, said the boy. I'm Malcolm, I was there when you got claimed earlier. Oh yeah, that. So Aphrodite's cabin, huh? What about it? Nothing. Just be grateful you're not Butch's brother. He's a nice guy, but the crap he gets for his mom. Who's his mom? Iris, goddess of rainbows, ouch. Yeah, but like I said, he's a nice guy. Well, thanks Malcolm, I'm gonna go see if I can get Annabeth to talk to me, said Naruto with a nod of his head while Malcolm shrugged. Good luck. Without her, I'm in charge and quite frankly it kind of sucks. That and seeing her sulk is really weird after seeing her so happy for so long. Naruto stood on the steps of cabin 6, looking up at the owl that was over the doorway and then back at Mew. I dunno if Athena will let you go in, Mew, said Naruto apologetically. The eagle caught the drift and flew off towards cabin 10, where she was oddly welcomed with open arms, Naruto felt bad that he had to send her away, but he really wanted to talk to Annabeth. Something was telling him to help her out, and doing so he would be rewarded with more than just gratitude, but something of equal reward. Curious about what that inkling meant, 
Naruto raised his hand and knocked on the door of the cabin. He waited a few seconds, shifting awkwardly on his feet. Just when he thought it was time to go, the door cracked open and Annabeth looked at him with her jaw clenched, as though she was trying not to cry. He could tell she had been by tear-stained cheeks and the red puffy eyes she had. Naruto felt bad that Annabeth felt this way, not knowing how she was feeling personally, but empathetically. Uh, hi Annabeth, said Naruto, smiling sheepishly. Look, I know now isn't exactly the best time, but, um, I'm sort of. You're a legacy of Athena, said Annabeth with a nod. Malcolm told me. It's all the cabin can talk about at lunch. She was really strong for not letting her emotions get the best of her, but sometimes you had to let go. Naruto smiled a bit, recalling a similar experience after Jiraiya died. Looks like he was going to be playing Ruka's role this time around. Sorry if that bothers you, said Naruto. I just, I want to know more about Athena. I know she's the goddess of wisdom and honorable warfare, but the second one really doesn't make sense. What is honorable warfare? Annabeth seemed to gain a gleam in her eye, explaining it as best she could to the blonde before her. He kept her talking about her mother and his ancestor keeping her mind off of Percy for the time being. He was invited in after she talked about weapons, when Naruto remembered he was literally without a kunai, shuriken or anything else. So before he could even finish asking about what the demigods usually fought with, Annabeth pulled him into the weapons shack. We're the best suited to help a demigod pick their weapon if they don't want to make their own, said Annabeth proudly, her eyes cleared up and back to their normal gray. So, what do you think? Naruto looked over the options. There were a lot of swords, which made him frown. He wasn't a sword guy. That was Sasuke's shtick. He liked getting up close and personal, hand to hand was always fun. He used kanai and shuriken to cover his long range weaknesses, but there wasn't any of those anywhere. Maybe he could make them in arts and crafts like Annabeth said he could. Then something stuck out to him, something that called to him. His feet moved him and his eyes scanned the rack of weapons for what was reaching for him. He found it at the edge of the long range weapons, leaning against the wall, not even on the rack. It was caked in dust, but still beautiful in Naruto's eyes, unused but full of potential. A simple bow staff, but it was far from being just a staff, something deep within him told him so. Caps that had silver paint chipping off of them covered both ends. The staff itself was a faded bronze and had an obvious gap at the center. Naruto reached for it, grabbing one half that slid off of the other revealing a sharp surprise that Naruto was all too familiar with from the war. Flashes of fighting against Madara's shadows had him stiffen before he came back at Annabeth's voice calling his name. I'll take it, said Naruto, grabbing the other end and flipping it expertly in his hand so that the other sharp tip was away from his palm. He began an intricate dance, one he didn't know where he picked up, possibly ingrained from his fighting in the war, but one that was memorized all the same. He finished by connecting the staff, clicking it together with a grin. But, surely you want something else, said Annabeth weakly. The guy would get killed if he ran out there with that old thing. No, I want this, said Naruto, nodding as he looked at it. A smile spread across his face. It feels right. I can't stop you, said Annabeth, still a bit unsure about his choice. But I really don't think it's smart. The smartest thing you can do is to follow your gut, said Naruto with a grin, quoting Jiraiya. His quote made Annabeth's eyes go wide. Where? Where did you hear that? She asked him. Naruto blinked and his smile died down. My sensei Jiraiya. J Jiraiya no Gama? She asked hesitantly. Six foot tall, white hair and. Dot and toad sage, Jiraiya? You know Aero Senen? Naruto asked, nearly dropping his new weapon in shock. How was that even possible? D Immortales, said Annabeth. She rushed back into the main room of cabin 6, Naruto quickly following after her. The daughter of Athena scoured the bookshelf, asking herself what she did with it. She ran over to one of the bunks shoved to the side of the room and began nearly tearing it apart before she found what she was looking for. A dark leather bound book with very familiar kanji written on the front in bright yellow. Yandaimi Hokage, said Naruto, his eyes widening. You can read it? Annabeth asked, looking at the kanji with wide eyes. It's like a mix of Japanese and Cantonese. I can't make sense of it. The inside is Greek, but Naruto, who is this man to you? He's he's my father. Why? Naruto asked. Because Naruto, 
He's my brother, said Annabeth. Minato Namikaze was a son of Athena. A, a son of Athena? Naruto said, blinking in confusion before it's circa. Wait, does that mean Athena's my grandmother? Seems that way, said Annabeth with equal surprise. A legacy only one generation away, he's almost eligible to be in her cabin. Does that make you my aunt? Naruto asked, a smile spreading across his face. W well technically yes, Annabeth started to say, only for Naruto to cut her off. Sweet. I'm gonna call you Aunt Annabeth, he said with a blinding smile. Annabeth blinked before frowning a bit. Please don't call me that, she said. Okay, Aunt Annie, said Naruto, grinning widely. Definitely not, Annabeth said flatly. What about Auntie Anne? he asked innocently. No, please. No, Anna Oba. You're not going to stop until I say yes, are you? Annabeth asked dryly. Nope, Naruto said with a grin. He was having far too much fun with this. Fine, Annabeth said, giving her nephew a stern look, just not in public. You got it, Anna Baba, Naruto said with a grin. Annabeth just shook her head in exasperation. The blonde son of Aphrodite's grin fell slightly as he looked at the book in Annabeth's hands as she started to flip through it. He thought about the war once again, his father's reanimated corpse fighting alongside him in their tailed beast forms helping Naruto get some near-fatal blows on Obito. He knew that Minato was his father and that he was a strong and smart shinobi, but that was it actually. After Madara was defeated, all of the revived shinobi crumbled back into dirt, his father included. He hardly got to know the man. Annabeth. His voice was softer and carried weight in it that hadn't been there before. She looked at him curiously, seeing him look at the book longingly. See could I see that? Of course, she said handing Naruto the book. Annabeth watched as he took it carefully, as though it could turn into dust as soon as he touched it. His brows furrowed as he looked at the lines in the book. He flipped through the pages, the same confused look on his face. I, I can't read this, he said. Annabeth immediately gained a look of understanding. It's in ancient Greek, she said. I could teach you how to read it. Really? Naruto asked, a bit surprised. His smile became splitting it was so wide, thanks Annabeth. Let's go to a table and we'll start off with the alphabet, said Annabeth, going to one of the work tables covered in papers, strategies of old kings and generals from different eras spread across it, cleaning it a bit to make some room for them. This is going to take a while isn't it? Naruto asked, a bit hesitant to begin a class. He leaned his staff against a wall by the bunks and quickly joined her by the table. Well yeah, it's not like you can just learn ancient Greek in a day, said Annabeth with a snort. You have to put in hours of effort, it could take months before you could read ancient Greek without struggling. Usually year-round campers get it down in their first year. Months, huh? Naruto asked, dropping the journal on the desk. He lifted his hands into his favorite, or coined, depending on who you asked, seal. Taju Cage Bunshin no Jutsu. Annabeth covered her face with her arms as smoke suddenly exploded around her, and she cut through it with her knife getting a popping sound. When the smoke fully cleared, her eyes widened as filling the room to the brim with Naruto duplicates, all grinning at her. There was even one hanging from the rafters of the cabin by his feet, while about half of them had claimed the bunks to the side as seats. The rest were either seated atop the bookshelves or standing around her with their arms crossed or their hands on their hips. Wa what is this? Annabeth asked. My favorite jutsu, a Naruto, hopefully the original, said with a blinding grin. The Taju Cage Bunshin no Jutsu, a forbidden A rank jutsu that lets me make shadow clones of myself from my chakra. I'm my own army, and the best part is, every experience a clone gets before it dispels I retain for myself. You lucky jerk. And they're corporeal, said Annabeth, poking one of the clones in the chest, making him bat away her hand with a smirk. She frowned at it and punched it in the arm, making it pop and making her gasp in surprise. Oh, yeah, but they're extremely fragile, said Naruto with a chuckle, his clones grinning while in the back a couple of clones broke into a fight. They dispelled each other and Naruto rubbed the bridge of his nose. They're insubordinate, too. Idiots. Cloned from the best. One chirped before another dispelled it with a hard punch. Naruto smirked at his clones before looking back at the odd Annabeth. Do you know what I would do to be able to do something like this? Annabeth asked him, 
can you teach me? Yeah, see, it's forbidden for a reason, said Naruto, scratching the back of his neck sheepishly while some of the clones began to flip through the books on the shelves, able to read the English texts. The technique costs so much chakra that it would kill anyone with less than Jonin level reserves. Lucky for me, I've got at least two cages worth on my own. Heck, this batch barely cost a tenth of my reserves. Annabeth just sat down and rubbed our head as she took this all in. From what she read from her mother's journal about Minato, Chakra had to be trained from a young age in order to be used. It allowed the mortals of the moving continent, or the Isle of Latoids as it was once called before it expanded in size, to do amazing feats, but this. Dot she never expected a legacy of all people to have the ability to learn as fast as he wanted to, and being a son of Aphrodite, Naruto was attractive naturally and already there were whispers around the camp, so went the gossip at her table from her sisters, about him. If it ever got out that he could fill the camp with clones of himself, poor guy would never be left alone. So what do you want us to do? Naruto asked, breaking Annabeth from that line of thought. She looked around at the expectant and curious blondes looking at her, making her smirk and stand up. All right, on the bookshelf is several copies of ancient Greek for beginner books, let's get started on that said Annabeth. The clones immediately looked to the others swarming the bookshelves and Naruto sheepishly scratched the back of his head. Guess they were a step ahead of you, he said with a chuckle. After an hour of the beginner books, Naruto had the basics down, though he nearly collapsed from the information intake when the clones dispelled all at once. Annabeth guessed that made sense, considering that the human, and demigod, brain could only handle so much at a time. They ended the lesson there. Annabeth a bit hesitant to do any more despite Naruto's urging. She wanted to see how he did with his chosen weapon anyway on the training field. The second she said the word, training, Naruto's eyes lit up excitedly. The blonde moved so fast he didn't wait for Annabeth to finish telling him where to go. She managed to catch up with him and show him to the sparring grounds where a couple of brutish kids were. They all had the same camp half-blood shirt on but over that wore camouflage jackets. Off to the side was a girl dressed in the same manner with a spear in hand, watching two of the guys roll around on the ground, she looked up at their arrival. What's up, owl head? she said, smirking at Annabeth. Naruto knew it was a derogatory name, but from the smirk and her posture could tell she meant it all in good fun. Reminded him of Sasuke calling him Dobi or himself calling the jerk Teme. Nothing much, Clarice, Annabeth said. She gestured to him. This is Naruto Uzumaki new counselor of cabin 10. Naruto, this is Clarice LaRue, counselor of cabin 5. Ares, right? Naruto asked. Clarice's smirk grew. Not bad for a newbie. Time for initiation? She asked, a bit eager to go for it. No, Clarice, said Annabeth, shaking her head. I just want to see how good he is with his weapon. A bow staff? Clarice asked looking at the long stick Naruto held in one hand and rested on his shoulder. She smirked. Not a spear or a sword. Spears have a tip that's off balance and my best friend back home has a sword for his shtick. Naruto said with a shrug. There was a familiar shriek and Naruto looked up as Mew swooped in and landed on his unoccupied shoulder. I was wondering where you were. Mew crooned once more as he rubbed his finger under her beak, all the while Clarice and Annabeth watched the interaction in confusion. What's with the bird? Clarice asked, getting an insulted cry from Mew. Hush Mew, she didn't mean anything by it, Naruto said, calming the eagle. Mew is a golden eagle, said Annabeth, looking at the bird of prey with interest. Well, yeah, but I was gonna say she's a friend, said Naruto with a grin while Mew gave him a small croon for his soft stroke along her beak. She sorta got attached to me while Billy and I were coming to camp. It could be a sign from Zeus, said Annabeth quietly, trying to figure out why the king of Olympus' sacred bird was with Naruto. Nah, she would have told Billy something on our way here, said Naruto looking at his eagle with a grin. She just decided to come along for the ride. Right, Mew. Mew cried out again, making him chuckle. He may not know what she said exactly, but he got the gist of it from the feelings in her voice. He looked back at Annabeth with his grin still in place. So are we going to do this or what? Sure, let's just hold on there, I'll head, said Clarice, cutting Annabeth off and getting their attention. I think I should test the new guy. He is taking Selena's job, you know. Clarice, 
I don't think. Who's Selena? Naruto asked, blinking. Both of the girls looked at him like he was in the process of growing a second head before Clarissa's eyes narrowed. Selena Beauregard was the best counselor that Cabin 10 ever had and was one of the biggest heroes of the second Titanomachy, said Clarice, her voice dangerously stern. That Drew was not worthy of taking her job and now I want to see if you are, Blondie. Right now, you're teetering to the side of not being worthy. I don't care what Billy said you did to that Hydra. Naruto blinked at that and grinned at the challenge. I'll show you that I am, and when we're done, you can tell me more about Selena. She sounds awesome. You should probably get ready to sweat and bleed, Blondie, said Clarice, gesturing to his jacket and the shirt he was wearing. Naruto looked down at his jacket with conflicting emotions before shrugging. He could always just sew it back together. I'm good, he said, taking his necklace off and holding it out to Annabeth. Mind holding this for me though? It's sentimental. Sure, said Annabeth, taking the necklace for him while Mew took to the sky. Clarice is gonna fight the new guy cried out from a member of Cabin 5. The fighting kids gathered around them on either side of the two, and Annabeth stepped back to join them while Mew landed on the branch of a tree not too far away. There was a bit of chattering and Naruto saw familiar faces from his cabin joining up with members of Clarice's. Malcolm and a few of his siblings joined the circle as the word quickly spread, surprising Naruto at that. He also noticed there were a whole lot of other girls gathered around his sisters making him blink in surprise and wonder whose children they were. Deciding to put those thoughts aside, Naruto rolled his neck and gripped his bow staff at the center with both hands, twisting and separating it while Clarice pointed her spear at him. Naruto twirled his two baton-like staves in his hand before settling in a stance with one pointed at Clarice while the other was parallel with his head, keeping the pointed edges in from his opponent. There was nothing but the soft chanting of Clarice's name from her cabinmates and a few others. One sounded suspiciously like Drew. Naruto took a deep breath before his eyes hardened and he shot backward to compensate for Clarissa's charge. Sidestepping the thrust aimed at his midsection, Naruto used his right baton to knock her spear down into the dirt and his left to deliver a swift strike to her shoulder. Clarice hissed, retreating and rolling her shoulder to relax it while they circled each other. Naruto used his batons to deflect small jabs sent at his head and body, getting a few whispers from the crowd. Stop footing around and someone draw blood already! shouted a guy in the crowd. Clarice's eyes hardened at that and she once more thrust forward, which Naruto sidestepped again, but he failed to avoid the sudden blow across the face from the other end of her spear. Naruto rolled with it, quickly getting back to his feet while moving his jaw around to make sure nothing was broken. That was going to bruise. How do you like that one, Blondie? Clarice asked with a smirk. My friend Sakura hits harder than you, said Naruto absent mindedly, though Clarice still took it as an insult considering the feminine name he used. Are you saying I hit like a girl? Yes? You're dead? Clarice said, charging at him and stabbing her spear right at his head. Naruto yelped, wondering what he said wrong, as he ducked and dodged out of the way of her spear. He dodged to Sue in one instance allowing Clarice to once more strike out with the other end of her spear and get Naruto right in the gut. Naruto's eyes went wide and he fell to his knees with a gasp as the air was forced out of him. That was definitely a soccer-like hit. He coughed and used his left stave to get back to his feet, ducking under a side swipe of Clarice's spear and stumbling back as she did a swipe back in the way it came. There was a sound of tearing fabric and Naruto looked down to see his shirt sliced open, revealing his stomach. There was a catcall and a few whistles that came from behind Clarice, making her drop her focus on him for one second to use her peripheral vision in an effort to determine where that came from. Naruto used this distraction to his advantage by getting inside Clarice's defense. He used his left stave to keep her spear down and out of his way while bringing the right up over his shoulder and then swinging it, cracking Clarice across the face hard enough to send her to the ground. Naruto had his staves at his side while he panted, raising them up on his guard while Clarice got to her feet, rubbing the left side of her jaw. She moved her jaw much like he did his own when he got hit before she turned to the side and spat out a tooth. She looked back at the blonde son of Aphrodite, who stepped away from her spear and thus from her while staying in his defensive stance. Not bad, Blondie, Clarice said, picking her spear up with a savage grin on her face while a bit of blood came from the corner of her mouth. She twisted part of the spear and the head crackled to life caked in red electricity. 
That's so cool, said a grinning Naruto. His grin fell. Oh, you're going to use that on me, aren't you? Yep. Well, shit. Naruto was once more put on the defensive, avoiding the head of Clarissa's spear while it was thrusted in his direction again and again. More tears were added to his shirt, which he could honestly care less about, but a few that nicked his arms made him groan in annoyance. His jacket was totally going to get shredded or burnt. Time out, time out, Naruto said, jumping back from Clarissa's spear. No time outs, surrender, come on, just let me take my jacket off, I love this thing. Not happening, Blondie. What happened to common courtesy? Naruto asked as he slid out of the way of another thrust that nicked the carving on his left arm. Oi! That tears it. He crouched low to the ground before jumping up, making the demigods watching crane their necks up high as he did. Mew let out a cry and took off after him, their height hidden by the fluffy white clouds passing overhead. A second passed before Mew returned. In her talons held carefully was the orange jacket Naruto was vehement about getting to safety. She dropped it in Lacey's arms before returning to her perch. Clarice ignored the eagle, keeping her eye on the sky and waiting patiently. A minute ticked by and she scowled. How high did he jump? How the heck did he even manage to jump that high? There was another cry and another eagle flew down to land on a branch opposite of Mew. Clarice felt her eye twitch in annoyance. Come down here you freaking coward. Well, since you ask so nicely. Clarice swiveled around to look behind her but saw nothing aside from the crowd and Mew perched on the branch. Clarice turned around again, searching for him. This turned out to be her downfall. She heard a pop, the crowd gasp, her name called by her cabin mates, and then felt something blunt strike her upside her head. Clarice fell forward as her vision went dark, catching herself on her knees and going still when a pointed end of Naruto's stave was held at her throat. I win. Naruto said with a grin from where he stood next to Clarice. The Henge no Jutsu. Annabeth said under her breath. He had disguised himself as the first Mew to land, while the other waited before landing on the other side of the circle. When Clarice had her back on him, he took advantage and got her pinned. It was truly a strategy worthy of Athena. How the hell did you do all of that? Clarice asked when he lowered his stave from her neck. Naruto put his weapons back into their bow staff form and grinned at her. Ninja moves, he said, getting a frown from Clarice. He yelped when she socked him in the arm. That was for saying I hit like a girl, she said. But Sakura hits really hard, Naruto said with a whine, rubbing his arm. She can break boulders with her punches. Oh, Clarice said with a sheepish smile, sorry. It's no big deal, Naruto said, shrugging. He looked down at his shirt and frowned. Was all that necessary? This literally is the only shirt I have. While Clarice prepared a smartass reply, Naruto pulled his long sleeved shirt off, getting an even louder whistle from his sister Lacey. The daughter of Ares gaped at his spontaneous decision to strip and, regrettably, admired his form. His abs were worked to the point you could probably chisel diamonds on them and his pecs were large enough for her hand to fit in. His shoulders were as big as her fist and his arms were at least 22 inches around. He was definitely not built like a son of Aphrodite that was for sure. Man. Naruto's voice broke many girls from their staring. He was looking over his torn shirt with a frown. It's gonna take at least 30 minutes to fix all of these holes, and my jacket. Naruto, you could always just get a camp shirt from the camp store, said Annabeth, shaking her head in amusement. He had to be talking about sewing which is something he had to have gotten from Athena. Naruto looked at her with a blink before he grinned. There's a camp store, cool, he said, beaming as he folded his shirt up and threw it over his shoulder. Mew landed on his shirt-covered shoulder, making Naruto chuckle as he followed his aunt to where the camp store was. Aphrodite's cabin swiftly followed, intent on helping their brother look good while the crowd dispersed, a lot of the girls watching gossiping about the new hottie. Clarissa's cabin mates walked over to her, her second in command mark smirking at her. So Clarice, should we warn Chris he may have some competition from the new guy? Shut up, Mark, Naruto was absolutely giddy as he walked out of the camp store, completely oblivious about the furious blush that was on the face of the poor cashier from when he walked in. The camp shirt was orange. He could honestly die happy now. Well, maybe not now since that would leave Drew in charge again, but that's not the point he's trying to make. Sure it was a bit tight, but his sister said it was better that way. 
He really wished they had fishnet armor, though. When he had asked for where he could get some armor he was told to go to Hephaestus' cabin, who he recalled were technically his step-siblings considering his mother's marriage to Hephaestus. He was curious about them, especially when Annabeth told his gossiping sisters to stop talking about some curse that was on their cabin. Mitchell explained it, talking about the death of the last counselor, Selina's boyfriend, Charles Beckendorf, being the cause of it. So now, there he went, off to satisfy his curiosity with complete disregard for the camp schedule that Annabeth was trying to get him to stick to. Naruto, come on you want to be a good cabin counselor, don't you? Annabeth asked as she followed him. Well yeah, but I also want to see Hephaestus' cabin and meet his kids. They're supposed to be my brothers and sisters right? Naruto asked as he looked up at the soaring Mew, who was keeping an eye on him from above. That bird really did not like him being out of her sight. By technicality, yeah I guess, but they're only your step-siblings, Annabeth said, and your mom and Hephaestus don't really get along well. No, really? Naruto asked sarcastically. Even he figured that out. How his mom managed to grow up as a Jinchuriki while being a goddess, Naruto wasn't sure, but he did know through their word and through Konohan law that Kashina Uzumaki was married to Minato Namikaze, even if she didn't take his name. He was pretty sure that Hephaestus would have smote his father, demigod or not, for marrying Aphrodite if they were that close. That didn't mean Naruto didn't feel bad for the guy, though. Hey, watch the sarcasm, buddy. Sorry Anababa. What did I say about calling me that? Something about not in public or something, I dunno. He shrugged and walked up the steps to the machine-oriented cabin. Raising his fist, Naruto banged on the metal door and waited patiently before it creaked and pulled open. The girl that opened it was pretty, a lot like the other girls in the camp, but not in a way like his sisters were. She was more like an experienced Kunoichi, like Tenten or Tamari, with a hard face that was accented by soft curves instead of angles. Her skin was mocha colored and she had dark hair held back by a red bandana. Hi, Naruto said with a grin and a raised hand while she stared at him. His eyes shut as he continued to friendly grin at his stepsister, thus making him miss the small lick of her lips while her eyes worked up and down his body. Annabeth cleared her throat, making both of them look at her, in Naruto's case with a confused look while the girl looked annoyed. Hi, Nissa, Annabeth said, an amused smile on her face at the girl. Nissa's, annoyed look. This is Naruto Uzumaki, new counselor of Cabin 10. He wants to meet Jake. Of course he is, said Nissa, sounding a bit disappointed. She smiled back at Naruto, once again reminding him of Tamari or Tenten with the confidence she had behind it. Name's Nissa, come on. I'll take you to Jake. I'll be back at the cabin then, Naruto. You should go talk to Kyron when you're done here to get a schedule, said Annabeth, shaking her head. Okay. Naruto said with a grin as she walked off, before walking in and looking around at the steam pipes that made the cabin sweltering hot. Whoa, you guys really are the Smith God's kids, aren't you? And don't you forget it, Blondie, said Nissa, smirking. She opened a door and Naruto nearly burst into pools of sweat then and there, finding the main forges of the camp. Several guys and a couple of girls were gathered around a table, one guy pointing at something on it. Nissa whistled, making them look up. She nodded in Naruto's direction. Jake, the new cabin counselor wants to meet you. Okay, he's met me, said the guy that was pointing at the table, assumed to be Jake. He does know we're in the middle of working on our problem, right? Problem? Naruto asked, walking into the room. Nissa lingered behind him a bit, but came up to his side when he stopped. He held a hand out. Naruto Uzumaki, cabin 10. You're the guy that was at the top of the hill, right? Jake asked, taking his hand and shaking it in a firm grip. The one crying about his calluses? Shut up, Naruto said with a pout as he took his hand back. Oh, I think we're going to get along just fine, Jake said with a small laugh. Wish I could talk some more, but we've kind of got a problem to deal with. Can I help? Naruto asked. Jake smirked at him and clapped him on the arm. Not unless you know how a converter connects to a socket, he said. Uh. Don't worry about it, said Jake. It's the thought that counts. We really need to get back to work on this though. All right. Well if you need help let me know, said Naruto. He put his hands in his pockets and shrugged. I guess I'll go talk to Kyron and get a schedule. Hey while you're there can you tell him we'll probably be in the forest again? Jake asked. 
Naruto nodded, making the counselor grin. Thanks. No problem. Naruto said with a smile. Nissa led him back out of the cabin and inviting him back whenever he needed some work done. Naruto just grinned as he left cabin 9, looking at Mew as she landed on her perch on his shoulder. Cabin 9 is awesome, Mew. Especially Nissa, she's pretty cool for someone who deals with so much heat. Naruto enjoyed a calm walk to the big house, shaking his head in amusement at the ridiculous name the building had. He really hoped one of the kids of an older generation called it that, because the last thing Naruto needed was some god getting on his back about laughing at their building's name. Mew seemed to really enjoy the camp from what Naruto could feel through his empathy. What kind of bummed Naruto out though was his lack of interaction with Billy. Seriously, he felt ditched. Brushing off the feeling of being ditched, Naruto took his surroundings in, watching the campers as they trained. Now, Naruto wasn't Rock Lee or made a guy, but he did way more than the campers did. This felt like, well, it felt like it was aptly named. A camp. Maybe Naruto could introduce these guys to some real training. He wondered what the hand to hand was like and if it could keep up with his Gama Ken. Naruto. Well, if it wasn't the goat that ditched him. Naruto grinned as Billy came up alongside him, a grin on his face while he wore the same orange shirt. Mew squawked at him and Billy chuckled. No, I didn't forget you, Mew. You guys liking camp so far? It's amazing said naruto with a grin he frowned you didn't tell me that percy jackson went missing oh yeah well i figured he was at home with his mom said billy he isn't a year rounder so i didn't really hear much other than he wasn't in his cabin when i left for new york you also didn't tell me about selena beauregard or charles beckendorf okay that was my bad i was more concerned with the fact that you're a sage billy said for a satyr that's like meeting a demigod of pan may he rest in peace. Naruto nodded in agreement, recalling the tale of Pan and his unfortunate death. He would have liked to meet the original sage. As he thought that, Naruto wondered who the father of the old sage was. Knowing that gods and demigods existed raised a lot of questions for the grandson of Athena. Come on, Grover and Chiron want to talk to you, Billy said, making Naruto arch a brow and follow the young satyr up into the large farmhouse. Billy led Naruto through the building to the back porch where the other satyr from before and Chiron were playing a game of cards. Grover, if you try to eat your hand again, I'm going to pull out the pinnacle chips. Honestly, the one good thing that came from the recall was the freedom to play whatever game I wanted, said Chiron, giving a stern look to the dark-haired satyr. Sorry, Grover said sheepishly looking up with the board creaked under Billy's hoof. Oh hey Billy. Hi Grover, said Billy. Beaming a grin at his hero, he nodded respectfully at Chiron. Chiron. William, said Chiron, getting a groan from the satyr. The centaur noticed the blonde behind him and smiled. Ah, Mr. Uzumaki. Welcome to the big house. Annabeth told me you'd be coming by, something about not going by a schedule. Well. Dot you know, being new and all, said Naruto with a sheepish chuckle. True, I may have rushed that. I planned to catch you after lunch, but you rushed off before I could, said Chiron. He then nodded to the eagle still on Naruto's shoulder. I see your friend hasn't left yet. Yeah, Mew's a real sweetie. Right Mew? Naruto asked with a smile to the bird as he stroked under her beak, getting a croon. She really likes you, said Grover in a mumble, lifting a card up to his mouth and dropping it at Chiron's clearing throat. The satyr flushed and set his hand down before he ate it. He looked at Billy, who nodded, and then at Naruto again. You know. Billy said you were a sage. Telling secrets behind my back. I wondered why I sneezed earlier, Naruto said with a smirk. Oh come on, they of all people deserve to know, said Billy with a roll of his eyes. Are you? Grover asked seriously. As the Lord of the Wild and the Chosen One of Pan, Grover had to be sure that all things related to nature aside from gods were, well, naturally right. Billy had told him that Naruto, while awed at the advances of humanity, felt sad that so much nature had to be sacrificed for these advances, making Grover skeptical. Not even Percy was that sympathetic with the satyr's cues. I am, said Naruto. He grinned. Let me guess, you want me to show you? If you wouldn't mind, Chiron asked, admittedly a bit curious. It had been a while since he met a sage, and that was at least 1500 years ago. Sure. Naruto said with a shrug. 
it wasn't like he had anything better to do, and it was always refreshing to meditate. He moved to the railing of the big house and took a seat on it. Like so many times before, Naruto crossed his legs and let his hands fall into his lap. Within seconds, being so close to the Lord of the Wild had its benefits. Naruto was in sage mode, getting wide eyes from Grover and Chiron. Mew cried out again, settling onto her roost on Naruto's shoulder as nature embraced him. Behind him satyrs, dryads and animals came out of the woods to look at the blonde. I don't believe it, said Chiron, not as affected by Naruto's presence as the rest of the nature spirits in camp. The campers soon gathered as well, wondering why the dryads and satyrs were gathered around the blonde. Demeter's children soon became a part of the group, their own connection with trees and crops letting them get a taste for what the spirits felt. Pollux, the only son of Dionysus, also stepped forward, absent-mindedly making strawberries grow around planks that made up the deck of the big house. Naruto finally exhaled, breaking the spell he didn't mean to have over the ones most affected by nature, opening his eyes and smiling at the squirrels that curled up in his hands. He looked at Grover, Billy and then Chiron before releasing his connection with nature causing the animals to scatter, getting some surprised sounds from the campers as they moved out of the way of the retreating horde of forest critters. His once again blue eyes landed on Grover again when the satyr started to speak. That. Dot was amazing, said Grover, smiling at the blonde and wiping away a tear. I never thought that a human could understand what satyrs do. Don't get me wrong, the campers try, but they're still humans, thanks Naruto. No problem said Naruto with a grin as he hopped down from his seat. Didn't I tell you? Billy asked with a grin, a real sage. Well, perhaps power-wise, but there is more to being a sage than just power, said Chiron. What? Naruto asked. The toad said he was a sage. He ate all the bugs and everything that Ma cooked. Well okay, maybe he didn't eat that stink bug but could you really blame him? A sage also needs knowledge wisdom to guide others to follow their teachings. Chiron said. Knowledge is one of the most important tools a sage has at his disposal. But he's a legacy of Athena, no brainer there, Chiron. Grover said, getting the trainer to nod. Yes, but a sage is so much more than, knowledge, Grover. Knowledge is a broad spectrum after all, said Chiron. He looked to Naruto with a smile. Mr. Uzumaki, I believe you could be a true sage with the right help. I would like to offer you that help. What things would you teach me? Naruto asked, curious. Different flora, proper applications of herbs, ways of the world as a sage would know it, philosophy and other things like that, said Chiron. I don't know about philosophy, but the satyrs can help with herbs, flora and fauna, said Grover, Billy nodding in agreement where he stood. Naruto looked behind him at the gathered satyrs, dryads and campers and then looked at Mew who remained settled in her roost on his shoulder. She looked at him intently, her head inclining slightly in almost a nod. He looked back at the three looking at him expectantly with a smile. Well with all the eyes on me, how could I say no, Naruto said with a small laugh. He smiled softly when the trainer of heroes nodded and the satyrs high-fived, remembering the old man sage. Yeah. He could see why Ninshu was worth studying if it brought people together like this. Weeks passed and Naruto fell into a comfortable routine at camp. Taking care of his siblings was the first thing he focused on. Making his sisters train was no easy manner, he nearly pulled his hair out whenever they rebuffed his reasons as to why they should. When it finally came time to talk about his homeland and show them pictures that appeared in a small box at the big house, Naruto found their motivation by showing pictures of his friends. He laughed when Gara and Sasuke ended up on the wall of hotties. Poor bastards better never come visit or else they'll get swarmed. His brothers, on the other hand, were very easy to motivate. He simply said that it'll make them look a little less girly and they were all for it. They loved the way they looked, yes, but they weren't that narcissistic. The second thing he would focus on would be his lessons with Annabeth or Malcolm when Annabeth was checking on Percy's mother. Naruto went with her once and felt horrible that something so bad could happen to a woman as kind as Sally Jackson. Learning about clear-sighted mortals was a lot of fun and hearing stories about her life before meeting Percy's father, Poseidon, was genuinely interesting. He made it a point to join Annabeth at least once a week when she went to visit, if only to get a better understanding of the life of someone connected to their world that wasn't a demigod. According to Grover and Chiron, 
it was a great exercise of his empathy and understanding of the human mind. While his understanding of ancient Greek was coming along faster than the average demigod, his lessons with the satyrs about nature and the ways of the world today were going much better. Though for some reason the satyrs grumbled at him after the dryads would stop by to ask him some questions. Except for Grover and Billy, they just laughed it off. Finally came his training as a sage. Chiron took full advantage of the cage bunchen, putting clones to work at studying the texture and images of various flora that could be found around the world. Or in Cabin 4's greenhouse, same difference. Chiron said he was one of the quickest learners he had in the subject and Naruto wasn't sure if he was joking or not. He really felt some great respect for the original sages if they had to work so hard for what they did. Aside from those four primary parts of his time there, Naruto had a blast at the camp. He sparred with Clarice and the rest of Cabin 5, quickly becoming a big source of entertainment in the camp by the size of the crowd, wondering how he would win or what jutsu he would use. It was only a matter of time before other cabins asked him for help, and that was when he met the members of Cabin 11, the children of Hermes and their, guests, demigods under the age of 13 that were unclaimed by their parents. Oh the fun he had with Hermes' kids, the pranks they devised. It was so fun. Mew quickly became a big mascot of the camp, despite sticking to him every day, even going as far as to make a nest on the window closest to his bed. At least she didn't bite the other members of his cabin, unless they were being particularly rude, she also helped Naruto claim the win for the capture the flag game between cabin 10 and cabin 9. Though they were quickly rushed out of the forest for some reason after the game ended, particularly after there was a rusty sounding roar coming from the forest. It was the 16th of December according to the modern calendar and Naruto was basking in the warm, summer, heat, relaxing on the beach after another rather routine day. Well, it was routine without Annabeth, who had been extremely jumpy for the past three days. She just up and left one day with Cabin 7's chariot and Butch in tow, since he was one of the best Pegasi riders they had. Let it be known that Naruto never felt more bad for another man when he discovered that, being the son of the goddess of rainbows and being the best Pegasus riders. That was pretty much the exact opposite of masculine. Though Naruto did his best to hide the pity he felt whenever he and Butch talked, trying to sympathize as a fellow sufferer. No matter what he did, he could never get a unanimous vote to paint the interior of the cabin. At least he got himself and his brothers some regular sheets to sleep in. Even Drew agreed to that vote, so that said quite a bit of the impact he had there. She had even started to stop using her charm speak on their siblings, so progress was being made. That was a good thing, considering Naruto was getting tired of stopping her charmed victims from doing whatever chore she had told them to do for her. He would retaliate by making Drew take the garbage out and wear the shoes of shame or whatever the hell they were called. It was stupid, but effective. So there he was, playing fetch with Mew on the beach that was within the camp borders. It was a spur of the moment decision to teach Mew to play fetch, and it was even easier than Naruto anticipated. It quickly became Mew's favorite game, catching whatever Naruto threw and bringing it back in her talons, dropping it in his hand and then landing on his shoulder or at his side. Considering how he was lounging on the beach, she decided to land next to him, which he was grateful for. Mew's talons were sharp. All right, catch it before it hits the water Mew and you get a treat, said Naruto, holding up a stick and tossing it to the side as hard as he could, making the stick go flying. Mew released a cry and flapped her wings to get off of the ground before shooting after it. She snatched it seconds before it touched the water, but dropped it and swiftly returned to Naruto's shoulder as he sat up. His eyes were on the falling object heading for the beach. He grabbed his staff buried in the ground next to him and got to his feet, separating it and preparing himself for a fight while Cabin 7 came to the beach with their bows at the ready. The object turned out to be Butch and Annabeth in Cabin 7's now destroyed chariot their pegasi already galloping for the stables while Butch chased after it. Will Solace, the counselor of Cabin 7 and a very good medic Naruto met after inquiring about modern medicine, considering all he knew about was medical jutsu, and that was limited, lowered his bow as Annabeth walked forward with three other teens around her age. Annabeth, come on, I said you could borrow the chariot, not destroy it. Well I'm sorry, but it was an emergency, I'll get it fixed. Naruto ignored their conversation, looking over the newcomers with interest as he locked his staff back into place. One was a teen nearly as tall and as built as he was, blonde much like himself, but with electric blue eyes that had a look of confusion and wary in them. 
Next to him was a girl of what he was told to be Native American descent, she was pretty, arguably as pretty as his sisters making Naruto wonder if she was one. And finally came the short teen, and there was sympathy from Naruto, being the runt of the class himself, with tanned skin, and features much like Naruto's friends in Cabin 11, aside from the curly dark hair. And the fiery hammer above his head, huh, so he had a new stepbrother. Cool. Naruto watched in amusement as the short demigod tried to avoid being set on fire by his claiming, moving his head around while his symbol followed with ease. The poor kid thought his head was on fire by the light. Admittedly, that's a better reaction than Naruto's. He still doesn't have his calluses back, damn it. Like his mother is purposely keeping him from getting them. Not cool, mom. The symbol of Vulcan, said the new blonde guy distractedly. Vulcan? What like Star Trek? Dude, one hate that show. You mean Hephaestus, said Annabeth to the blonde. She nodded to Naruto, who nodded back as he stepped forward. His movement gained the newcomer's attention, prompting him to smile at them welcomingly. Hi there, he said, raising his left hand since Mew was perched on his right shoulder and his staff was in the adjacent hand. In case Annabeth hasn't already done so, welcome to Camp Half Blood. Well, aren't you chipper? Will someone kill the light already? the claimed boy asked. It'll fade away in a bit, said Naruto with a smile. My name is Naruto Uzumaki. Mew shrieked and he looked at her apologetically. Sorry. And this is my friend Mew. She's been with me ever since I came to camp. To the newcomers, the eagle seemed to puff her chest out in pride at that claim. She looked over each of them like her species should, as a predator. Her gaze met the blonde boy across from her before looking to the girl standing next to him. She then weighed the new member of Cabin 9 with a gaze. Mew at her head slightly before shrieking again and flying off, making Naruto hum in curiosity of what she was doing. He laughed when she flew over his head and dropped the stick he had thrown in front of him, she landed on his shoulder and he smiled at her. I did promise you a treat and you did catch it before they showed up. Will, it's good that you're here, said Annabeth, capturing the newcomer's attentions once more. She put a hand on the blonde's shoulder. This is Jason, he's got some kind of amnesia. I need you to take him to Chiron for me. I'll do it. Naruto looked over at Drew as he gave Mew a small piece of meat he kept in a pouch hanging from his jeans belt loop. She had eyes for Jason, and that really upset the other girl, from what Naruto could tell of how she felt. Drew. Naruto's voice seemed to make her go tense and frown. Let will take, Jason. Annabeth nodded and Naruto shook his head at yet another strange name. Let will take Jason to Chiron. But Naruto, Drew. Naruto was stern as he addressed the charm speaker of his cabin. He was very lenient at times, like when it came to lights out, but when it came to the health of others, he didn't take any chances. Naruto nodded at her backing down while giving him a small scowl, returning his attention to the blonde just a bit shorter than himself. Go with Will, he and Chiron should be able to help you with your problem. Thanks, Jason said getting a nod from the sage in training. The girl that was standing next to him looked like she wanted to follow him, but stayed where she was with a glare locked on Drew, one that was returned full force. Naruto sighed at that before meeting Annabeth's gaze. I'll take Piper, she said, nodding to the girl exchanging glares with Drew. All right, then I'll take the new son of Hephaestus. Come on, kid, Naruto said, turning on his heel and walking from the beach to the south in the opposite direction that Will and Jason had gone. As he passed her, Naruto put his hand on Drew's shoulder. Don't start anything, Drew, please. Fine. Drew said with a frown. Naruto nodded and turned back to the new son of Hephaestus, waving him to come along. They left the beach behind, Naruto using his staff as a walking stick though he didn't need to. The name's Leo Valdez, the newcomer said as soon as he caught up to the blonde sage in training, not kid. Well, you weren't forthcoming with your name. It was better than saying, hey you, Naruto said with a chuckle. Yeah, okay. Leo said, rolling his eyes. He looked at the taller blonde with an arched brow. So what was with the light show? Acclaiming, said Naruto. I assume Annabeth told you about demigods and stuff like that. Yeah, but I thought she was kidding, said Leo. He shook his head. Man, what government agency is keeping this top secret? Not any. Naruto said. The camp is protected by the gods, there is a boundary and a safeguard against mortal eyes called the mist, 
controlled by the goddess Hecate. Uh huh. What next? There are magical fairies. Leo's voice died in his throat as a girl around his age came out of the tree just ahead of them, walking up to Naruto with a smile on her face. Naruto, Grover wanted me to tell you that he'll be at the big house to help Chiron. Naruto smiled back at her. Thanks, Juniper. Oh, and thanks for the extra rations for Mew today. Not a problem, she said, looking at the eagle as it crooned at her. Such a sweetie deserves a treat. Oh, don't say that, she'll get fat in two places her head and her belly. Naruto said, getting Juniper to laugh. Leo just continued to stare at them, catching Juniper's attention. Nardo gestured to him. This is Leo Valdez, new arrival and a member of Cabin 9. Really? Juniper asked, giving him a small sad smile. Leo was trying to come to terms with the girl that just waltzed out of the tree still, so he couldn't say anything. Uh, how new is he? Literally just got here five minutes ago. Wow. Juniper said with a smile before looking back at Naruto. I'll see you later for tree treating? Of course, and tell Grover if he needs to call me just to send a rabbit or something, said Naruto with a chuckle. She left back into the tree and Naruto looked at Leo. So how's that skepticism going for you? Naruto asked with a smile. She. Dot was hot. Yeah, Juniper is pretty, but she's taken. I'm pretty sure Grover would pelt you with tin cans if you tried anything said Naruto with a laugh that shook Leo from his stupor. How'd she do that? Leo asked. Walk in and out of the tree. Juniper is a dryad, a tree spirit. Naruto said. He turned to the campers walking around to their next activity and gestured at them with his staff. Camp Half-Blood is one of the last sanctuaries for them in satyrs. They help us train and grow as heroes, and in the satyrs cases, go out into the world to find more like us. So, there are more like her, Leo asked, watching a lot of pretty girls walk by and wave in their direction. He looked at Naruto who was waving back with a small smile and his eyes narrowed in thought. There are, but the satyrs, who are faster than demigods at times, can't catch them, so you know. Good luck catching a tree. Naruto said with a smirk. He loved that joke. What's with the different buildings? Leo asked after they resumed walking. Cabins for each of the gods. From Zeus, Naruto said, pointing at the larger of the two large cabins at the edge of the camp, to Hades. He pointed to a cabin in the opposite direction. They are the homes to the demigods who stay here. What is this place, a summer camp? Leo asked. Naruto laughed. On the nose with that one, Leo. Yes, there are others like us who spend most of the year with their mortal parents, but for kids with nowhere else to go, they stay here year-round. You mean I could live here year-round? Leo asked, grinning as another pretty girl walked by. Hi Naruto, she said with a small wave and a smile. Hi Lian, Naruto said in return, making her smile widen before he looked at Leo. Your father's cabin is cabin 9, which is across from my cabin. What is my dad the god of? Leo asked, full of questions. Like how he could get some of these girls to look his way, but that could come later. Hephaestus is the god of the forge and of fire, said Naruto catching the small stiffening Leo made at the second word. His children can make amazing things from weapons to vehicles and are experts with machines. Though I still don't know where my staff came from. Leo looked at the staff curiously, it's made of bronze? Celestial bronze, said Naruto. The only material in camp that can fight off monsters, which I'm sure are aware of that exist. Yeah, those I know exist, said Leo. That spirit that attacked them in the sky was no joke and he should know. Good. Because you'll probably be making weapons for the rest of the camp to use in case there's an attack. If you can, that is, said Naruto, frowning as he thought about the problem afflicting Cabin 9. Why wouldn't I be able to? Leo asked. I'll let your cabin counselor fill you in. Naruto said with a smirk. He looked to the eagle perched on his shoulder. Mew. Go back to the cabin and wait for me will you? Last thing we need is you to be attacked by another anti-air trap. At his request, Mew flew off before they got too close to cabin 9. Leo watched the eagle fly to the cabin that just screamed girl power, making him arch a brow and look back at Naruto. Are you part of Butch's cabin? Leo asked. No, Naruto said flatly, glaring at Leo for even insinuating it. He dropped his glare after a moment and sighed. I'm the counselor of cabin 10, Aphrodite's cabin. Aphrodite. 
Leo asked. Goddess of love. Leo started to snicker. No way. Seriously? First two guys I meet are the sons of the rainbow and love? Wow. You just watch out for when my mom makes your love life a living hell, said Naruto with a frown. Yeah, okay, said Leo, snickering. Just so you know, I'm technically your older brother. That stopped all snickering. What, Hephaestus and Aphrodite are married? You're my new stepbrother, said Naruto with a smirk, and I'm also related to the goddess of wisdom and war. Leo wasn't missing the threat and swallowed, s seriously? Yep, Athena's my grandmother, said Naruto, nodding proudly. He smirked at Leo again. Love and war is a dangerous combo, kid. Remember that. You got it, said Leo, making a mental note not to piss Naruto off too much. Hearing Leo's understanding made Naruto grin and clap a hand on his shoulder. Cool. Glad we understand each other. Now come on, Jake should be awake right now. Naruto led Leo closer to the cabin for Hephaestus' children and Leo looked it over, admiring it. Steampunk much? Steam what? Naruto asked with his brows furrowed together in confusion. Steampunk, you know, the theme, Leo said. Naruto just continued to stare at him in confusion and Leo sighed, never mind. Naruto shook his head and went up the steps, knocking once more on the front door with his fist. They waited for a few seconds before Nissa opened the door again, her face looking freshly wiped clean. Naruto pushed that thought to the back of his mind, smiling at her in greeting. Hey Naruto, did you come to see me? She asked with a smile. To Leo, she sounded half serious but apparently Naruto missed that as he chuckled. Partially, he said. His free hand gestured to Leo. I mostly brought your new brother to his cabin, you should introduce him to Jake before he passes out. He just woke up, so he won't mind waiting a bit, said Nissa, stepping out and offering Leo a hand. Hey, I'm Nissa. Nice to meet you. Leo Valdez. Leo said, taking her hand for a very brief shake before she once more turned to Naruto. Are you coming to check on Jake, too? She asked him. Nah, I already did that before lunch and I highly doubt anything's changed in the last two hours, said Naruto. I've got to get back to my sisters and prepare them for their races with the dryads. So you have to offer more stories about your friends back home, said Nissa, her hands folding behind her as she smiled at him. Pretty much, Naruto said with a chuckle. Leo looked between them, feeling slightly uncomfortable. Well. If you ever need your armor polished you know where to find me, Nissa said with a coy smile. Naruto smiled back at her, thanks Nissa, you're always looking out for me. Oh believe me, it's my pleasure, Nissa said, then shocking Leo as she winked at him, making Naruto chuckle again before he turned and left down the steps. Wow that was, Leo was silenced by a finger being put on his lips. Shish, quiet Leo. I'm watching the show. Nissa said with a small smile and half-lidded eyes as she stared at Naruto. Following her gaze, Leo regretted it and quickly looked away. Why was he surprised that she was checking out his ass? She was flirting with him rather obviously. That made Leo wonder how Naruto missed it. Was he gay or just an idiot? Well, he did say Juniper was pretty, and he seemed a bit simple. Leo was leaning towards Naruto just being an airheaded blonde. Nissa's finger fell to her side and Leo looked at her then to where Naruto was, more than halfway away from their cabin. The Latino shook his head and raised his fingers to snap them in front of Nissa's face. She blinked several times and then gave him an annoyed look. What the hell, Leo? I said I was watching the show, she said, crossing her arms over her chest. Yeah, but the show is pretty much over. You're watching the end credits like there's going to be an extra scene or something ridiculous like that, said Leo dryly. You never know. He could get pantsed or something. I really didn't need to hear that. Underscore. Naruto walked back to his cabin after his lesson with Juniper, catching a glimpse of Annabeth before she disappeared into Hypno's cabin. He was curious, but it was not really his business, especially if it involved Percy. Did he want to help her? Of course he did. Annabeth was his friend and his aunt, but there was nothing he could genuinely offer to help her with that she hadn't tried already, so he would wait for her to come to him. Something told him that waiting would be the right thing to do. And those gut feelings he had were usually spot on. Naruto entered his cabin and after leaning his staff against the wall, went to Mew's nest, stroking her head softly as she greeted him. Hello, Mew, 
said Naruto, smiling at his loyal friend. Did Travis or Connor try to sneak in another golden fruit? Mew crooned under his touch and Naruto took her answer empathically to mean no nodding in content with that, he took his jacket off and hung it on the edge of his bed, then taking his necklace off and offering it to Mew. She took the cord in her beak and looked at him while he smiled. Gonna shower some of this sweat off, he said. He stripped and walked into the shower, relieved that his siblings were still out at their last activity for the day before the campfire so that he could hop in without an issue. He was in and out in five minutes, making him wonder why it took his sisters at least fifteen and his brothers at least ten. Really, how hard is it to get wet, soap up, and then rinse? Naruto used a towel to dry off, throwing it over his shoulders as he pulled on a pair of dark shorts made of a flimsy material, basketball shorts Annabeth said they were called. He grabbed a sleeveless version of the camp t-shirt, something Mitchell did with the excuse of, trust me, it'll look good. Naruto honestly didn't care about looking good, jacket and necklace notwithstanding, and the stares he got at the campfires when he would wear that shire unnerved him, like he was a piece of meat or something. Taking his jacket to protect himself from the small chill in the air, Naruto headed out towards the campfire setup, grabbing his staff as he left. Mew followed after him, dropping his necklace into his hand before banking around and landing on the opposite shoulder. Naruto tapped his finger under her beak slightly in thanks before returning his attention forward. He was pleased to see that he wasn't among the first to arrive, the first two actually being the new unclaimed girl and their resident oracle. Now she was a character. Red frizzy hair, emerald green eyes and freckles that added to her attractive appeal, Rachel Elizabeth Dare was a very unique girl. When they first met, she playfully complained about her position. Why is it that every good looking guy the first meet is untouchable? First Percy, then Luke, and now you. Life is so not fair at times. Oh well, name's Rachel Elizabeth Dare, and I'm the oracle for you lot. Of course, Naruto didn't feel like he was anything special. He was just himself. She gave him a dry look and then said, Boys are idiots, he didn't feel like arguing it. More than on one occasion he lost in those kind of arguments. Dot and wound up with another lump on his head. Hey there handsome. Rachel said with a smile as he walked up and sat down on the log next to hers and Piper's. Hi Rachel, said Naruto with a smile. He looked to the other newcomer with a grin. Hello, Piper, right? Yeah, said Piper. She looked at Rachel with a smirk, handsome, huh? Duh. You should see his abs. Rachel said. She looked at Naruto's concealed stomach with a leer. You could grate cheese on them. And how did you see my abs? Naruto asked, a brow arching in amusement. Water balloon fight two weeks ago, said Rachel. While he nodded in remembrance, Piper blinked in confusion. But, it's December, Piper said. Have you seen snow around us? Rachel asked. Piper opened and closed her mouth a few times, making Naruto laugh. She pouted at him and crossed her arms. Shut up. I'm new to this, she said. Sorry, but that was funny, Naruto said, wiping a small tear from his eyes. All I can say is Cabin Eleven did a good thing by challenging you to a water balloon fight, Rachel said with a small leer. She grunted as Annabeth wrapped her on the head. Let him be, Rachel. Don't you have a hands off policy? She asked, sitting down between Rachel and Naruto. Doesn't mean I can't window shop, Rachel said with a frown. She crossed her arms. Honestly, sometimes I wish Apollo was a bit more lenient. Funny, since he has the most kids at camp, said Naruto, cupping his chin with a hum. Rachel. Annabeth said warningly. Her nephew was a good guy and practically innocent to all the things Aphrodite's children loved. TCH, just have to have all the cute ones, don't you? Rachel asked with a smirk. Shut up. Piper and Naruto shared a small laugh at the embarrassed flush Annabeth had on her face. It was quiet for a moment, peaceful thankfully and not awkward. Naruto hated awkward silences, until Piper spoke to him. So, um, Naruto, who's your parent? Piper asked. That sounds more like a game show question than a real one, said Rachel getting a glower from Annabeth. Game shows were not her cup of tea. Naruto laughed at Rachel's comment while Piper flushed. That would be a fun game to play with kids in Cabin Eleven, he said. Looking at the blushing Piper, Naruto said with a grin. Cabin 10. Naruto. 
Annabeth said exasperated while Rachel chuckled at Piper's confused arched brow. What? he asked. She's new, Annabeth said, giving him a look. Oh, right. Naruto had the decency to look sheepish. I'm a son of Aphrodite. Really? Piper asked, looking between Annabeth and Naruto. I would have sworn you were her brother. Right? Rachel asked with a smirk. Handsome here has all the good genes. He is the new definition of Smexy. D Immortales, Rachel, I'm sitting right here, Annabeth groaned. Well then move so I can window shop, Rachel said with a pout. And let you corrupt him? I don't think so, it's a miracle his sisters haven't yet, Annabeth said. She turned to her nephew and pinched his whiskered cheek. Isn't that right, Naruto? Annabeth, knock it off, Naruto said with a whine as he batted her hand away. He's the definition of Smexy? Piper asked, amused. Well duh, said Rachel, rolling her eyes. He's Y fine, the perfect balance of Y molecules and fine molecules. Not to mention being Athena's grandson, giving him the smart to go along with it. Thus, handsome is the new Smexy. Piper was once again speechless after Rachel finished her explanation. Annabeth however openly glared at the girl for talking about her nephew that way. Honestly, as if she didn't have enough problems with the rest of Cabin 10 trying to show him off as their prime example of Aphrodite's children, like he's the new Aeneas. Her nephew was better than that barbaric idiot. Rachel. Naruto said with a small flush. He scratched his cheek. You're putting way too much into it again. I'm not all that smart. And he's modest, seriously, he's like near perfect. Just give him a white horse. Rachel said with a groan. She looked up at the sky and clasped her hands together. Lord Apollo. Please, can you just make this gig seasonal and not a lifetime? Rachel. Annabeth did not look amused. I was just kidding, Annabeth, geez. Rachel said with a frown. So, you're Athena's grandson. That means your dad was a son of Athena, right? Piper asked, looking at Naruto with intrigue. It wasn't every day that you met a kid with so much godly heritage in him. Yep. Naruto chirped with a grin. He nodded to some of the coming campers, giving a friendly wave to Leo as he and Nissa showed up to the campfire. Leo snagged the spot next to him, getting a small glower from Nissa. And apparently, I'm the first legacy to camp in over 50 years, I think. 40, Naruto. Annabeth said, correcting him. The last one was William H. Gates III, a son of Athena and a grandson of Hephaestus. I'm related to Bill Gates. Leo asked with bright eyes. Naruto shrugged. He still didn't see what was so special about technology. Oh the door can open with a click of a button. Mortals were just getting lazy if you asked him. Yes, but don't let that go to your head, Naruto. It's a very rare for a legacy to show up at camp. Annabeth said, to which he rolled his eyes, but nodded nonetheless. Soon enough, the rest of the kids at camp had gathered around the campfire. Naruto noticed Piper stealing glances at Jason and Leo was doing the same, but not for the same reason. Jason, the poor guy, looked distraught and confused, which was understandable, considering he was suffering from amnesia. Naruto didn't know what that was like, but he supposed it was akin to a Jinchuriki losing their tailed beast, like when he almost died from Kurama's young separation. Thank goodness his dad had given him the yin half of Kurama. Naruto wouldn't know where he would be without the giant fox inside him. Kurama was his friend, practically a brother, and his current, Koma, was upsetting to the blonde Jinchuriki. He knew that Kurama had to find balance between his two chakras, but it was taking so long. Naruto hated waiting, he missed his friend. He wanted to share the new world he discovered with Kurama. Naruto was broken from his thoughts when a bolt of lightning came down and struck the bonfire. He immediately hopped to his feet with his staff in his hand. Jason was standing as well and the air suddenly became still, as if it were confused over who to side with. Annabeth stood and sat the older blonde down, while Chiron did the same with Jason. A son of Zeus, said someone from where Apollo's cabin sat. Zeus kids get all the cool stuff, a son of Ares whined. Jupiter. Naruto caught the name and blinked, his head tilting in confusion. Wasn't that a Roman name as well? This Jason kid really knew his Roman pantheon, didn't he? Zeus is your sire, Jason. Chiron seemed a bit too eager to enforce that. He really was being Mr. Negative lately, even with training. 
He was shifty when it came to questions about the big three and events after Grease's fall. It made Naruto curious. A son of Poseidon goes missing and a son of Zeus arrives? Naruto asked with a frown on his face. Doesn't anyone else find that a bit strange? Like you're one to talk, said Mark with a snort. Mr. Ninja son of Aphrodite and legacy of Athena. Seriously, how does that happen? Naruto flushed at that being pointed out while the other campers laughed. Rachel opened her mouth to add something when she suddenly shot to her feet, her eyes going blank. Child of lightning, beware the earth, the giant's revenge the seven shall birth. Child of love, beware the king's wrath, lest the sons of the sage walk a different path. The forge and dove shall break the cage, and death unleash through Hera's rage. She's coming out of it, said a child of Apollo. Rachel was caught as she fell down to her seat, the boy that spoke before being among the few that helped her into a chair that was set behind her as soon as she shot up. Rachel looked exhausted after giving her prophecy. Naruto didn't envy her for that, still, child of love, twice? It seems, Jason, that you have been given a quest by the gods, said Chiron. He looked around the campfire. Forge and Dove are quite obvious indeed. Do we have any volunteers from cabins 9 and 10? Count me in, Jason. Leo said hopping to his feet. I had your back at the canyon, and I got it now. Are you sure, Leo? Jason asked. The guy had been nothing but helpful and kind. You know it. Leo said with a smirk. All right, but you have to find us some transportation, said Jason. The beware the earth line had him a bit concerned for the way they would be moving. That takes care of our cabin, said Nyssa. She looked over where the Aphrodite daughters and sons were gathered and then stole a glance at Naruto as he fidgeted with his staff. I'll go, Drew said, hopping to her feet. She smiled. I'll be a great help on the quest, won't I? Drew would be good. A camper said. Others swiftly agreed with him. Naruto shook his head. Drew must really like the way Jason looks if she's using her charm talk to get on this bandwagon. No, Piper said, rising to her feet. I should be going on this quest. I've known Jason longer. Really? Drew asked scathingly. And how is that, Miss Unclaimed Girl? Drew. Naruto said swiftly, his eyes narrowing in disapproval. Naruto could go, said Annabeth, getting some eyes on her, including a look of betrayal from Piper. He is the only counselor of Aphrodite without a quest. Now there's an idea, said Will with a nod of agreement. Many others soon began mumbling in concurrence. But, I should go. I can help Jason said Piper firmly, it was as if the campers had been doused in something, their murmuring changing to support Piper. No, I'm a daughter of Aphrodite, I can go, Drew said with a frown. You just like the way Jason looks, Piper said accusingly, you want to use the quest to get closer to him. Isn't that what you want to do, Drew asked with a scowl. That's, and the fact remains that you're not claimed, if anyone doesn't have a right to volunteer it's, Drew was cut off by a bright rose-colored light appearing around Piper. Her hair was pulled up and the jeans and shorts she wore were replaced with a long white dress. Above her head after the light faded was a pink dove. Well, I think it's safe to say she can go, Naruto said dryly while everyone just stared at the girl. What who the heck jacked my clothes? Piper asked, making her new brothers and sisters. Sans Drew, laugh. Naruto, wiping a small tear from his eye, chuckled. That, Piper, would be our mother's doing, said Naruto. He got to his feet and walked over to her. He stood a good head and a half taller than her and he lightly clapped a hand on her shoulder. Welcome to cabin 10, Piper. Thanks, Piper said after a moment. He grinned and Mew gave a soft cry as she spread her wings, as if making the moment official. Rachel. The new siblings looked to the oracle as she got back to her feet. I'm fine, Rachel said waving off the camper helping her recover from her prophetic vision she walked around the campfire before standing in front of jason jason you must rescue hera before the solstice you know the great prophecy the prophecy of seven some of the seven are here already i'm sure of it she looked exhausted and stumbled back before jason could help her she was caught by naruto's clone she grinned up at him while the new three demigods gaped thanks handsome anytime rachel the Naruto clone said, grinning back at her. He helped her back to her seat before he disappeared in a poof of smoke. What the heck was that? 
Leo asked, a few campers murmuring excitedly about it. Another reason I wish Lord Apollo was more lenient, said Rachel with a sigh. Handsome here is every girl's dream come true. A man who's good looking and can multiply. Mr. Uzumaki is a unique demigod aside from being a legacy. Chiron said with a roll of his eyes at the oracle's comment. He comes from the island where the Latoids were born, now named the moving continent by most of the gods and the elemental countries by the natives. They developed a way to manipulate their own life force and use it to do extraordinary things, such as Naruto's clones. Only downside is they last about a second in a fight, Naruto said with a sigh. Does anyone here really mind that though? Rachel asked with a tired smile. No, said most of the girls sitting around the campfire, all of them smiling with eyes glazed over in thought. Leo scooted away from Nissa with the look she had on her face. They do make great cannon fodder, though, said Malcolm, getting a glare from Annabeth for saying it. What, they do? You sure you still want to go, Piper? Jason asked, thinking about the possibilities where Naruto could come in handy. Yes. Piper said readily before looking down at herself. Just, not in this. Highly impractical, Lacey said, nodding in agreement. Lacey, you help her get ready for her quest, said Naruto. He nodded his head in the oracle's direction. I'll help Dustin get Rachel back to her room. Carry me, handsome? Rachel asked, pouting at him. Only if you're good, Naruto said with a chuckle. He missed all the jealous glares sent the oracle's way. Rachel just stuck her tongue out at them. Naruto turned back to look at Piper, putting a hand on her shoulder. You'll probably leave as soon as possible, considering the time limit. Be careful, Piper. I've heard some horror stories and I don't want to lose a sister I just got. Th thanks. Piper said with a small stutter. I believe this calls for an end of the campfire. Chiron said. Campers, back to your cabins. There were a few disgruntled groans and grumbles but Cabin 10 seemed to be excited to have another member, two in two months was a good record. Especially with Naruto overthrowing Drew, that was a very good thing. And him naming Lacey second in command, much to Drew's chagrin, was unusual, but still better than the alternative. Naruto turned to Rachel, who pouted at him and held her arms out expectantly. Rolling his eyes, Naruto looked at Mew. You don't mind, do you? Mew spread her wings and flew over to Lacey landing on the girl's shoulder carefully. Naruto chuckled and then picked Rachel up, cradling her like a bride. The younger girl grinned at that while Dustin, the son of Apollo who was a part of the Oracle Care Group, as Rachel called them, rolled his eyes and followed. Underscore, that lucky buy. Nissa. Annabeth cut the girl off as she lingered behind with Jason and Leo. What? She is. Nissa said with a scowl. Who knew sisters could be such a pain? Leo said with a groan. What was that elf boy? Nissa asked, glaring at him. Nothing, underscore. Can you tuck me in tonight, too handsome? Rachel asked with a yawn. They were walking towards the big house, where Rachel had a room. Naruto hadn't seen it, his meeting with her took place at cabin 6. I think you're old enough to tuck yourself in, Rachel, Naruto said with a chuckle. Nonsense, she said with a grin. Who wouldn't want you tucking them in, handsome? You're too tired to think straight, Rachel, said Naruto. Dustin opened the door and Naruto walked in, setting her on the couch to the right of the door. She frowned as he stepped away. I'll see you tomorrow. That's no fun. How's about a kiss good night? She said, grinning at him. Her eyes clenched shut and she groaned. Stingy jerk. Just one. Good night, Rachel. Naruto said with a small chuckle, not aware she was serious. He left, giving Dustin a wave good night, leaving Rachel pouting on the couch. Dustin, think you can convince your dad to come meet me face to face? She asked her caretaker for the night, who chuckled in amusement. She crossed her arms over her chest with her pout still in place. I need to make a new deal with him. Good luck. Dustin said with a snort. Well, with a successful businessman for a dad, you pick up a few things. She said cheekily, maybe I'll get lucky. And then the gods will grant me immortality. Not likely, said Dustin with a chuckle at her pout. Jerk. Underscore, Naruto made his way back to the campfire, his mind racing with worry. He's had time to train his brothers and sisters, making them strong enough as Genin who had been on a few C ranks. Which, in terms of regular humans, 
gave them enough strength to put up enough of a fight against Ares kids without getting creamed in five seconds. Heck. Lacey could last a good ten minutes against Mark, so that was something. Apparently, camp was the primary way most demigods got trained, and without knowing her personal history, Naruto wasn't really 100% comfortable sending Piper off without any training. Sure she'd have Jason and Leo to back her up. Naruto was confident enough that she wouldn't need to be protected, having enough sense to figure out she had charm talk like Drew did. But still, something about the prophecy had Naruto on edge. Child of love, beware the king's wrath, lest the sons of the sage walk a different path. Naruto groaned and sat down on one of the logs set out for the campers, his hands rubbing his face as he did. He heard a distant roar and turned towards cabin 9 before shaking his head and looking back into the fire. His eyes narrowed in confusion when he saw a girl standing between him and the fire, sitting on her knees and humming pleasantly while poking a large iron stick into the campfire. Uh, shouldn't you be at cabin 11? Naruto asked her. While I think I would be welcomed, I have a duty to stoke the fire, she said softly. That seems like it would be a bit dangerous for someone your age, Naruto said. It's simply knowing how to avoid being burned. The girl looked over her shoulder and the flames seemed to crackle in her eyes as they met his. You sound troubled, groaning to yourself. I'm just worried about Piper, said Naruto. He felt very comfortable around this girl, she gave off the same feeling Ruka did. She set her iron stick down and turned to face him fully. She literally just fell into this role and she seemed more concerned about Jason than herself. I've had a friend who was like that once, unable to bear the thought that a guy she liked was fatally injured. I doubt Piper is that bad, but I don't know, something feels wrong about letting her go off alone and untrained. Let me tell you a story, the girl said, getting Naruto's attention. There was a boy much like you at camp, once. Worried about his friend that was on a quest. He went so far as to break the rules and leave the camp to save his friend from the sea of monsters. He faced a sorceress, a hydra and the cyclops who held his friend hostage, all for the sake of his friend. This hero came back successful, and his name is heralded as one of the bravest, and foolish, heroes this camp has ever seen. Sounds like my kind of guy, said Naruto with a small smile, what is his name? Percy Jackson. The girl's eyes twinkled in amusement as Naruto burst into laughter. Oh man, I can't wait to meet him, he said. Naruto chuckled and looked at the sky. I think we'd get along just great. Wonder if he likes ramen. I'm sure you both would get along greatly, the girl said with a smile. She picked her iron staff up and stood, smiling at the blonde as she did. You will know what to do, Naruto Uzumaki. The last Olympian smiles upon you. Dionysus, Naruto asked, getting a giggle from the girl as she walked away towards the big house. Naruto started to turn to follow her with his gaze before shaking it off and looking back at the fire. He watched the fires dance thinking of words his grandfather like leader said to him all those years ago. Naruto, to those like us who posses the will of fire everyone is family. The desire to protect one's family builds thicker and stronger bonds between each and everyone in the village. If the will of fire is embraced by everyone, the village will be alright no matter what happens, the old leader of Konoha said as he stood with a near graduated Naruto on the top of the fourth Hokage's head, overlooking their village. That's when Naruto realized that to become Hokage meant to be more than acknowledgement and he made his proclamation to become the strongest and greatest Hokage the village has ever seen. Naruto smiled slightly, looking up at the starry sky as he thought about his homeland. Cabin 6 would love it, the architecture, the military structure and the school. His sisters probably wouldn't care about that, which made his grin widen. They'd probably be more concerned with getting Sasuke's attention. Amused at the thought, Naruto gathered himself up and headed towards his cabin. He'd go back to Konoha after he was done helping his family. First son of Aphrodite to be Hokage. Dot now that would be a goal to strive for. Underscore, the next morning came all too soon for Naruto, who woke with a gran as Mew cried out to the cabin along with the morning horn. Several of his sisters joined him in groaning, enjoying their beauty sleep far too much. They woke sluggishly. Naruto getting out of bed in all of his boxer clad glory to give Mew a pat on the head. Leaning against the wall as he stroked the eagle's head, Naruto yawned and looked over his siblings as they stumbled out of bed. Piper's got first shower rights, said Naruto with another yawn, getting some wines. She's got a quest, girls. 
first flights, first rights. Naruto waited for his sisters to finish up in the shower, a whole morning endeavor all on its own, and after an hour finally managed to get in. After he got out, he joined them at breakfast, looking over and noticing Jason's absence from the cabin one table. Must be nice, sleeping in before a quest. Maybe he should have let Piper sleep in. Nah, they would probably leave like he said the night before, as soon as possible. They went back to the cabin to get ready for inspection, something Aphrodite's cabin was notorious for never doing wrong. Naruto thought that in itself was a miracle, considering all the clothes, accessories and makeup their cabin had. According to Mitchell, not only were their sisters, and a few brothers, worried about looking good, they wanted to look neat. Pristine, was the word Mitchell used. It was all going well until the fight started. Naruto was getting ready for his lessons with the satyrs when Drew and Piper got into a verbal tiff that very nearly came to blows had he not forcibly kept them separated. Thank the gods for shadow clones, seriously that technique was so useful. As he feared, Drew started it. She had started talking crap about Selena, again, claiming that she went against their mother's ideals. Apparently, Drew's idea of true love was to break hearts, like Aphrodite had to many of her lovers. Naruto, personally, thought that was bullshit. Piper apparently thought the same, coming to Selena's defense and asking what Drew knew about it, asking if she'd ever actually felt something for another guy. And then Drew brought up Jason and Piper's history, which totally blew Naruto's mind. Apparently, someone had used the mist heavily around Piper and Leo's memories, making them think that Jason had been in their school for months. Not only that, but Piper's memories had her and Jason in a serious relationship. He really felt bad for his little sister, and felt really pissed at whoever toyed with her head like that. Someone was going to get a good old Uzumaki talking to, i.e. pounding. You're just a minded little brat, Drew said as she finished her rant, getting a gasp from her sisters. Drew. Too far. Put the shoes on, Naruto said, his clone forcing the Asian girl to turn towards the closet where they were kept, not being that gentle about it but not doing it hard enough to seriously hurt her. He looked at Piper, her jaw clenched and her eyes blinking back the tears rapidly, deciding that it was a bit too much for her and walked her out of the cabin. Come on, Piper, said Naruto as he led the younger girl out of the cabin on a walk. When he felt she had regained enough control over herself, Naruto decided to speak. Do you feel better? Not really, Piper said, frowning. She's wrong, I don't. I'm not crazy. Jason and I, we, we have something. Well, it's not my place to say if you do or don't. It's not Drew's either. You and Jason have to decide for yourselves, said Naruto. He smiled at her. I think you know that already though. Did you want to go on this quest? Piper asked, wanting to change the subject. Naruto hummed, making her look at him. Well, yes and no yes, because I would love to get out there and kick some more monster ass. No, because I feel like I could still do some good here, he said. Do you? I don't know. Piper said, frowning. She really didn't. She had wanted to go to help Jason. Dot and then there were her dreams. She wanted to find out what had happened to her dad. At the same time though, she wanted to take it all in. Lacey had told her she had a special power and she had no idea how to use it. Lacey also told her that while a strict trainer, Naruto was the best in the camp. He wasn't the smartest, but he was definitely up there when it came to infighting within cabins. Plus, a whole cabin of siblings really beat out correctional facility or school. Well, I think you'll define, Naruto said with a smile. You're a smart girl, I mean, you didn't just squeal in joy when mom jacked your clothes. She do that to you, too? Piper asked. The blonde deflated. She took my calluses. That's. Dot bad. Naruto gave her a haunted look. It's horrible. I've worked years and it showed with the calluses on my hands. Piper gave him a look like he was weird, but still smiled, letting a small laugh out as he looked away. I swear only Cabin 9 understands me. Well at least someone does, said Piper with a smile. Naruto was weird, but he was funny. And he was a pretty nice guy. Piper was happy to have a big brother like him now. True. Naruto said as he smiled back at her. I want you to take care of yourself, Piper. I could use another sister that feels my pain when it comes to. He shuddered. Pink. I feel your pain. Piper said, patting him on the arm sympathetically. She released a surprised squeak when he pulled her into a hug for about three seconds. 
and Naruto. What the hell? I can't let my new little sister go off without a hug, he said with a chuckle as he set her down. Piper huffed and gave him a mock glare while Naruto smiled at her good naturedly. Go find the others and kick some ass. Show them that Cabin 10 isn't all pink and hearts. Thanks, Naruto. Piper said, her glare falling into a small smile that turned into a smirk. Try not to seduce anyone else while I'm gone, will you? What do you mean? Naruto asked, confused. Piper just laughed, turning around and walking towards Cabin 1. Piper, hey, what do you mean seduce? I don't understand. After her refusal to answer his question about her comment, Piper had joined up with Jason at Cabin 1, leaving Naruto to sit at the remains of the bonfire and think about his options. He thought about what the girl the night before had said about Percy leaving to help a friend of his. The blonde sage was very uneasy and his gut was telling him to go, to keep an eye on Piper and the other two. However, he couldn't just go on the quest on a whim. Or could he? Annabeth told him how in rare occasions, some quests have more than three members, her quest into the labyrinth being one of them. Naruto understood that three was a sacred number, genin teams in the elemental nations were set up that way after all, but there was usually an experienced warrior to help the fresh genin on their first few missions outside of the village. Naruto snickered as he imagined himself acting like Kakashi while Leo, Jason and Piper took his. Sasuke and Sakura's roles as the annoyed genin. Ah, that would be fun. In fact, an idea struck the blonde and he beamed at the brilliance of it. He hopped to his feet and ran back to cabin 10 as fast as he could, bursting through the doors, startling all of his brothers and sisters as he did. He grabbed his staff, some paper, and a pencil. Naruto grinned at the surprised and confused faces his siblings gave him. Going out for a while. Lacey, you're in charge. Drew, don't use the charm talk on anyone or else you wear the stupid shoes for a month. Be good. Love you. Naruto left the cabin in a stupor before running out the door towards cabin 6, writing on the piece of paper he snatched hastily. Once he got to cabin 6, he held the paper to the wooden doorframe and stabbed the pencil into it, driving the lead tip through and making a makeshift nail. Piper, Jason, come on let's get this show on the road already. I'm not getting any younger, Leo's voice echoed through the camp. Naruto turned and gasped at what the shorter teen was sitting on as he waited outside of cabin 1. A dragon, like Peleus, but different. It was bronzed and had a more unnatural feel to it, much like TH cars that Naruto experienced in New York. He was stunned for a moment when the dragon turned its head towards him, tilting it curiously as blank mechanical eyes studied him. Naruto wasn't sure how to react to the sudden empathic reach that the creature made, so he let the reach fall short as he continued to gape at the marvel of a creation. Leo certainly did something Naruto thought impossible after dealing with only cars for the month he was at camp. He had made a living machine. By the time Naruto recovered from this discovery, the bronze dragon had already taken off. Shit. Naruto said, swearing as he burst into a sprint until he came to the edge of the boundary. Deciding to kick it up a notch, the blonde jumping to the trees, climbing the branches with each step in an effort to catch up to them. He was at least 50 feet up, jumping from the highest and sturdiest branches he could before realizing he overshot the dragon by a good 20 seconds. Damn it, Naruto said, cursing himself for not paying complete attention. He jumped to a tree the dragon looked like it was going to fly over and climbed to the top with ease, perched on the tip by the balls of his feet. His legs were crouched and his eyes narrowed as he waited before he made his move. Naruto jumped, throwing his free hand out and pleading to whatever god or goddess would listen that he would make it. Fingers scraped against bronze plating and Naruto's eyes went wide. Chakra latched onto the bronze like a suction cup and with all of his upper body strength, Naruto pulled himself to sit on the stomach of the dragon. He sighed in relief as he crossed his legs, not caring for the thing that most humans and demigods called gravity as he openly spat in its face. Take that, Isak Newton or whatever the hell Annabeth said his name was. He almost didn't make it. Naruto could have laughed if he wasn't so busy trying to calm his beating heart. He probably did, considering there was a muffled question coming from above. Whatever, it was probably about the quest. There was a familiar cry coming from below him and Naruto blinked in surprise at seeing Mew flying so close behind him. He smiled at her loyalty and looked ahead into the distance, wondering what would await him on this quest. Underscore, I don't believe it, Annabeth said as she looked at the letter in her hand. 
She shook her head in disbelief. Naruto and Percy were going to be great friends, they were too alike not to be. And once she found the latter, she could then rip into both of them for their stupidity, honestly making her worry. It was like dealing with children. Though she should have known that, having dealt with Percy for almost six years and Naruto for the past month. So here she was, on her way to the big house to report to Chiron that Naruto was gone. From the panicked satyr, Billy was his name, she thinks, running past her towards the entrance of the camp. Apparently Chiron would already be aware of this. Which was good. This was too big a problem not to report, but her nephew should have known better. I mean really, running away from camp to join a quest, what kind of idiot does that? Annabeth asked herself. She frowned as soon as she said it, a name coming to mind instantly. Percy Jackson was that kind of idiot. Great, now she had to put a stop to that sort of behavior. One Percy was enough for her. As she walked up to the front door, Annabeth could hear the lovely voice of Drew Tanaka arguing with Rachel. Great, just what she wanted to deal with. He put Lacey in charge, Drew, the whole cabin has reported it. Just because you're the oracle doesn't mean you get to decide who does what. Ms. Tanaka, Ms. Dare would you both stop arguing over this matter? Chiron said as Annabeth opened the door. The centaur sighed in relief as his weary eyes landed on her. Annabeth, thank goodness you've come. Tell me Naruto is in your cabin doing his studies, please. Actually, Chiron, I came here about that. Annabeth said with an apologetic smile. She held out a piece of paper and Chiron stared at it for a moment before taking it. His eyes scanned over the words and as the hurried note was reread, Chiron groaned in dismay. Another Percy. I don't know how I'll be able to deal with him. They're both worse than Theseus, I swear. He said. The centaur had gained a twitch in his eye as he recalled the days of training Theseus. The lad had the attention span of a fish when he was learning, something his most recent brother had in common with him. Why did Poseidon's children have to take in his worst aspects? Wasn't that supposed to be the faults of Zeus' children? So what did Handsome say? Any particular farewells? Rachel asked, rather innocently. Annabeth saw right through it, rolling her eyes at the redhead's questions. Here. I can't bring myself to read it again. Chiron gave her the note to read, turning around and walking away while rubbing his face. Rachel's eyes scanned the note before she burst into laughter. Drew snatched the note from her before reading it aloud. Dear Anna Oba, gone to help Piper with her quest. Wish us luck, Naruto. P.S. Don't let Drew charm talk Lacey or anyone else into doing chores or else she has to wear the stupid shoes. Drew pouted at being called out and glared at the little drawing of her brother's face with a small peace sign drawn next to it. She looked at the red-faced Annabeth with an arched brow. Anna Oba? Tell anyone about that name and I swear I will find a way to cut your hair off for good, Annabeth said with a glare to the daughter of Aphrodite. He's a riot, Rachel said once she recomposed herself a bit. She sighed sadly. Oh I can't wait to give him his own quest. Alone. In the attic. With some nice music and candles Annabeth stopped glaring I was kidding. That was a rather specific joke, even for you, said Annabeth, frowning at the oracle who just smiled innocently. Or a desperate plea to the gods, Drew said as she crumpled the note in her hand. She and Rachel exchanged a glare. With all that funk around you, you smell like gasoline and roses, Rachel said with a scowl. Oh really, we're going to play that game? Drew asked glaring at the oracle even more she smelled fantastic thank you very much ladies chiron said his tone warning them that he wasn't going to tolerate a fight in the big house they both huffed and looked away before rachel made a whine if only i waited a few months she said groaning and letting her head roll back lord apollo i hope you're happy i swear that the fates hate me rachel he's my nephew i don't want to hear this Annabeth said with a groan as she collapsed in a chair. She looked out the window of the big house at cabin 10, frowning. I hope he'll be all right. Underscore, he is my favorite nephew, after all. All right, I'm bored. Naruto said with a yawn, his chin resting on his hand and his staff laying across his lap, which he covered with his other arm to keep in place. Mew was still flying nearby, now trying to entertain him by doing very impressive flips and rolls. A few minutes ago, though, she tried to bring him a mouse. He appreciated the gesture, and would have welcomed a rabbit. Those could be cooked easily, but, a mouse? Pass. 
Naruto's stomach rumbled and he groaned. He skipped breakfast to ask Piper about her past. He never saw her as a car thief, but then again she had charm talk so maybe she was just joking and it backfired on her. There was another grumble and he whimpered. He was too hungry to think straight. What he wouldn't do for a cup of ramen. A thought struck his hunger addled mind, maybe Piper or Leo had some snacks. Hope filling his chest, Naruto climbed to his feet and began walking around the dragon. The whiskered blonde grinned as he sat down behind his little sister. Piper, you got something to eat? Dios mio, que diablos estas haciendo aquí? Oh my god, what are you doing here? Leo said in Spanish while both Jason and Piper jumped in surprise. Are you crazy? Jason said. Naruto, what are you doing here? Piper asked with a scream while tightening her grip around Jason's sides. That's what I said. Leo glared at the whiskered blonde. I felt like going, said Naruto with a shrug. Jason just turned around to stare at him, his electric blue eyes wide in shock. Piper also turned to look at her older brother. You felt like. Naruto you can't just leave the camp, Piper said, shouting at the blonde while also trying to calm her still beating heart. Who's going to keep Drew in line while you're gone? Did you think about that? Drew knows not to use her charm talk on the cabin. Naruto said, waving the concern off. Besides, you haven't had any real training yet. Why does that concern me, like, a lot? Piper asked, nervously. Wait, does this mean we have Super Ninja with us? Leo asked, recalling the clone thing. Well I wouldn't say super but pretty much, yeah, Naruto said, grinning happily. I like this plan. I feel really good about this plan. I say the pretty boy stays, Leo said. Sweet wait, pretty boy? Naruto asked. He blinked in confusion. What do you mean, pretty boy? Dude, you've seen yourself in the mirror, haven't you? Leo asked. Yeah, I know I look so weird, said Naruto. He rubbed at his cheeks. I mean, dad looked okay, but I'm so used to having a rounder face. Are you gay? Leo asked, arching a brow. Hell no, Naruto said, his face bright red as previously repressed memories started to rise. He shuddered and spat over the edge at the memory. Ah, uh, Sasuke was like his brother. That was just a horrible thing that happened to them. Twice in fact. Naruto would rather dine on Matoad's bugs for the rest of his life than relive those memories. Okay, okay, no need to be so vehement about it, said Leo. Nothing wrong with being gay, I was just curious. Well I'm not, said Naruto with a pout. He really hoped no one found out about his and Sasuke's accidents. Great, now he'd have to repress those memories again. He shook his head to get those thoughts out of his head. So what's the plan? Annabeth said that we should talk to the Lord of the Winds to find out why the Venti attacked us. Jason said. We're going to Quebec to find the God of the North Wind and get some answers. Cool, meeting a god. Hopefully better than the last experience I had before mom, but that goes without saying. Naruto said, shivering at the recollection of meeting Kagaya Otsutsuki. She deserved the name Rabbit Demon, Freaky Pre Lady. And he was her descendant? Yikes. You've met a god before? Piper asked. Twice before actually, but it's a really long story we don't have time for, said Naruto. It can't be that long. Piper said. It goes back to before I was even thought of and ended just a few months ago, said Naruto dryly. Yikes. Leo said with a wince. Tell me about it. I lived it and it still makes my head hurt, said the whiskered blonde. He looked at his little sister as she giggled and grinned. So what is your weapon? Catropus, said Piper, grinning as she unsheathed the dagger. Helen of Troy's dagger. I don't know who that is, Naruto and Leo said as one. Piper rolled her eyes. The most beautiful woman in ancient Greece? The reason there was a Trojan War? Still no idea. That doesn't help me at all. You two are not allowed to be alone, said Piper with a frown. I'm still learning though, Naruto said with a pout. He smirked at Leo. You, however, have no excuse. Don't make me kick you off Festus. Happy or not, this dragon only listens to me, Leo said. Well, charm speak could work on him. Piper said, girl, whose side are you on? Family first, Leo. Wow, Piper I feel the love. Yeah, but I don't have charm talk, said Naruto. He got a bewildered look from Piper and tilted his head, what? Nothing, 
Just remembering something Lacey told me. Piper said, shaking her head, he really didn't believe he had charm speak. Wow, that. That was actually kind of disappointing, she was hoping he'd be able to help her develop her own. Oh, can I see Katro whatever it's called? Cat Aro Pies, Naruto. Can I see Katropus, please? Sure, here, Piper said, handing the knife to her brother. Naruto took the weapon blade first, holding it up by the tip and turning it around to examine the handle. Unused. In a long time. Probably used mostly for show, he said. Naruto flipped the dagger in the air and caught the handle with ease. Heavy, not good for throwing accurately. Hmm. This thing is really reflect. Naruto cut off as he peered into the reflective blade. Looking back at him was a sleeping woman that rivaled his mom in beauty. She was more motherly in appearance and had dark skin that reminded him of the Hokage monument when the sunset hit it just right. The woman's eyes were closed and a cloak that appeared like the crust of the earth covered her dark hair. The eyes cracked slightly and the smile she had on her face seemed to widen. Show me your face, Godling. Naruto's breath hitched as a female voice echoed in his head. He continued to stare at the image he saw, watching in a disturbed sense of fascination as the eyes slowly slid open, revealing two green and black eyes. I wish to meet the legacy of the Shinju. Naruto's eyes went wide at the mention of the Shinju, the monster created by his ancestor the rabid demon, Kagaya Otsutsuki. The Shinju was the original name of the Jubi, the ten-tailed Biju that was separated into the nine Biju by the Sage of Six Paths. The shinobi-consuming tree that nearly killed all of the elemental nation's inhabitants. Show me your power. Naruto? Piper's voice snapped Naruto out of his trance, he looked at his concerned sister's face and then back at the knife. The woman was gone and after a moment there was no voice in his head. Strange. Dot did he just imagine that? Naruto, you still there? Piper asked. Yeah, he said. He shook his head. Sorry, thought I saw something. This blade is real strange. You thought you saw something? Piper asked, her own eyes widening slightly. Naruto shrugged. Probably just a figment of my imagination, he said. Naruto, I saw something in it, too she said, making Naruto look at her oddly, it's called Katropus, Naruto. Mirror. Naruto said, looking at the blade, more like a looking glass, Piper said. So a two-way mirror. Naruto said. Interesting. He chuckled and looked at the staff resting across his lap. And here I've just got a bronze staff. Ah, but Teddy Roosevelt loved the phrase, speak softly, and carry a big stick, said Piper. The three boys gave her odd looks that had her fidgeting. I pay attention in history class. Teacher's pet. Stuff it, Valdez, anyway, Naruto said, getting his sister's attention. So what did you see? Piper fidgeted for a moment before looking away. I'll tell you later. All right. Naruto said. He made a contemplating hum before he spun the handle of the dagger on his open palm. He caught it in a reverse grip. Have you ever used a knife before? Um. No I just picked it because it felt right, Piper said, wondering if that was wrong. Well, we can't all be naturals, Naruto said with a shrug. He kept the blade in his hand and spun his seat to the side. So when you're fighting, the most effective use of a dagger, in my opinion, is the reverse grip like this. It keeps your arm free to use and doesn't limit you to a front stab. Really? Piper asked, daring to let go of Jason with one hand to look. Jason turned around with her and Leo snorted. Of course the super ninja would know knives. Trust me, I'm not the weapon eccentric ninja. Naruto said with a chuckle, his friend Tenten would be drooling over this dagger. She loved that sort of stuff, and taught him most of what he knew when it came to his use of kanai and throwing stars when he was held back. He should probably thank her somehow. Maybe have Cabin 9 make her a cool sword or something. Now when you're fighting like this, you have to make sure your guard is focused to one side, so if, say, someone comes at you from the left while you're holding with your right, you have to turn quickly. Don't be afraid to HROW a punch when you get locked up blade to blade, or a headbutt. Or you could knee him in the crotch. Thank you, Leo, Piper said dryly. It's what I do. After Leo's input, Naruto helped Piper practice the proper motions while they sat on the dragon. Now, that sounds difficult, but this is Naruto the ninja with the moniker that includes the word, unpredictable. 
He makes things happen when he puts his mind to it, impressively like his mother if you were to ask her. Naruto would stand behind Piper, using his chakra to stick them to the dragon while he positioned her arm. Jason, interested, tried to watch, but when he turned around he nearly got brained by Piper's elbow. All the while, Leo hummed a tune that Piper told Naruto was called, Kung Fu Fighting. Naruto taught Piper other grips and ways to use her dagger, telling the three of them stories about his homeland all the while keeping her on the dragon as they soared towards Canada. Underscore, now entering Quebec, Leo said, collapsing a telescope he pulled from his tool belt. He patted the belt. I love this thing. It's like a ceiling scroll, but with less smoke, Naruto said, letting out a chuckle as the mechanical dragon took them through the cool air. He was feeding Mew as she rested on his leg. It was too cold up north for her to fly for so long. Ah, you're just jealous, Leo said with a smirk. Little bit, Naruto said, making the Latino laugh. How can the both of you joke around at a time like this? Jason asked, rubbing his coin to comfort himself as they drew nearer to the city. Easily, Leo said, looking over his shoulder at the blonde. You just need to relax, I mean it could take us a bit to get to bore whatever. Boreas, Leo. Piper said, shaking her head in bemusement while putting a hand on Jason's shoulder in an effort to ease his worries. But Leo has a point. You should relax. Or at least keep an eye out for where the north wind would be, said Naruto. He looked down at the city. If you were a god, where would you live? A castle? Piper said, pointing at the castle in the distance. Isn't that a bit cliche? Leo asked. It's probably not really a castle, Piper said. And as Festus drew closer, they discovered Piper was right. In fact, the building was more fancy than just being a castle. It looked just like a hotel. It was a hotel. What kind of god lives in a hotel? Leo asked. A god that controls the wind, Naruto said, knowing the unpredictability of his chakra element. Two winged men approached them after he said that. Speaking of, we got company, Jason said. Festus gave a small roar, glaring at the two angels, and coming to a halt midair, preparing to shoot a fireball at them. Leo, not wanting to start a fight with two possible gods, rubbed the mechanical dragon's neck. Easy boy, easy. Halt, barked the one on the left. He looked rather brutish in Naruto's opinion while the other looked full of himself. Joy, he loved arrogant pricks. Well, Sasuke was okay, sometimes. You're not clear to fly here, said the arrogant looking guy, faking a French accent poorly. His brother grinned, reminding Naruto of a happy pig. No, wait. That was an insult to Tun Tun. We need papers to fly a dragon? Leo asked, amused at the thought. This is a restricted airspace, said the guy that was full of himself. Says who? Naruto asked. Us? The brutish brother said with a smirk, Mikal. Which is short for Callias. I am Zeths. Zeths said. Cal here is unfortunately limited to words fewer than two syllables. Destroy, pizza. Well aside from those two words. Zeths said. He looked at the dragon. And unfortunately for you, we're going to have to ask you to turn around. Or else. We destroy, quite so, Cal. Charming, aren't they? Naruto asked Mew dryly. You have to leave, or we destroy, Cal said with a scowl. Dragon no welcome in Quebec. Not bad, buddy, that was two more words with two syllables, and was that three sentences, somebody's practicing their hooked on phonics, Leo said, letting out a laugh. Callias and Zeths? The Boreds? Jason asked. So you know us? Cool. Still not good enough to get through, though, Zeths said. Papers? No, had chance. Destroy, please. We need to make an emergency landing, Piper said, getting Zetha's attention back on her. He grinned. Sorry, sweetheart, but our sister would have an avalanche if we let you. Please, our dragon is falling apart. We could crash at any minute. Festus was such a good dragon in Naruto's opinion, honestly. Who else could have jerked at that precise moment and shot a cog from their neck to support Piper's words? Shame about that nice car on the ground, though. It looked really expensive. Hum, that's a good point. What kind of person would I be to leave such a pretty girl? Dude, that's my sister you're eyeballing, Naruto said with a frown. Can you honestly blame me? Zeths asked. Yes, yes I can. Anyway, 
I would have to be pure evil to refuse such a request. Though father has been a bit cruel to guests, Zeth said. Cal nodded. Best destroy for him, he said to his brother. Now, now, Cal, let's not be rude, Zeth said, chidingly. No destroy, Cal said dejectedly. No destroy, Zeth said with a chuckle, turning to fly away. Ah! Cal followed his brother, his wings flapping in the same manner to show disappointment. Is it wrong that I want to fight him just to cheer him up? Naruto asked. Yes. Yes it is. Piper said as Festus followed the Boreds into the hotel. The side of the roof slid open for them to land inside. Naruto happily hopped off of the dragon, Mew landing on his shoulder after he stretched. Man, that was a long flight. Wish I could teleport like mom can. Or use the Hiraishin. Hmm. Maybe Athena Oba left a clue in that journal how to do it. Naruto said, scratching his chin, getting some looks from the other demigods. Cal looked at Zeth's, who shrugged, before turning their heads at the sound of a throat clearing. A woman stood opposite them, pale like snow, and just as beautiful. She dressed in an icy blue dress that clung to her form. Black hair cascaded down her back and dark brown eyes looked over the newcomers her brothers brought. Narrowing her gaze at the dragon, she looked over the demigods once more. Wow, she's hot. Leo said with a dreamy smile that had Naruto arching a brow in amusement. Name's Leo Valdez, honey. What's a girl like you doing in a place like this? Hot. You dare insult me? I am cold, Leo Valdez. Very, very cold, the woman said, glaring at him. Not what I meant, Leo said with a blink. The woman huffed and looked over the others again, giving Piper a mild look of annoyance and then examining the two blondes. She gave Jason a look of approval and lingered her gaze on Naruto. I am Kione, goddess of snow. The newly dubbed Kione said, her lips curling into a small smile. Naruto smiled back at her and closed his eyes, missing the way her eyes washed over him. Piper, however, didn't and scowled at the goddess for ogling her brother like he was a piece of meat. Granted the glare wasn't as bad as it would have been if she ogled Jason, but it was still pretty damn intimidating nonetheless. Nice to meet ya, name's Naruto Uzumaki, son of Aphrodite. The sage said, getting looks of disbelief from the Boreds. He grinned at the bird of prey on his shoulder. This is Mew, say hello Mew. Mew shrieked and flapped her wings on her perch, getting amused smiles from the demigods. A boy and his bird. Leo said with a sigh as he latched his hands together over his heart, isn't it touching? Eagle, Leo. Jason said with a smirk, whatever, dude, Leo said, his eyes rolled and he dropped his hands to his sides, can we see Boreas now? Absolutely not, Kione said, hostility lacing her voice as she leveled a glare on Leo, you and that beast stay here. Festus looked insulted, and quite frankly, Naruto could understand. Festus looked awesome, he was the very thing most thought of when they heard the word dragon. Not in Naruto's case, but according to Annabeth, that was because of his oriental-like culture. Naruto made sure to look more into this oriental stuff to compare after all this was done. Hey, Festus isn't a beast. He's badass, Leo said with a frown. But if you don't want him to go, who am I to argue with a pretty woman? Festus, come here boy. The dragon approached him and he reached behind the foreleg of the machine and hit something that made a click. Festus' eyes darkened and he began folding inward. Leo chuckled when it finished and grabbed the handle of the bronze-colored suitcase that now sat in front of him. Ta-da! Uh, one second! Leo said, struggling with the bag. He knelt next to the suitcase and tinkered with it before lifting the bag with ease. Ha! Huh? Ta-da! The world's heaviest luggage bag! Leo Valdez, that's not the point. You have fire within you, heat and ice do not mix, said Kione with a frown. Naruto caught Leo's tensing with those words and blinked in confusion. Weird. Kione's voice snapped Naruto out of his thoughts, you do not join us. No deal. Either all of us goes or none of us do, Jason said. Amusing, you think you can negotiate with us, Kione said with a small smile. The room became bone chillingly cold, and Naruto really wished he had easy access to Kurama's chakra at the moment. Valdez stays. Fine. Leo said with a whine. Keep him company, Callias, but do not kill him, Kione said. Just a little? Cal asked. 
No, Cal. Kione said with a smirk as Zets led the other three demigods into the room. She hung back with Naruto while Cal pouted. Leo sighed sadly and set Festus' suitcase down. He looked at Cal. So, aside from kill, what do you like to do? Hockey. Cal said with a grin. That figures, Leo said, putting his chin on his hands. Underscore. So Naruto Uzumaki. Care to explain why you feel so? Wild? Kione asked, looking at the blonde with a small leer as they walked. Naruto blinked in confusion at that. Um. Wild? He asked. Uncontrolled. Like your friend Leo Valdez, you have your own feel to you. Warm, wild and so very much like the wind. Kione said, a faint blush covering her cheeks as she looked him over. Jason Grace has a similar feel. Dot but his is controlled and thunderous, demanding attention. Yours is more. Emotional and free. And I quite like that. Well thank you, said Naruto with a grin. He looked at Mew. Is that why you joined me? Kione looked a bit put off that he seemed to be more interested in the bird. She regained his attention quickly. Why is it you feel like the wind? Dunno, could be my chakra nature. Naruto said with a shrug. At her confused look he elaborated. I'm from the elemental nations, er, I mean, the Isle of Latoids. Really, now Kione's interest was definitely piqued. Not many came off of the moving continent. How does one get a chakra nature? Usually from your parents or grandparents. But I guess that since my mom is a goddess, I got it from dad. Naruto said with a grin. Kione didn't think it was solely his father, since Aphrodite was known as a daughter of both the sea and the sky. Interesting. Tell me more about this chakra, will you Naruto? Kione asked, placing her hand on his arm and giving him a small smile. Sure, why not? Naruto said, blissfully ignorant of her true intentions. Chakra is energy that shinobi make by mixing together spiritual and physical energies. As Naruto delved into the best description of chakra he could manage, Piper turned away from Zetha's boasting in his skill in hockey, ice skating and other winter-related sports to glare at Kione. She felt responsible to her brother, he was far too innocent for his own good. Honestly, how did he miss all the flirts that Rachel exchanged with him and the leers he got in camp? Sure, Jason seemed a bit dense, too in those false memories, but Naruto took dense and added a whole other layer to it. He had to be the most clueless boy on the planet. Elsewhere, in his forced sleep, a raven-haired teen sneezed and mumbled out the name Annabeth. And as one of the most down-to-earth sisters he had, Piper had a duty to protect him from hussies like Kione. At one point, Kione caught the look Piper sent her and smirked at her, glancing at Jason for a moment. This succeeded in making Piper bristle and take a step closer to the son of Zeus. You know I knew a guy, at least I hope it was a guy, who could use ice, Naruto said, getting Kione's attention on him. He had wind and water chakra natures and could mix them to make ice. Interesting. What happened to him? Kione asked, genuinely curious. Naruto's smile dimmed and, despite herself, Piper felt pleased that Kione had upset him. Less likely for her to twist her brother around if he was depressed. He died protecting his most precious person, a man that took him in after his mother was killed by his father. Naruto said. Mew leaned forward and met his gaze, getting him to smile a bit at her. Piper smiled a bit at the sight. Sure Leo may have made fun of it, but it was a bit cute. That's so sad, said Kione, taking his free arm in her own to give him a comforting hug. He sounds like a good person. Haku was the kindest person I knew, Naruto said, sighing. I wish I knew him more than I did. And that I didn't think he was a girl when he first back. Yeah, could do without those memories. So a pretty boy. Hear that Zeth's? I think Naruto may have known a descendant of yours, Kione said. Laugh it up, Kione, Zeth said scowling over his shoulder at his sister. He frowned even more when he saw the closeness between Piper and Jason. His gaze returned forward as they approached two large doors partially covered with frost. Zetz put his hands on either door and pushed them open. Father, we have guests. Mervelo. The sturdily built man seated on the icy throne within the frosty room said. Like Cal and Zetz, the man had ice clinging to his hair and beard. He wore a snow-white suit and had purple wings. At sides of the room were ice sculptures of teens their age, making Naruto grip his staff tighter as they entered. 
He stood closer to Piper, in a sweet, but annoyingly protective manner. She could take care of herself. She caught Jason's nervous shifting and her courage began to falter. She could feel the cold air in the room go still. This was a lot more nerve-wracking than she thought it was going to be. What are you demigods doing here? The man, no, God asked. We seek counsel with the Lord of the North Wind, Boreas. Jason said as bravely as he could muster. You have it, Godling. Boreas said, smirking at them. Now, do you intend to waste my time or not? Naruto stared at the amused Boreas with a bit of awe. This guy felt just like Madara did after he absorbed the power of the Jubi and like Kagaya. This is what being in front of a god was like. Damn. Hard to believe he came from a being that powerful. Well? Boreas asked looking a bit annoyed at their presence, what brings three? Four, father. The fourth is waiting with Cal in the hall, Zeth said. Why is he out there? Boreas asked, a frosted brow arching in question. He is of fire, father. Kione said with distaste. Boreas huffed in disgust and looked over the demigods once more. Then I must ask again, what brings these three before me? He said. Children of lesser gods deserve a swift and cold death. I could use some more decor. What did they do to deserve that? Naruto asked, all eyes going to him. Boreas looked him over before giving a light smirk. A standing order my lord has given. You see, boy, my lord Aeolus is the one who controls the weather, gives us directions on where to blow our domains. He is angry with the gods. After the second Titanomachy, the defeat of Typhoon released many wind spirits that he now has to control. The overabundance of spirits was his last straw and he decreed that the children of the gods were to suffer his wrath. Hence, my decorations you see here. That's hardly fair. Naruto said with a frown. Just because my mom is a god, I have to die. We. Oui. Boreas said, prompting Zeths to grin and unsheathe high blade. Kione frowned. Wait, before you kill us. We came here to get directions to Aeolus in order to find Hera, Jason said, stepping forward. Boreas' gaze shifted to him and his eyes narrowed. Hera's missing. You, boy, who is your sire? He asked. Zeus is my father. Aphrodite is the mother of Piper, Jason said, gesturing to the girl on his left and then to the staff wielding blonde further from him, and Naruto. No wonder dear sister is smitten with the ruffian, Zeth said smirking at his scowling sister. Really? Boreas asked, eyeing the half-siblings with interest. He switched dialects, speaking another language that Naruto could understand. So two children of the love goddess are before me. She wishes me to really decorate my home with the finest, I suppose. Oi! Watch it, Frosty! Naruto said with a scowl while Mew shrieked and flapped her wings threateningly. Boreas merely gave the blonde his amused smirk. Now there's a heated reaction I'd expect of Lord Zeus lineage, Boreas said, leaning forward to get a better look at the blonde. You have some in you, deep down. A legacy? Of Athena, Naruto said, his hand gripping the staff tighter, so what? No wonder you're so inquisitive, Boreas said, leaning back with a chuckle. Hair is missing, hm? Consider yourself lucky boy. Elis told us to hear out a son of Zeus. So tell me. Why should I tell you where Aeolus is? Um. Jason began as all eyes fell to him. He fidgeted in his spot and nervously scratched at his tattoo, which seemed to be burning in Boreas' presence. The god's eyes followed Jason's movement before his eyes narrowed on the tattoo. His appearance changed. His face turned thinner and he miraculously shaved in under a second flat. His clothes changed into a toga with purple lining. Oh. Zeth said, his eyes widening as did Kione's. This, this is not good. You think? Kione asked with a hiss. She looked to her father with a look of unease. Aquilon. Always a pleasure. Kione. Aquilon said, nodding at her. He looked back at Jason. Son of Jupiter. An honor. You wish to rescue Juno? To see my lord. Tell me, were you attacked prior to arriving here? Yes. Er, I mean, yeah. Piper quickly said as Jason seemed to stare in awe at the god. A wind spirit, a total jerk attacked us at the Grand Canyon. Hmm, yes. I received that report a few hours ago, Aquilon said, eyeing the demigods with interest. To get more answers, I would suggest going to the Windy City. 
You're just going to let them go? Zeths asked, appalled. What about Aeolus' decree? His orders are nullified. Aquilon said, waving his son off. There is more to this than just Aeolus' orders. A bigger threat than before rises. Let them leave. But Aquilon, I think keeping one would be more than enough. Kione said, drifting closer to Naruto with a small smile on her face. You would be interested by this one. Born on the Isle of the Latoids. Aqualon arched a brow as his gaze went to Naruto. He shifted back to Boreas, his beard growing back just as quickly. Cracking his neck, Boreas grunted before looking hardly at the blonde with the bird on his shoulder. Elemental. What is your element, boy? Naruto blinked before he held his free hand out and concentrated. A blue spiral started to appear in his hand, the diameter adding a wind blade to it. Naruto smiled at his mastery over his first self created nature technique. Fuden. Rasengan. Boreas laughed in amusement. Wind nature. Brilliant. Yes, I should have assumed her child would have had that element. You're free to go, child of the moving continent. What about me, Jason and Leo? Piper asked. Boreas regarded her for a moment before waving her off. I suppose I should let you go as well, he said with a huff. But father, Kione said, getting the god of the north wind's attention. She lightly brushed her hand on Naruto's arm. Might I keep this one? He'll make an excellent addition to the house. If Kione gets to keep the ruffian, I wish to keep the girl, Zeth said. The attack in Naruto's hand landed at his feet and Zeth quickly stumbled back, shielding his face. You dare. If you touch my little sister, you'll lose more than a hand, Naruto said his eyes narrowed and glaring at the immortal son of Boreas. Mew had her wings spread threateningly and shrieked at Zeth's, siding with Naruto. I'd like to see you try, Zeth said, seething as he reached for his blade. Zeth's, enough, Boreas barked, making his son back down. He held stern eyes on the smarter of his sons. You are out of place, go with your brother and obtain some more pizza for the game on tonight. But father, I said go. Boreas said, the room becoming deathly cold. Piper had taken a half step behind her brother while he gave the infamous Athena glare to the son of Boreas, something that had Jason frown a bit at. Mew shrieked at Zeth's and Naruto tightened his grip on his staff, watching Zeth's with steely cerulean eyes. Zeth's glared at Naruto before leaving the room. The demigods stayed put, tense and wary, until Boreas sighed heavily. Always so headstrong, that one. He is extremely arrogant, gets it from me, I suppose, Boreas said as he raised a hand to his head. Leave now before I get an even larger headache. Thank you, Lord Boreas, Jason said after a moment of awkward uncertainty from the three. I'll escort you out, Kione said swiftly, coming up to Naruto's side and smiling at him, leading him out with the surprised duo watching. Piper's surprise quickly turned to a form of protective anger for her brother while Jason just followed after feeling Boreas gaze upon him. After the two demigods left, Boreas sat back in his throne, looking at the frozen statues that surrounded his hall. His eyes closed and his hand went up to his head, rubbing it. He was wondering why the Queen of Olympus would do something that went completely against a decree of the Twelve, and then he was wondering just why a boy from the Isle of Leto was brought to the modern world. Something was going on and Boreas was not too pleased to be out of the loop. Underscore. So that technique you showed my father, the one thrown at Zeth's. What was that? Kione asked, curious. The beginning step to one of my strongest techniques. Something my dad, a son of Athena, was not able to finish. Naruto said. He held his hand out again as they walked and made a Rasengan. This is my dad's greatest jutsu. Well, the second greatest. The Rasengan, it means spiraling ball. Nature chakra, which I told you about before was meant to be added to the technique, but dad died before he could do it. My sensei, Kakashi, tried but instead ended up making his own technique out of the failed attempt. He helped me develop this, and it took me a war with a psycho and a fight for my life to figure out how to do this on my own. Sounds like a long story, Kione said, smiling lightly at him. I wouldn't mind hearing it. It goes back around 200 years I think. Time estimation in the elemental nations isn't exactly a precise science past a certain point, Naruto said apologetically. I've got time, Kione said, smiling as she sidled up to him. 
Yes, but unfortunately he doesn't. Piper said, appearing at Naruto's other side and grabbing his wrist, pulling him along. Come on, Naruto. Ow. Piper. What did I do? The older child of Aphrodite asked as he hurried after his sister. Jason sped up so as not to be left behind, leaving the chilly air that was surrounding the displeased looking Kione. You need to learn how to avoid large cats, Naruto. Piper said under her breath. What does that mean? Naruto asked. It doesn't matter. Piper said, looking at Leo as he fiddled with Festus' wing. Get the dragon ready. We're going to Chicago. Why? Leo asked, tightening a bolt. Because that's what Boreas said to do. Jason said as Piper pulled Naruto to the dragon. He got on without any prompting, grumbling to Mew about mean little sisters. He got a shriek of agreement. Leo and Jason shared a look before shrugging it off and joining the grumbling Ipper on the dragon. Jason sitting in front of her behind Leo while Naruto sat with his legs crossed. Now I have a new job to worry about, Piper said, catching Jason's attention. What job is that? He asked. Piper just huffed, babysitting. Naruto rolled his eyes, looking back at the hotel as Festus disembarked. Underscore, in the window stood the snow goddess, watching the bronze dragon fly off towards the south. Her lips curled up in a small smile and her eyes glazed over slightly. They were an interesting group that was for sure. The son of Hephaestus was. A nuisance, but the two blondes were delicious. She frowned. If only Aphrodite's daughter hadn't got in her way. Oh well. Four is an unlucky number for questers. Perhaps Kione will be able to snag him later. If he lived that long, anyway, underscore. Piper, wake up, Naruto said, jolting his sister from her sleep. Piper gasped as Festus jerked, suddenly going down. Leo struggled to regain control, yelling in Spanish at the diving dragon. Naruto stood on the back of Festus, easily keeping his balance while Mew took off from his shoulder. They were seconds from the ground and if he moved fast, Naruto could use his clones to jump the rest of them to safety. Well, he would have done that if Jason didn't grab Leo and Piper, hovering in midair like Kagaya, Madara and even he himself had done during the fourth war. Well damn it now he missed Kurama's cloak even more. That sage cloak mode was awesome. And hovering midair. Damn, the pranks he could do. Naruto. Piper said. Jason looked down. In his rush to save the group he momentarily forgot about Naruto. To the three demigods, it looked like Naruto was about to become a pavement pancake. Then, he did something physically impossible. Naruto jumped to the roof of a nearby small building. His landing made the roof make a crack that looked like a spider web beneath his feet. The blonde sage stood from his crouch, the position used to brace himself and keep from shattering his legs on impact. Naruto turned to watch Festus hit the ground wincing in sympathy while Leo cried out in concern for his dragon. Jason slowly descended down to the ground while Naruto hopped over the edge and landed on a knee, using his staff to help brace himself for the landing. Festus. Leo said in concern for his dragon. Ah, buddy. What happened to ya? Well, based on the pieces there and there, I'd say he fell when he should have flown. Naruto said, getting a mild glare. What? Sarcasm is the one class one aced in the academy. Funny. Now do me a favor and give me those robot parts in your body, Mr. Impossible. What's a robot? Naruto asked, getting a scowl from Leo as he turned to his dragon. What? What academy are you talking about? Piper asked her brother. The ninja academy of course. It's where I learned to be awesome. Naruto said jovially. Hey, be a little courteous here. Festus is really hurt. Leo said, looking annoyed at the two children of Aphrodite. Leo, relax. You can fix him, right? Jason asked, trying to play peacekeeper. Leo huffed and looked back at his dragon, reaching into his belt to pull something out. Jason shook his head. All right, first things first, we need to find out where we are, and we need to help Leo fix Festus. I'll find a sign or something I guess, Naruto said, walking off as Mew landed on his shoulder. Piper. Go with Jason. Help Leo out. Fine. Don't talk to strangers, Piper said, making Naruto snort. She and Jason walked off in the other direction, leaving Leo alone to work on Festus. I'll be fine, the son of Hephaestus said, pulling a disc out and dropping it immediately. Geez. 
The disc was completely iced over, colder than anything else he had ever touched before in his life. Leo glared at it before reaching into his belt and pulling out a pair of tongs, using them to pick the disc up. This was the control disc that made Festus work properly. There was no way it could have frozen over so quickly, especially with how Festus was flying from Quebec. My, oh my how could that have happened? Leo jumped where he sat and looked around for the owner of the voice. Here, Leo. Right here. Leo looked at the disc and jumped, a visage of a woman with closed eyes facing him, a serene smile on her face. It was a familiar woman, a woman he saw once in his mom's workshop. Her lips parted slightly as she spoke. Hello again, Leo. She said softly, it's been a while, hasn't it? You. Leo said, glaring at the visage of the woman through the disc. Who are you? How are you doing this? All elements that appear on this planet fall under my domain, no matter what they are. Granted, I prefer the warm, cushiony dirt to this cold hard metal, it's much easier to talk to you this way, she said. Who are you? Leo asked, standing as he glared at the woman. My what a temper you have. Must get it from Zeus, I hear all of his tantrums, even as I slumber. The woman said. Why not make this easier on yourself and just leave after you fix the dragon? Why would I leave Jason and Piper behind? They're my friends, Leo said, glaring at her. Are they? The woman asked. How do you know they won't just leave you behind like your mother did? Leo's eyes narrowed further and he tightly gripped the disc. I'm done talking to you, lady. Oh no, Leo. I'm afraid we'll be seeing each other quite a lot in the coming year. The woman said, her eyes starting to open. Leo never saw what they looked like instead melting the ice with his burning hands. The last thing he saw was the melting smile on the woman's face. Oh yes. We'll be seeing each other quite a lot. Leo scowled as the ice melted away, what a, underscore. Well that makes perfect sense. Naruto said dryly as he looked at the giant billboard across from his perch on the roof of a small building. It was some strange English word, one he couldn't read. Tiroded. What the hell is that supposed to mean? Detroit. Naruto swiveled around to find the source of the childlike voice. His eyes landed on a little girl with green and black eyes like the woman he saw before. She was sitting on the edge of an air conditioning unit. She was barefoot and wearing a green dress that matched her eyes. It's a unique city. Much like how you're a unique boy. Are you supposed to be up this late? Naruto asked, getting the girl to tilt her head, her raven locks bouncing as she did. You look a lot like him when he was your age. The girl said with a small smile, he was nice then. Who? Naruto asked. The girl just laughed, I like you, you're interesting, she said with a smile. Her face seemed to crumble a bit and Naruto became wary. Doden Cage Bunshin. Naruto said under his breath, thinking the girl was a sort of earth clone. The girl's smile widened and she started to visibly crumble away. You're so interesting, Naruto Uzumaki just like he was a long time ago, she said before she crumpled completely into dust, blowing away in the wind like she was never there. Naruto just stared at her spot until being snapped from his gaze by Mew's returning cry, landing on his shoulder with a crumpled piece of paper in her beak. She dropped it into his open hand, nuzzling into his cheek after doing so. Naruto gave her a gentle stroke on the beak, the strange girl, who he dubbed Suchi, still in his mind. He unraveled the paper and looked at the Japanese characters painted on it. Free milkshakes, Naruto read the characters with an arched brow. He gave his companion a bemused look. Is this supposed to help me? Mew just looked back at him and Naruto shook his head, tucking the piece of paper in his back pocket. At least her heart was in the right place. He decided to head back to Leo, intent on telling him they were in Detroit, wherever that was, and seeing if the dragon was fixed. Underscore, by the time Naruto got back to Leo, the elfish boy was tinkering with the wing he was trying to fix before in Quebec. Any luck? Naruto asked, making Leo jump for a second and give the hanobi a glare. Geez, dude, how hard is it to make a sound? Leo asked, getting an impish grin from the taller blonde. Leo rolled his eyes and went back to the wing. Since you asked, I'm just adjusting this wing a bit. It's too stiff and Festus will fly better with a more flexible wing. Should be ready to go after that. Cool. Naruto said with an interested look on his face. I don't really understand this technology stuff. 
I mean, the most advanced thing I ever saw back home was a train I think, and that was an isolated train in the northern part of the continent. That's tragic. Leo said with a shudder, so you have no TV or computers? Nope. Dude, how did you live with yourself? I trained mostly. Naruto shrugged. Sparred with my friends, worked on Senjutsu, and tried to get a grasp on Fuenjutsu. Still working on that last one when I have free time. So you have no experience with any of this? Leo asked. Well I tried arts and crafts once, tried to make some kanai. Naruto said, looking a bit downcast. I'm not so good at it. Nissa's trying to help me with private lessons she insisted on giving me. Yeah, I'll bet she did. Leo said, looking a bit green at the thought. He shook his head and gave Naruto a curious look. Naruto, I got a question for you. You got a wingman? A what? Naruto asked, blinking in confusion. I'll take that as a no, Leo said, grinning. Well, consider the position occupied, now. If anyone asks, just say Leo Valdez is your wingman. Okay. Sure. Naruto said, grinning back. He had no idea what a wingman was, but from what Leo said, the sage guessed it was like a sort of friend that had your back. And more friends were always a plus in Naruto's book. He watched Leo finish tightening a bolt before the elfish son of Hephaestus tucked his socket wrench into his belt. Done. Now, let's go see what's taking the lovebirds so long, Leo said, snorting in amusement. Naruto arched a brow. What do you mean? I know Piper likes Jason, but, he asked. Leo blinked before rubbing the back of his neck. Oh yeah. Well, see. Dot the thing is, in our messed up memories Piper and Jay. Well. They were sort of. A thing. I know that. Naruto said, his hand tightening around the staff he walked with, and thanks for the reminder. Well, anyway, I was just trying to make a joke. You know, lovebirds? Jason's the son of Zeus, who has an eagle and pipers. Oh, hey, that's a good one, Naruto said, giving a light snicker. Don't have to tell me twice, Leo said, chuckling as he led Naruto in the direction Piper and Jason walked off in. They continued to walk down the street, Leo making the occasional joke that had Naruto chuckling or asking what he meant while Mew scoured the city from the sky. They eventually came across a rundown warehouse that Mew had perched herself outside of. Naruto stopped at her side and ran a gentle hand down her beak in greeting. Leo had a mallet at the ready, twirling it anxiously in his grip. Think they're in there? Naruto didn't answer, preferring to close his eyes and listen. He heard the surrounding city, using his chakra to enhance his hearing just slightly to become similar to a canine's. A trick Kakashi taught him after the war during the rebuilding in an effort to find survivors in wreckage or collapsed buildings. Put him down, quiet, Venus spawn, you're next. Yeah, we'll eat you next, girl, stop struggling, Ma's hungry. I am indeed, sons of mine. Get that brat of Jupiter on the skewer. No, Jason. Wake up, they're in there, Naruto said, his eyes snapping open as he gripped his staff with both hands and twisted the poles separating. Mew stay out here. Leo, got a good bronze hammer in that belt of yours? Bronze? Leo asked, reaching into his belt and digging around before pulling out a large sledgehammer that had a bronze head. His mallet was placed in the pocket in the sledgehammer's place, like this. Perfect. We've got at least three enemies. Jason's out and Piper's probably bound, Naruto said as they crouched down and crept closer. Naruto reached the closed garage and slowly lifted the garage door so they could see what's going on. Leo's breathing increased despite himself, fear gripping him for the first time as his eyes landed on the three monsters that were lumbering around in the warehouse. The tallest was 12 feet at most, while the two shorter ones stood at 10 feet. And each of them only had one eye. Oh god, er, gods. Whatever, what are they? Leo asked softly. Naruto glanced to him out of the corner of his eyes. Cyclops. He said, looking back at the three monsters. Monster giants that have one eye. There's a few that are born from gods or titans that helped the Olympians and helped your father in the forge. These ones are the other kind, though. There's another kind? Demigod eaters. Oh, wonderful. Naruto looked at Leo and saw the son of Hephaestus swallow in worry, his eyes slightly dilated in fear. Naruto gained the elfish teen's attention by placing a hand on his shoulder. Hey, relax. 
I won't let my comrades die, and if I have to, I'll protect you with my life. Trust me. He said it with such a bright confident grin that Leo started to feel confident in himself, that he could do this. He gave a grin back and looked into the warehouse, looking at the surroundings rather than the monsters and ignoring their cheers for food. A second ticked by before Leo said those four famous words. I've got an idea, underscore, sump, get ma some salsa, one of the cyclops yelled as Naruto snuck in through the second balcony window. He looked over to the garage door where Leo was crouched by. The son of Hephaestus pointed at one of the cranes in the corner and then another closer to the cyclops digging through three large sacks. Naruto looked at the square piece of wire and metal in his hand, a large piece of something Leo called silly putty sticking to the back. With careful aim, Naruto tossed it at the crane closest to the cyclops in the corner, where it landed with a wet clang. The cyclops ignored it and Naruto gave Leo a thumbs up. Leo gave the gesture back before fiddling with the device in his hand, a sort of remote control that he threw together with pieces he had in his belt and some toys thrown out in the dumpster nearby. Now all he had to do was get the Cyclops' eyes off of Jason and Piper so Naruto could get them out. He flipped a switch and grinned impishly as the sound of a crane turning on hit his knife like ears. Santa came early this year, jerks. Leo said, grinning as he watched the crane come alive. He made it swing back just as Sump turned to look at it. The Cyclops' eye went wide as the crane arm swung forward, the hook impaling him in the gullet while the arm itself spun him through one of the support beams and into the metal canisters stacked in the back. Sump. Torque. Go get your brother, I'll stop whatever meat is causing this. The one known as Ma said. Naruto waited for the two Cyclops to move before he jumped down and landed next to his sister. Naru oomph. Piper was shushed as a hand clapped onto her mouth. Naruto lifted his finger to his lips before undoing her binds with one of his staves, the other tucked in his belt behind him. As soon as Piper was free, he pointed her in Leo's direction before going to the heavily sweating Jason. The poor son of, Zeus, was on a spit, dangling over a fire pit. How the mortals didn't notice this, Naruto hadn't a clue, but he knew Jason was looking just a bit too golden. He couldn't just cut the bound boy off into the fire, so Naruto had to push the spit over where it clanged to the ground. That certainly got the Cyclops' attention. Another demigod, Ma said, glaring at him with her one eye. He's talking dinner, Ma, I can see that, Torque, let's stop him. Great, Naruto said with a grunt as he cut Jason free. Lifting his hand up, Naruto smacked Jason across the face. Wake up. Ow. What the heck? Jason started, only to be cut off as Naruto pulled him to his feet. No time. We have to go. Now, Naruto said, pulling Jason by the arm to the garage door where Piper and Leo waited. Naruto pushed the younger blonde in front of him and turned around to face the two Cyclops. Jason slowed to a stop, reaching in his pocket for his coin. Naruto looked over his shoulder and shouted at him. No, just go, I'll catch up. I'm not leaving you behind to fight alone. Jason said. Naruto grinned at that and held his hands up in front of him, his index and middle fingers forming a cross. I'm never alone. The warehouse filled with smoke and the three demigods found themselves witnesses to something amazing. The Cyclops were being dog piled by a swarm of orange clones, definitely massing and over fifty in number. Naruto, one of them at least, was stabbing Ma through the foot with his stave when he looked up. Go, I'll catch up later, just go. He really is a one-man army, Piper said in awe. Leo ran past her and grabbed Jason's wrist, pulling him out of the warehouse before grabbing Piper's and pulling them with him. He let go after they cleared a few feet, breaking into a run. Come on, you heard, Naruto. We've got to go, Leo said over his shoulder. Piper and Jason exchanged a look, looked back at the warehouse, and then ran back to the warehouse, making Leo stop and grab at his head. Arg. Why does everyone have to be a hero? The three of them stopped as the side of the warehouse exploded, a good dozen and a half of orange bodies flying out and landing on the street before exploding into clouds of smoke. Jason had his coin out at the ready and Piper was holding her dagger. Out stumbled the shorter of the two Cyclops, Torque, holding his head and covered in dust. Stupid barrels. Stupid fire. Told some not to put fire dear. Does he listen? Torque grumbled. He looked up at the tree demigods and glared at them. Orange brat fight and maw, 
So I guess dad leaves me to fight you three. J. Wanna do some Thunder God Kid stuff and zap this guy? Leo asked. Jason flipped his coin in preparation to do that, but was sent flying before he could catch it by a piece of rubble being kicked to his gut. Leo looked at the pinned and struggling Jason and then back at the Cyclops. You friggin. Torque. Ma figured it out. The taller Cyclops said as she walked out with the struggling Naruto in her grasp. Hit the orange brats hard enough and they go up in smoke. It's magic. Gots ourselves a son of trivia here. M. Magic meat is yummy. Torque said, grinning at the demigod in Ma's hand. I'm not a son of trivia, Naruto said, glaring at Torque. Meat is meat. Torque said in return as he took the boy from Ma, squeezing him in his two hands. Naruto felt his ribs being crushed and bit on his cheek to keep from screaming or biting his tongue. Well, that's not good, Leo said under his breath, backing up to stand near Jason as the son of Zeus struggled underneath the debris pinning him down. Put him down, Piper said to the Cyclops. Torque looked at her and she repeated herself. I said put him down, now. Okay, Torque said, starting to lessen his grip. Ma grabbed Torque's wrist and hissed at him. What the pit is wrong with you? She asked, snatching Naruto back from her son. You fool, she's a Venus brat. Got that special talking thing, messing with your head. Sorry Ma. I'll hold him again. Not like I'll give Ya the chance, Ma said with a glare locked on Torque, who flinched under her angered gaze. She nodded and looked back at the groaning blonde in her grasp. Usually I like M cooked and with salsa, but a few raw here and there ain't so bad. Piper easily guessed what she was thinking, as did Jason and Leo, the three of them watching in horror as Naruto was brought headfirst to Ma's mouth. Ma chomped down, a sickening crack filling the air as she did accompanied by Piper's scream. Ma's smug smirk was turned into a look of confusion then pain as she started to cough, smoke leaving her mouth and her hand. Phew, that was close. The three demigods looked above them, where on the side of a building stood the blonde son of Aphrodite, watching the Cyclops hack on the wisps of smoke that remained from his clone. He was glad to see the three show the same dynamics a good team would have, but he was a bit miffed Jason and Piper didn't trust him to handle himself like Leo did. Then again, it wasn't like he offered his plan forward to them like he did Leo. Well, partially anyway. Letting Ma dispel his clones and take a, real, one hostage after he blew up part of the building with the improvised explosion from the Bunshin Debakuha, great clone explosion, was a spur of the moment decision, but he wanted to see just how good team dynamics were. Dude. When was that part of the plan? Leo asked, looking severely annoyed. I thought the plan was distract the Cyclops, get Jason and Piper out. Let you distract them until we get to Festus with that clone you left there and then you'd blow up the warehouse. Meh, I improvise, Naruto said, shrugging, ass. Hey, that's not nice, Leo, Naruto said, frowning. Besides, I have a great ass, Nissa said so. Dude, what? That's my sister, what? That's what she said, Naruto said innocently, obviously confused as to why Leo was mad at him. While Leo visibly restrained himself from throwing his sledgehammer at the blonde, Piper was having her own inner dilemma. Did she hug Naruto in relief that he was alive or choke him for scaring her half to death? Enough! Ma shouted, looking rightly pissed off at the whiskered blonde. I'll slaughter you first, I won't even defile my stomach with your skin. Thanks, Naruto said, sounding confused before snapping his fingers. Oh, right, I forgot something. What now? Ma asked. Jason, you can get up now, Naruto said, grinning as the debris pinning Jason down exploded into smoke. Jason gaped for a second before he scrambled to get to his feet. He grinned as the two Cyclops looked at the rising and sparking son of Zeus with mild concern. I love the henge no jutsu. Jason got to his feet and walked forward where his coin was on the ground. Torque glared at him and charged forward. Jason gave the coin a small flip catching it and letting it unfold out into a sword, which he used to slice through the cyclops' thick leg. Torque let out a pain-filled cry as he crumpled to the ground. The monster's cry was silenced when Naruto landed next to the cyclops' head in a crouch, one of his staves impaling the creature through his sole eye, right into the brain. Torque fidgeted for a moment before going still. You little shits, Ma said, looking livid. 
I'll skin the both of you and return you to your parents. Not a smart move on your part, Naruto said, knowing just how offensive that was. He stood up and pulled his stave out of Tork's head, watching as the Cyclops slowly turned to dust. He arched a brow and looked back at Ma. I got a question for you. How good are you at counting? What does that have to do with anything? Ma asked. She was stalking forward with the full intention of making good on her plans. Everything. Naruto said as five clones attacked her from behind. They impaled her hands and feet with their staves while the original Naruto reconnected his staves together and turned to face Leo. Would you like the honors? Do you really have to ask? Leo said, walking forward and spinning his sledgehammer in his hand. He brought the sledgehammer back and swung it into Ma's head, caving in her forehead and getting splattered with black goo. Ugh. It's in my mouth. Piper looked disgusted while Naruto laughed at the now hacking Leo, the blonde's clones bursting into smoke while Ma slowly turned to golden dust. Jason shook his head in disbelief and opened his mouth to say something when his blue eyes locked on something very troubling. Uh, is it me, or is he reforming? Jason asked, pointing at where Torque lay. Sure enough, the gold dust that had slowly been made was equally slowly going back to where it was, reforming the monster it used to be. That's not good, Leo said, after wiping the black goo off his face. That doesn't usually happen does it? No that's not supposed to happen at all, we need to go, Naruto said. Right behind you, Piper said, following her brother as he burst into a slow run. Jason and Leo swiftly followed after her. They got to Festus, who Leo took all but a second to power up, and climbed aboard before taking to the skies. Below them, there was an angered shout in Latin, then English calling for the blood of the whiskered warrior. Way to go, Naruto, you're now a kiddie superhero. Funny, Leo. Naruto said, chuckling. He yelped when he got elbowed harshly in the side. Ow, Piper what was that for? That, Naruto, was for making me think you got eaten, jerk. Naruto would spend most of the flight trying to get back in his sister's good graces. You can't honestly still be mad at me. Naruto said from where he sat behind Piper. He had been trying for the whole flight to get her to drop the cold shoulder act. During his attempts, Leo told Jason about the woman he saw and the reason Festus wasn't working. Jason suggested they keep an eye out for the woman wherever they could. The daughter of Aphrodite turned around and glared at her brother, jabbing him in the chest with her finger. You faked your death, Piper said, her kaleidoscopic eyes narrowed and appearing a frightening shade of red. And then used that to test us. I have every right to be mad at you. Yeah, but not talking to me isn't going to help with the quest. Naruto said. From the front of their entourage, Leo snorted, Dude, I would just drop it. Piper glowered at her brother, ignoring Leo's comment. Naruto, you pretended to be dead. What the hell gave you that bright idea? My sensei. Naruto said with a grin. Kakashi sensei did the same thing to me and my team on our first mission outside the village. I froze up and almost got myself killed. I needed to see how you guys would have reacted. Piper opened and closed her mouth for a second before pouting and looking away. Her eyes went to the horse-like spirit that Festus was following and she huffed. I'm still mad at you. Naruto let a laugh escape him before he patted Piper on the head, getting her to pout at him. Stop it, I'm not a kid. Ma, you are in my eyes. Naruto said, pressing two fingers into her forehead in a light tap. Imo Udo. We need to focus. Jason said his eyes following the Ventus that had been leading them to Chicago while Piper pushed Naruto back and he laughed. Jason patted Leo's shoulder, might as well try to get some sleep. The dragon will follow the Ventus right? Yeah, Festus will watch him, Leo said, he leaned forward and looked back, you won't let me fall? No Leo, you're sure? Because I remember someone letting someone else fall. I won't let you fall, Leo, oh good, Leo let his eyes fall shut. I was worried for a second there. A few hours afterward Naruto suggested the other two get some sleep after Leo woke up. He sent a pulse of chakra through Festus that would keep Jason and Piper attached to the bronze dragon. Leo was talking about some story he read about a ninja called Snake Eyes or something. Naruto tuned him out, considering the sage wasn't a fan of snakes, even if that wasn't his mom's beef. Then again, most of his sisters seemed to think snakes were gross. Naruto leaned back, his head resting on the lower spine of Festus, 
and stared up at the clouds. They were dark and ugly, not the usual white fluffs that he had come to appreciate alongside Shikamaru in Konoha. Blue eyes drifted shut for but a moment, snapping open with pupils that had slid slightly. Kurama was stirring. The question now was why? Kurama had told Naruto that he had to reintegrate himself back into his former Jinchuriki's chakra coils and that it would take a while, but if there were any danger, Kurama would know and would wake again to help Naruto when he needed it most. Considering that Naruto was seen as a monster among shinobi, even without his biju-laden talents, the blonde was a bit afraid that he would be unable to speak to his friend again. Naruto lifted his hand and focused on the palm, pulling on the small pulse he felt. He stared at his palm for what felt like hours before a small orange flame of chakra appeared in the center, right over the circular tattoo. Kurama? Naruto asked, his hopes rising. Just like that, they dashed as the chakra dispersed into the air when Festus suddenly dove. Naruto shot upward, grabbing Piper and Jason before their necks snapped from the whiplash. Holding the two teens by the back of their shirts, Naruto glared past them at his pilot. What the hell are you doing? We're coming into Chicago air. Did you miss the giant plane flying over us? Leo asked. Jason and Piper stirred from the force of wind hitting them until Leo pulled up. Jason shook his head. What happened? Welcome to the Windy City, Jason, Leo said, he sounded a bit haggard, everything you expected? If you mean swarming with Venti, then yes, yes it is, Jason said as their chosen target had lost itself in a swarm above a fountain that had two monoliths. The monoliths had television screens that were shining an image of a woman's face, the fountains themselves spitting water out from where her lips were. Great, her again, Leo said under his breath. Suchi? Naruto said, squinting at the image. He blinked at the weird looks he got. Some kid found me when me and Mew were looking around. She was a Doden Cage Bunshin, an Earth Shadow clone. That picture looks like her, only older. She's got an eye on us, that's for sure, Leo said, frowning. Beware the Earth. Jason said under his breath, making Naruto blink in confusion. Now why would they go and do a thing like that? So what now? Piper asked looking at Jason. Naruto joined her, curious to how Jason will make his move. They're going down that hole, Jason said. Don't say it, Leo said under his breath. We need to go down that hole, Jason said, ignoring Leo. I knew you were going to say it. I was hoping, but I knew it was a stretch, Leo said, letting a groan escape his lips. He pulled on the reins. I'll land somewhere. Personally, I don't want to try jumping from this high up into the small hole. I was going to suggest we check it out on foot, Jason said. Underscore, they had landed in a park covered in a white blanket of snow next to a frozen lake. Naruto embraced it as best he could and investigated the trees, coming across a sign said the area was called Grant Park. So cities had parks in them that left some nature to the area. Good to know, he thought it was a bit backwards, though. Naruto would have preferred it be more like Konoha, where the forest enveloped the cities, nature surrounding them. Is that supposed to happen? Jason asked, pointing at the flickering light in Festus' eye. Leo paused and pulled a rubber mallet out and whacked the eye, fixing it back to normal. Yep. He said. A hand rested on the dragon. Festus can't stay out here, though. He'll have to circle the city. What if we need to make a quick escape like with the Cyclops? Naruto asked. Leo started to dig around in his tool belt. He gave a grin as he whipped out a giant orange whistle. The son of Hephaestus turned to the dragon. Festus, listen up boy. When I blow this whistle, come as fast as you can, okay? Here, this is what it sounds like. The whistle probably blew out Jason and Piper's eardrums, but it outright shattered Naruto's hearing and sent Mew off into the sky. The ninja fell to his back, clutching at his ears and hearing nothing but buzzing. He groaned and got to his feet, sticking his pinky finger in his left ear and wiggling it around. Piper turned to him and said something. He stared at her for a moment. What, underscore, dot you hear us yet? Leo asked. They were in the middle of climbing down the maintenance ladder in the larger drain they saw earlier near the fountain, which was called Crown Fountain. Naruto found it interesting that when he stepped into the fountain's view, the image would shift to Suchi's familiar face. He would step out of view and it would turn into the older Suchi again. It struck Naruto odd, 
but Piper got sick of the screen frizzing and forced him to go down after Jason. Yeah, I've got a faint buzzing in the right ear, but it's all clear in the left. Naruto said, grinning. They were following Jason for some reason, heading down one specific tunnel. So what did I miss? Piper's got a small sprain from the warehouse. Decided to keep it quiet until we got off Festus. When you were playing with, Zukai, she had a sip of nectar. Leo said. Naruto glanced at Piper's ankle before looking back at Leo. Seems she didn't get enough, because she just stumbled. Of course after I look away, Naruto said, rolling his eyes. Let's rest. Jason suggested. We've gone for hours non-stop and fought without any real food. I offered to have Mew catch some smaller birds, Naruto said, getting a look from Piper. What? I thought you were a sage, Piper said, frowning at him. How could you suggest that? I make use of everything and burn what remains, Naruto said. It's a shinobi rule, leave no trace. But, it's alive, Piper said, and all living things die, Naruto said, shrugging it off. They picked a small portion of the walkway to take a seat at, Leo digging through his belt for any useful items he needed to make some food. Not the gods, Jason said. Then why were they afraid of Kronos? Naruto asked. Gods can die. Pan faded, the natural death of a god. His domain was attacked too much and humanity lost faith in him, stopped believing, as it were. So, yes, Jason, even gods can die. He looked at his hand and clenched it into a fist. I've killed one myself. The younger three gave him curious looks, Leo whistling in awe. How do you do that? He asked from where he messed with a skillet. He didn't, Jason said in disbelief. You, I mean, they're gods, right? You can't. Not a Greek god, Naruto said, correcting himself. I'm not really sure if she was a god or a monster. She's considered the originator of Chakra, the mother of the first Ninshu master, Hagoromo Otsutsuki. From dad's side, I'm a descendant of his. Nin. Shu. Wow, what did he fight with boots and sell sneakers? Leo asked. Ninshu was a spiritual method of fighting. I think the old man sage said something about it being a way to bring people together. Naruto said, shrugging. I dunno, wasn't really paying attention. All I know is that Ninshu turned into ninjutsu, which is what I used to fight. Anyway. She turned out to be manipulating this long dead dude and took his body over with the help of her creation Zetsu, who'd been deformed over time into a shadow. I personally punted the freak into a giant satellite before we launched the Ur into space. Awesome. Leo said, stirring the food. So what did she look like? Depends on what she felt like. Naruto said after a moment, she was either really pretty or a giant shellfish. Giant. Shellfish. Piper said. Yeah but her choice in appearance aside, she could manipulate reality. Naruto gained a hardened look at this, she was very hard to fight and if it wasn't for a few special gifts from old man sage, I probably would have lost. Her trump card was making a giant chakra devouring tree that had captured all of the shinobi fighting against her. It almost killed everyone, but my team stopped her. Granted my friend went a little power mad, I had to beat some sense back into him before he helped us return everything to normal. I personally destroyed her left arm before using a technique that ended it. Her remains were sucked into the satellite with Zetsu. That's not killing her, though is it? Leo asked. It's what Zeus did to Kronos. Kind of. Naruto said. He looked at his stomach before moving his hand, an action that wasn't lost on the others. I almost lost a close friend several times that day. Dark. Leo said. This chakra stuff. Dot you got it from your dad, right? Jason asked. Leo gained an uncomfortable look on his face. Yeah, Naruto said, sitting back on his hands and thinking about the sacrifices his father made for him. He had a small smile on his face. My dad's awesome. Argument aside, food's done. Let's eat, Leo said. Chef Leo's garbage tacos, and before you ask, Miss Picky Eater, it's tofu, not beef. No meat? Naruto asked his sister. I'm a vegetarian. Piper said. Don't get her started, Leo said, rolling his eyes. Seriously, she's trying to slowly convert all of us. Beware the anti cow woman. Beware. Shut up, Valdez, Piper said, frowning at him. She looked at Naruto. You should try, 
it's healthier. Would that mean I'd have to quit ramen? Maybe, but? If there's even a chance of quitting ramen, count me out. Underscore. Naruto picked a small bit of tofu up and tossed it to a small ledge where a large rat sat the meal was amazing. Leo had quite the talent for cooking, even if it wasn't up to par on Naruto's personal tastes. Ichiraku ramen. It was nectar and ambrosia in disguise, it just had to be. Not bad, Leo. Jason said. They sat in a comfortable silence around the fire, drinking the lemonade Leo made from canteen water and powder mix. Jason wiped the nozzle off and took a drink before passing it on to Piper. He looked at the fire for a minute before looking at Leo. Leo. That stuff you did with the fire, is it true? Leo said nothing before lifting his hand up to the fire and letting a small orb dance around his hand. You tell me. That's awesome, Jason said. Why didn't you say anything? Didn't want to be called a freak, Leo said. Naruto snorted at that. If anything, this was the last group to say that to. Leo. Jason can live through being hit by lightning and flies. Naruto spams clones of himself like it's an everyday thing. Piper said, getting a chuckle from her brother. And Piper can make gods turn their heads. Jason said, getting the girl to fare at him. What? You can. Watch it, flyboy. Naruto said, he was playing with the only kanai that he had with him. Jason took the hint and returned his attention to Leo. The point is, that's a really cool thing you can do, Jason said. Leo scoffed and let the fire on his hand snuff itself out. No number it's not. Nissa told me about children of Hephaestus who can use fire. Bad things usually happen when everyone pops up. Like, really bad things. Catastrophic things. He looked at the fire, eyes narrowed. I was cursed. Or maybe you were blessed. Piper said. Leo gave her a look that showed he disagreed with her. Maybe the bad things happen and the gifts are needed to stop them. The fire of London in 1666 was caused by a son of Hephaestus, Leo said, as if that explained it all. So, Naruto asked, one kid couldn't handle it, does that mean that you have no control? No. Dot but when I was younger. Leo trailed off, Naruto leaned over and put a hand on his shoulder. Leo, if you did something when you were younger, that's because you were inexperienced and it was an accident. Naruto said softly. He put his hand on his stomach. I know what it means to be cursed with great power. Before he gave his life for my village, my father did something incredible. He stopped a monster and left its power for me to use. The village at first saw me as the monster in question, that caused so many lives to be lost, and it made me into an outcast. Real supportive. Leo said under his breath. But I got their attention, Naruto said, ignoring Leo's mumble. He grinned proudly. I showed them that I would never give up, that I would strive to be the best and lead them like my father did. I mastered my father's curse and turned it into a blessing. How? Leo asked. I accepted it as a part of me, Naruto said, sitting upright with a content smile on his face. If you can't accept it, then it will consume you. You're stronger than that, Leo. Whatever happened in the past is beyond your control now, but you're the one who walks the path forward. So will you let your fire guide you? Or will you guide your fire? Leo looked stunned and turned away, looking back at the fire. Wow. Dot get that off a fortune cookie? A what? Naruto asked. I'll tell you later, Piper said. All right. Well, let's get some more sleep, then we'll follow the Ventus, Jason said. Underscore. Naruto dreamed as he rested. He dreamt of a mountainous plain, a grove of trees off to the side, and a small lake nearby. He looked down at himself and poked at the blanket that was wrapped around him. It looked like the sky when the sun rose or set, a nice vibrant orange that had mixes of purple and red at the edges. Weird. Well, it was cool, but it was also weird. A small sound of awe got his attention and he looked up. His eyes fell on a girl his age that looked like Suchi. He blinked as he realized it was Suchi. You. Look handsome, she said, walking up to him, putting a hand on his cheek. Naruto wanted to ask what was going on, but instead he said, Thank you, where am I? It hasn't been that long, Suchi said with a giggle. It sounded like a high bell being rung. She poked him on the nose playfully. I like it when you joke around. Do it more often. Well if you insist. Naruto heard himself say. Strange thing to say to someone he hardly knew. Wait. 
This was that flirting thing, wasn't it? Why was he flirting? He barely knew this girl other than she wasn't on good terms with Leo. Suchi giggled again and leaned up, kissing his cheek. Great. Now he feels like a peeping Tom. Suchi bounced away, her hands falling behind her back as she walked away. She turned on the balls of her feet, smiling at him serenely. Come on. Suchi said, walking backwards with the smile still in place. Naruto furrowed his brows, wondering why he couldn't hear her say his name. Follow me. I want to show you something. Naruto gave a light laugh and followed her. While he was confused he felt the smile spreading across his face. She took his hand and pulled her along with him. Over here. Suchi said. She sounded so excited. He followed her as she pulled him along. She pulled him to a beach, the sand feeling new and foreign to him despite having dealt with it before. That's, he got here yesterday, but look what we made, doesn't it feel amazing on your feet? It's strange, Naruto said, flexing his toes. He hummed for a moment before smiling at her. Can you do anything with it? Suchi blinked. I don't know. That's unfortunate. Maybe you could make something, Naruto said. He dragged his foot through the sand. It's rather malleable. Suchi looked at the sand before beaming. The ground shifted before it rose. A language Naruto wasn't familiar with appeared, but he felt himself blush. Suchi giggled and turned him towards her. You're bright, too. Suchi said. She leaned up and Naruto felt himself leaning down. Her breath blew against his face and. Wake up, underscore. Naruto's eyes snapped open. Wahoo! Jason! Naruto, I've been trying to wake you up for a few minutes now, Jason said. You should have just slapped him. That always works, Leo said, looking very amused at the thought. He got a small pebble thrown at his forehead. Ow. Lesson 1. Don't attack a sleeping shinobi. Naruto said as he got to his feet and stretched, still wondering about that dream he had. Why hadn't he been able to hear the names Suchi said? Why couldn't he read the words that Suchi wrote? yet still blushed. And why was he wearing an orange towel like a dress? Sure it was awesome, but still. A towel? Why'd you throw a rock at me and not Jason? Leo asked, rubbing his head. Because Jason didn't suggest bodily harm to wake me up, Naruto said simply. He looked to the quest leader and grinned. Let's go, flyboy. Jason rolled his eyes while Piper giggled at the nickname, finding it somewhat appropriate. Jason led them down a dark tunnel pausing every now and then to feel the air current. Naruto would occasionally walk onto the wall and then the ceiling, walking parallel with Leo, getting a good startle out of the group when they thought they lost him. Shame Mew didn't join them. On second thought, perhaps it was better, he didn't want to worry about cleaning her feathers. It was when they came to the end of their path that Naruto finally dropped down and scratched his head. Two steel doors with the letter M engraved on them in what Annabeth called cursive stood before them. On the wall next to the doors was a plaque with other words on it. Is that an elevator directory? Leo asked. He squinted his eyes. Who has a floor dedicated to poison? And what the heck is a sundry anyway? Is that some kind of lingerie? I'm not sure about those last few questions, but I think this is a directory, Jason said, hitting the up button. The doors opened with a ding, revealing a cozy elevator with gold railings and lush walls. What is this, Macy's? Piper asked. What's Macy's? Naruto asked. Piper just gave him a look of disbelief. It's a parade, Leo said. He snickered when Piper shoved him lightly while they stood outside the elevator. Shut up, Leo, Piper said. She looked at her older brother. Macy's is a mall that happens to have an annual parade. Oh, what's a mall? Wow, dude, just wow, Leo said. Even Jason gave Naruto a bewildered look. Piper opened and closed her mouth before shaking her head. I'll explain it later, Naruto. If you say so, Naruto said, giving a shrug. He turned to Jason. So what now, flyboy? The best place to start would be at the top, Jason said. He stepped in and the others followed. His finger wandered to the fourth floor's button and pressed it. The doors closed with a loud ding. The floor shifted and Naruto felt it rise. He began getting nervous. Closed spaces were not his forte. You all right, Naruto? Leo asked. Fine. Naruto said through gritted teeth. That bar begs to differ. Naruto looked at the golden bar in his grip, being bent into his hand. 
He let go and looked at his shaking hand, clenching it into a fist. I'm not a fan of closed spaces. No, really? Leo asked. What happened to cause that? Got eaten by a giant snake when I was 12. The three looked at him oddly. Beats my story. Leo said. No one said anything else, but Jason prepared his sword. Naruto's grip around his staff tightened, surprisingly being sturdier than the railing in the elevator. The elevator doors dinged as they opened and Jason stepped out first with his sword at the ready. Jason paused outside and lowered his blade. Guys, you have got to see this. They followed and joined Jason as he looked over the mall. This is not Macy's. Piper said, in shock, it's like a kaleidoscope, Leo said. Naruto nodded in agreement. It was massive. The ceiling was beautiful glass, stained with strange symbols that reflect off the giant sun in the center of it all. It was like being in a room showered in color. This was what Sage Mode looked like. Check it out, Leo said. That statue looks like Coach Hedge. Jason and Piper looked to where he was pointing and Naruto followed their gaze, down by a large fountain. What was with this city and giant fountains? There was a cage that rattled and stormed, filled with the spirits that had caused his sister and her friends so much trouble, while opposite that was a stone statue of a satyr holding a tree branch the size of a club. That was one strong satyr, stronger than Billy at any rate. We need to get down there, Piper said. I think that is Coach Hedge. May I be of some assistance? The four demigods turned on their feet, Naruto holding both of his staves while Jason held his sword at the ready. They lowered their guard as they realized it was a woman looking at them. She was pretty, but Naruto didn't really pay attention to that. It was her eyes that had him keep his guard up. They were cold and calculating. Looking into them and Naruto saw that something was wrong. He just couldn't put his finger on what that was, though. The woman smiled. I'm so happy to see new customers. We're not. Naruto trailed off as the wall shifted around behind her. The elevator vanished, the doors being hidden by earthy wall. Naruto squinted his eyes as a face appeared in it briefly. Suchi. I think T is on the third floor. The woman said. She turned to the younger three. How may I help you? Um. Is this your store? Jason asked. She nodded. I found it abandoned. I, how you say, renovated it. I realized there were many stores like this. I love collecting things and helping people find what they need. It seemed like a. What is the term? Ah, good investment. Are you new to this country? Jason asked. He ignored the weird look Piper was giving him. Yes, I am, new. She said. Her smile never faltered. I am the princess of Colchis. My friends call me your highness. Now what is it you are looking for? Our friend. Jason said. He sounded a bit dazed. Gleasonhedge. The satyr statue, could we see him? How would she know his name? Naruto asked. His words didn't go through the son of Zeus' head. Yes, yes. I take you. First your names, the princess said, smiling pleasantly. This isn't a good idea, Piper said. Jason seemed to ignore it. This is Piper, Leo and Na, then. I'm Nathan, Naruto said. That was the name of a kid at camp, he nodded to Jason. And I'm Jason. Jason said. He didn't seem to look concerned as to why Naruto gave the woman a false name. Naruto glared at the woman slightly as she seemed to focus solely on Jason after he said his name. He blinked when he thought that her head became clear, glowing as she gazed at Jason. It was over when he blinked again. What a lovely name, the princess said, giving a bitter smile. You know, I believe we might have a special sale for you. She turned and walked towards the staircase. Come along, children, let's go shopping. Underscore, this is such a bad idea. Piper said to Naruto under her breath. He simply nodded and kept his grip tightly on his staff. They were following the princess through the potions store. Why? No clue. All Naruto knew was that the princess was way too interested in Jason. And not in a good way. I know, Naruto said simply. Just play along. He turned his attention to the princess. Colchis, sounds strange. Where is it? Far from here. Very far and lifetime ago. The princess said simply. She turned to look at him. You are not from here either, Nathan? Wisconsin. Naruto said with a smile. Wisconsin. What a dreary sounding land, the princess said. It's not that bad, 
Naruto said. They got that team. What was it, Piper? The Green Bay Packers. Yeah, that's right, the good old Green Bay Packers, Naruto said with a grin. The princess blinked in confusion. What do they pack? Uh, everything? Doesn't matter. What's this do? Naruto asked, grabbing the nearest vial that he could find. It was a swan shaped container with blue liquid in it. Careful, dear. The princess said. What, will he sprout legs from his stomach? Piper asked, rolling her eyes. No, the princess said, her smile widening slightly. That potion will kill you very painfully. Like getting a sword shoved through your stomach? Jason asked. Far more painful than that, dear Jason. I'll just put this down carefully then, Naruto said. He might have had worse than a sword in his stomach, but he wasn't keen on feeling it again. He grabbed another vial, this one blood red like his mother's hair, or at least the form she chose when she had him, and having a simple cork that stopped it. What's this one do? That one? That one is opposite, the princess said. Very powerful healing agent. Heals any disease that befalls you. Any disease? Like cancer? Leo asked. Leprosy? Hangnails? Yes, sweet boy. The princess said, gently petting Leo's messy hair. Any disease? Like amnesia? Piper asked after a moment. Naruto looked at her, catching her steal a glance at the dazed Jason. He followed her gaze and looked at his fellow blonde, seeing a small frown appear on his face before he blinked it away. He seemed to have issues remembering still. Naruto looked at Piper again. Don't, Piper. He said under his breath, his hand grabbing her arm gently. We can't get sucked into this. Piper ignored him, her eyes staying on the princess's face. She never looked away. Yes, I think it could. The princess said. She tilted her head. Why dear, did you forget something important? Piper. Naruto said with a hiss. I know what I'm doing. Piper said, swiveling a glare on her brother. She looked back at the princess. How much? The princess blinked and put a hand on her cheek, the other resting under her elbow as she looked beyond them. That's always the problem. I love helping people, honestly I do. And I always keep my promises, but people take advantage of that. Naruto glowered a bit at that. He'd been taken advantage of because of his promises before. One of his most memorable events like that was what he referred to as the Mizuki incident, where his academy teacher Mizuki had lied to him tricked him into stealing a very important scroll, to make him a scapegoat and then told him the secret that was kept from him for twelve years. The woman's eyes glanced at Jason before meeting Naruto's. You know this pain. The princess said. She approached him and reached out, her hand cupping his whiskered cheek. Betrayed by someone you trusted. Once a handsome young man came to me for help, he wished to take something from my father. I made a bargain and I promised to help him steal it. From your own father? Jason asked. He looked a little bothered by that tidbit of information. Now, don't worry, Jason. The princess said, giving him a serene smile, her hand still on Naruto's cheek. I demand a high price. The young man who had to steal me away alongside his prize. It seemed fair. He was good looking, young, charming, dashing, and strong. The princess looked at Piper. I'm sure you understand, yes? The end. Now we will see you in the next video.